The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to examine the administration's disastrous emergency evacuation from Afghanistan. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. In the spring of 2021, against the advice of his top generals and the intelligence community, President Biden announced he would unconditionally withdraw all American troops from Afghanistan, a decision that I opposed. I and many on this committee received multiple briefings from the State Department, the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and the difference in their assessments was stark. Both DOD's and the IC's outlook were very grim in their assessment. While the State Department, mimicking the White House, consistently painted a rosy picture, ignoring the realities on the ground. The President promised, quote, there's going to be no circumstances where you see people being lifted off the roof of an embassy like in Vietnam, yet they were. Multiple people in the Biden administration said they had planned for every contingency. They did not. Instead, they spent the next four months ignoring the realities. As a result, when the Taliban rapidly captured territory during the summer of 2021 and entered Kabul on August 15th, we simply weren't ready. Because of the Biden administration's dereliction of duty, the world watched heartbreaking scenes unfold in and around the Kabul airport for the next two weeks. A sea of humanity desperately trying to make it through airport gates that represented freedom. We all saw the images of desperate Afghans clinging to planes as they took off with some plummeting from the sky to their deaths. Mothers handing their children to strangers over the airport walls, willingly giving them up in the hopes of saving their lives. And then horror struck on August 26. A suicide bomber at Abbey Gate killed 13 American service members, injuring at least 45 more and killing approximately 170 Afghans. That day was the deadliest day for American troops in Afghanistan in 10 years. We are joined here today by Marine Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews and former Army Specialist Aiden Gunderson. Both were deployed to Afghanistan during the evacuation. They can give a firsthand account of what it was like inside Kabul airport during those harrowing two weeks. Sergeant Vargas Andrews, a sniper at Abbey Gate, was gravely injured in the terrorist attack that occurred. He has undergone 44 surgeries and has lost both his leg and his arm, as well as his kidney. Thank you, sir, for the courage to be here today. Former Specialist Gunderson, a medic with the 82nd Airborne, was one of the first people on the scene helping anyone that he could. Gentlemen, this nation owes you a debt of gratitude, not just for your service to our country, but also for the work both of you did to help numerous people to safety during the evacuation, saving so many lives. You should be proud of all that you've done. And I would like to thank you for your service. I'd also like to ask the many Afghanistan veterans here today to please stand and be recognized. On behalf of a grateful nation, we thank you. In the midst of the unfolding chaos in Kabul in August of 2021, 
The United States uh, State Department was all but useless. Like myself, many of my colleagues, including people on both sides of the aisle in this room today, were forced to become many State Departments. We worked any avenue we could to rescue Americans, green card holders and our Afghan allies that we promised we would protect. No one left behind was a credo. We violated that promise. Thankfully though, in the void left by an absent State Department, many Americans stepped up to fill the vacuum, primarily organized by veterans, groups like Allied Airlift 21, Team America, and Task Force Pineapple, just to name a few that saved thousands of lives. And that is why I'm honored to have France Hong, Peter Lucier, and Scott Mann here with us today as well. All three of these men worked tirelessly to rescue many people as they could, as many as they could during this evacuation. It was often referred to like Schindler's List. If you're on the list, you made it out alive. If you weren't, you didn't. What happened in Afghanistan was a systemic breakdown of the federal government at every level and a stunning, stunning failureship, stunning failure of leadership by the Biden administration. Because even though President Biden said, and I quote, if there, there's American citizens left, we're gonna stay to get them all out, end of quote, we now know that he left more than 1,000 American citizens in Afghanistan. In addition to the almost 200,000 Afghan partners and allies that we promised we would save, we promised them we would help them, only to abandon them to the Taliban, not to mention the women who were left behind to the mercy of the Taliban under Sharia law. This was an abdication of the most basic duties of the United States government to protect Americans and leave no one behind. I want every gold and blue star family member and every veteran out there watching this today to know that I will not rest and this committee will not rest until we determine how this happened and hold those responsible for it accountable. And before I close, I would like to honor the 13 service members who died at Abbey Gate, that tragic, tragic day. Staff Sergeant Darren Hoover, Sergeant Johanny Rosario, Sergeant Nicole Gee, Corporal Hunter Lopez, Corporal Dagan W. Page, Corporal Humberto Sanchez, Lance Corporal David Espinoza, Lance Corporal Jared Schmitz, Lance Corporal Riley McCollum, Lance Corporal Dylan Marola, Lance Corporal Karim Nikoi, Petty Officer, Third Class, Maxton Soviak, and Staff Sergeant Ryan Noss. Can we please have a moment of silence to honor the memory of these fallen heroes and all of the fallen heroes in the Afghan conflict? May God bless them and God bless their family and God bless the United States of America. And with that, I turn to our ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me begin my remarks by thanking all of the witnesses for appearing before the committee today and to thank those who served 
and our armed services for your service to our great country. I want to particularly recognize Specialist Gunderson and Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews, two of the witnesses on the panel today who were deployed to Hamid Karazi International Airport to assist with the non-combatant evacuation operation during August 2021. Gentlemen, I can only imagine, only imagine the pressure that so many of you faced during the evacuation operation, which allowed for us to facilitate the evacuation of over 100,000 people. Specialist Gunderson, in your written statement, you write, no amount of mental preparation or military training could have prepared me for Abbeygate. I was struck by that statement and the description in your testimony. What an incredible weight and responsibility. I could only imagine What's that like? It brings up for me the emotion that I have felt when I hear from veterans of the war in Afghanistan describe their experiences, both in Afghanistan and upon their return home, many of whom I've met that comes from my district, where I was told the repeated deployments, and the separation from their families, watching fellow soldiers suffer from injury or the trauma of seeing them die. The difficulty of returning home and reintegrating back into their home life, tough. The heartbreak, the heartbreak of our Gold Star families having to face empty seats during the holidays. So I honor all of your service, and it underscores to me that the President of the United States made the right decision to bring all our troops home, because I can't in good conscience imagine sending more American men and women to fight in Afghanistan. We are here today to examine the emergency evacuation from Afghanistan in August 2021 and the administration's broader relocation efforts. It is often said it is easier to start a war than to end it. The war in Afghanistan is no different. This war that began as an effort to decimate Al Qaeda ballooned into a nation building exercise that lasted across four administrations and saw more than 800,000 U.S. service members deployed. And yes, the tragic deaths of over 2,000 461 Americans, including the 13 killed during the evacuation operation. And while the U.S. government planned for a wide range of contingencies, the worst possible scenario happened. Despite repeated assurances, some right here in the capital of the United States of Afghan President Ghani, he fled the country and the Afghan government and security forces collapsed faster than expected and before the withdrawal of our military had been completed. Despite, despite the harsh realities of the, on the ground, a lingering ISIS threat and heightened uncertainty as the Taliban took control, our diplomats, military, and intelligence professionals facilitated an unprecedented 
and heroic evacuation never seen before. We worked with more than two dozen countries to evacuate American citizens and lawful permanent residents to relocate Afghans who had helped us. Citizens of our allies and partners and at-risk Afghans to the United States or transit locations across the globe. In the end, more than 120,000 people were evacuated to safety under some of the most difficult conditions imaginable. It was in a complex and dangerous environment, thousands of miles away. And so I commend our brave U.S. military and civilian personnel working closely with so many civil society organizations and everyday Americans for achieving this. But while the historic Afghan, Afghanistan airlift brought many people to safety, we must acknowledge that there were mistakes along the way. And as a result, many Afghans who supported the American war effort over the past 20 years continue to seek pathways to immigrate to the United States. As in most things, context matters. The evacuation did not happen in a vacuum. A culmination of policy decisions informed and influenced the events of August 2021 and continue to shape how we navigate ongoing relocation and diplomatic efforts today. In the years preceding the 2021 withdrawal, the decision to engage in the direct negotiations with the Taliban at the exclusion of the Afghan government and the invitation to meet at Camp David conferred international legitimacy to the Taliban. The deal that derived from these negotiations required the withdrawal of our forces without forcing the Taliban to fulfill any real commitments or separating from Al Qaeda on agreeing to a ceasefire or on negotiating with the Afghan government. I called in the last Congress this precipitous U.S. troop drawdowns were ordered throughout 2020 without regard to the Taliban's compliance with the deal. This same deal forced the Afghan government to release 5,000 Taliban fighters, severely altering the power and structure of the country. Meanwhile, U.S. immigration mechanisms available to our Afghan allies face long-standing challenges. The SIV program for Iraq and Afghanistan, established in 2006, statutorily capped participants at 50 per year. In 2027 and 2008, it capped this number at 500. The, though the caps on SIVs grew over the years, they did not comport with, number, with the numbers of Afghans who would have qualified. Separate from the legislative limitations placed on the SIV programs, executive branch agencies processing and vetting SIV applications were also time consuming and resource challenged. On top of that, the previous administration actively undermined U.S. immigration refugee admissions and mechanisms and specifically paused the processing of special immigrant visas applications entirely in 2020, creating a backlog more than 17,000 applications. In fact, the start of the current administration, at the start of the current administration, there had not been a single interview of an SIV applicant going back to March of 2020. In total, these policy decisions not only altered the balance of power and reduced U.S. leverage in Afghanistan, but created incredibly difficult circumstances as we work to bring allies to safety and the U.S. war in Afghanistan to a close. So despite these challenges, the Biden administration took decisive steps to honor its promises to the Afghans that have stood with us by restarting the SIV interview process, speeding up the SIV processing, and surging additional counselor officers, adjudicators, and other personnel to restart the program. The administration also worked to repair the institutional damage done to the U.S. refugee admissions program and establish priority referral categories for Afghans within. So as I conclude, we must acknowledge this important effort to relocate vulnerable Afghans and it is ongoing, and that this administration is actively working to help those still in Afghanistan safely leave the country. 
But the evacuation and relocation process are not without faults, many of which we re will require decisive action and legislation from the U.S. Congress, not only our executive branch agencies or the White House. We are here to understand the full context around Afghan evacuations and ongoing relocations so that we can streamline the process and make necessary improvements to fulfill our promises to our Afghan allies going forward. We must further enhance cooperation and communication with the wide array of civil society stakeholders and everyday Americans, like our witnesses who are here today, who have dedicated significant time and resources to this effort. So I fully support, Mr. Chairman, bipartisan oversight as we focused on solutions to safely relocate those deserving Afghans and address the broader challenges to our SIV and refugee assistance programs. Our country has paid a great cost during the war in Afghanistan. Our aim then should not be simply to score political points here today, is, but to rather focus on real solutions that will help real people. That is the best way to honor the sacrifices of so many Americans who served in or supported our interests in Afghanistan over the last 20 years, especially and including our witnesses here today. So I look forward to their testimony, and I yield back my time. I thank the ranking member he yields back, um, <clears throat> and I too am committed to to those who were left behind and are still left behind. Uh, we need to get them out. We need to get them the hell out of there. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted uh, for the record. We're pleased to have a very distinguished group of uh, heroes before us. France. Hong is a national security professional with over 20 years of experience, graduate of West Point. He served at the White House before becoming the executive officer of an Army Special Forces company in Afghanistan in 2009. Currently, he serves as the executive chairman of Allied Airlift 21, one of the volunteer organizations set up to help get people safely out of Afghanistan. To date, Allied Airlift 21 has helped over 500 individuals evacuate the country. Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews has served in the United States Marine Corps for five and a half years. He and his sniper team were deployed to Kabul Airport in 2021 to assist with the evacuation. They were stationed at Abbey Gate as the primary ground reconnaissance and observation asset. While there, they helped evacuate over 200 U.S. nationals Sergeant Vargas Andrews was gravely wounded at the bombing at Abbey Gate on August 26, 2021. As a result, he lost multiple organs, two of his limbs, and suffered numerous other injuries. He's had 44 surgeries to date. He is appearing in his personal capacity, and his testimony does not represent the views or opinions of the Department of Defense or U.S. Marine Corps. Ms. Camille Mackler, is the executive director of the Immigrant Advocates Response Collaborative, also known as Immigrant ARC, which she helped form and has led since February 2017. Peter Lucier is a Marine veteran and a recent graduate of the St. Louis University School of Law. He currently serves as the lead for strategic partnerships and allied organizations for Team America Relief, a member organization of the Afghan EVAC Coalition. Since August of 2021, Team America Relief has assisted thousands of Afghans as well as American citizens in connecting to resources to assist in relocation and safe passage out of Afghanistan. Former Specialist Aidan Gunderson served four years with the 82nd Airborne Division as a combat medic. Before leaving the military in July 2022, he was deployed from August 14th to August 30th of 2021 in Afghanistan, where he assisted with the evacuation. Aiden and his company also evacuated over 200 trusted civilians through Operation Pineapple Express. And finally, Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann, former Green Beret, served multiple tours in Afghanistan, founded Task Force Pineapple, a volunteer organization set up to help get people safely out of Afghanistan, 
Task Force Pineapple has successfully evacuated around 1,000 Afghan allies to date. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Your full statements will be made a part of the record. And I now recognize Mr. Hong for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Meeks, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today to testify as just one of thousands of Americans who volunteered to help those left behind in Afghanistan. My name is Franz Hong. In August 2008, I was an associate counsel to the president, working in the White House as a lawyer. One year later, I was a captain deployed to Afghanistan as the executive officer of a U.S. Army Special Forces company. Every day that I served in Afghanistan, Afghan allies like Jabbar, pictured here, an Afghan security guard, stood bravely beside me. Like tens of thousands of other Afghans who chose to support our mission, Jabbar was branded a traitor by the Taliban and targeted for reprisals. Afghans like Jabbar put their lives and the lives of their families in jeopardy for us and for our mission. Recognizing this, those of us who served in Afghanistan and our nation as a whole made a solemn promise to stand by them. For over 160,000 Afghans, our nation has failed, failed to live up to this promise. A number of Afghan allies have come to the United States, but over 80% of the Afghans who stood by us at great risk to themselves and their families remain left behind. In August 2021, during the rushed and chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, I and thousands of others received frantic pleas for help from our Afghan allies whose lives were in peril. Driven by a desire to save those who had stood shoulder to shoulder with us, we did what we could from half a world away. Working from our homes and using every digital tool at our disposal, thousands of us guided tired and scared Afghan families through crowds and Taliban checkpoints. The weight of this work was crushing. We left jobs, drained savings, reopened old wounds. We looked in horror as our screens filled with images of violence and desperation outside the gates of Kabul airport. We wept as we listened to messages left by children pleading for our help. Nine times out of 10, our efforts failed. But every success was a family saved, a promise kept. Hundreds of volunteer groups, including Allied Airlift 21, were responsible for getting thousands of people into Kabul airport and safety. But the work wasn't done. On August 27th, when the gates of Kabul airport closed to our allies, Allied Airlift 21, several private companies and other volunteer groups organized a desperate all day, 200 mile journey for six buses filled with Afghan allies and Americans through Taliban-controlled territory to the city of Mazar-e-Sharif. This treacherous journey included an attempted busjacking and the birth of a baby on board one of the buses. Our group eventually got eight, 400 Afghan allies and Americans to Mazar, where we hoped to charter a flight to safety. We spent the next three weeks hiding these 400 people from the Taliban, keeping them alive with the generosity of American donors. On September 17th, 2021, a privately chartered plane lifted into the skies above Afghanistan with 380 souls on board, including 128 Americans, 152 children, and one newborn baby. All 380 passengers are now in America, alive and free, including Jabbar, his wife, and their eight children. My passion for helping our Afghan allies comes from a deeply personal place. You see, nearly 50 years ago, I was one of those rescued children. On April 23rd, 1975, my family was evacuated by American forces from Saigon. Weeks earlier, President Ford proclaimed that America had a profound moral obligation to its Vietnamese allies. He and Congress then followed those words with action rising above political differences to evacuate and resettle 130,000 Vietnamese allies. Because of their tremendous political will and courage, I am alive and free today. I've been blessed with the opportunities that only America provides, 
and grew up inspired by the sure knowledge that America stood by me and many like me. That led me to apply to West Point, then serve in the US Army, and eventually help organize a flight that saved 152 children who will now grow up knowing that America stood by them and their families. We often talk about America as a shining city on a hill, a beacon of freedom and opportunity to the world. I, along with one million other Vietnamese immigrants, are living proof that America can live up to those ideals. Your predecessors in office fulfilled America's commitment to me, my family, and other Vietnamese allies. Now it is our turn to summon the courage to fulfill our commitment to the Afghan allies still left behind. Before I close, I'd like to thank two groups. First, to all those who stepped forward to help our Afghan allies, veterans, volunteers, civil servants, members of Congress, their staffs and our families. Thank you for creating hope when hope became forlorn. Second, and more importantly, to our Afghan allies, especially those in Afghanistan, thank you for your courage. We have not forgotten you, and we will not rest until the promises that our nation made to you are honored. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hong. I now recognize Sergeant Vargas Andrews for his opening statement. Good morning, Chairman, Ranking Member Meeks, and members of Congress. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you all about my Marine Corps scout sniper team's experience during the evacuation in Kabul, Afghanistan. This is my perspective. This is my account and not the DOD's. I'm Sergeant Tyler Justin Vargas Andrews. I'm 25 years old and from Northern California, a professionally instructed gunman and radio operator for my team. My sniper team was Reaper 2, part of Victor 2-1 Weapons Company, attached to Echo Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines from Camp Pendleton, California. In June of 2021, after having just left Kuwait, we were deployed to Saudi Arabia as a show of force. We practiced a few small-scale non-combatant evacuation operations in the event we were needed in Afghanistan. August came, and two weeks later, we left for Kabul. Reaper 2 and Echo Company had a close relationship with the colonel of the Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force. He kept us informed of the situation on the ground in Afghanistan, and we were ready to go, so we thought. An infantry platoon of roughly 40 Marines and my assistant team leader left for Kabul on August 15th. They eventually faced the Afghan civilian crowd that overran the Hamid Karzai International Airport. The rest of us arrived on August 16th. All the Marines linked up and staged inside a gym in Hkaya, not far from the airfield. We connected with our command and received our first mission later that night. <clears throat> from August 17th to the 18th, we surveilled and reported on Taliban activity from the top platform of satellite tower near the civilian airport terminals in Hkaya. We reconnected with another sniper team and moved back towards our staging area that night. Our team traveled to Abbey Gate forward in the afternoon of the 19th and set up a position in the tower as Marines in riot gear were sent through the crowd to cordon off a couple hundred people as we tried to begin some form of processing. Hundreds of people came in waves surging through the gate multiple times physically fighting us. Living out of our tower, we conducted 24-7 operations at the gate. The next seven days were surreal. Nothing prepared us for the ground experience we were about to encounter. It was chaos, but we worked together to figure out the next best steps. Tens of thousands of people descended upon Abbey Gate. We were looking for anyone with a blue passport, first and foremost. People were suffering from extreme malnutrition, dehydration, heat casualties, and infants were dying. Afghans were brutalized and tortured by the Taliban, flocked to us, pleading for help. Some Afghans turned away from Hkaya, tried to kill themselves on the razor wire in front of us that we used as a deterrent. They thought this was merciful compared to the Taliban torture that they faced. <clears throat> with only shipping, excuse me, they thought Countless Afghans were murdered by the Taliban 155 yards in front of our position day and night. With only shipping containers between us, the Taliban would routinely murder people under our observation at their checkpoint. We communicated the atrocities to our chain of command and intel assets, but nothing came of it. The troops on the ground had to tirelessly work to control the crowds day and night. Department of State staff and HKI would completely shut down processing Afghans every evening and into the morning, leaving ground forces with a nightmare. They did not work in reasonable rotations and very much presented an unwillingness to work in other situations as well. No matter our health or condition, the Marines stood watch and engaged in disorderly and dangerous crowds. State was not prepared to be in Hkaya. In fact, state would not want to deal with the Afghans unable to be processed. Weakening the security of the perimeter, state would take us away from our mission to walk Afghans out to meet the fate of the Taliban, condemning them to death. The Taliban grew in numbers and strengthened their position around Hkaya with gun trucks while having occasional visits by Taliban leadership. 
On August 22nd, an improvised explosive device, IED, probe took place down the canal running along the perimeter of HKIA. This was ISIS or the Taliban performing an IED test run. We reported this to our chain of command. Days later, we received word to be on the lookout for two vehicle-borne IEDs, described as a gold or white Corolla and a green Mazda convertible. Around 2 a.m. on August 26th, Intel guys confirmed the suicide bomber in the vicinity of and nearing Abbey Gate, described as clean-shaven, brown-dressed, black vest, and traveling with an older companion. I asked the Intel guys why he wasn't apprehended sooner since we had a full description. I was told the asset could not be compromised. Throughout the entirety of the day on August 26, 2021, we disseminated the suicide bomber information to ground forces at Abbey Gate. He was spotted somewhere from noon to 1 p.m. by myself, then Sergeant Charles Schilling, and another. The anomaly in the crowd, who was clean shaven and fit the description exactly, traveling with an older gentleman. The individual was consistently and nervously looking up at our position through the crowd. The older of the two wore a black silky hijab that was covering his face most of the time. They both had obvious mannerisms that go along with who we believed him to be. They handed out small cards to the crowd periodically, and the older man sat calmly and seemingly coached the bomber. Over the communication network, we passed that there was a potential threat and an IED attack imminent. This was as serious as it could get. I requested engagement authority while my team leader was ready on the M110 semi-automatic sniper system. The response, leadership did not have the engagement authority for us. Do not engage. I requested for the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Brad Whited, to come to the tower to see what we did. While we waited for him, psychological operations individuals came to our tower immediately and confirmed the suspect met the suicide bomber description. He eventually arrived and we showed him our evidence, the photos we had of the two men. We reassured him of the ease of fire on the suicide bomber. Pointedly, we asked him for engagement authority and permission. We asked him if we could shoot. Our battalion commander said, and I quote, I don't know, end quote. Myself and my team leader asked very harshly, well, who does? Because this is your responsibility, sir. He again replied, he did not know, but would find out. We received no update and never got our answer. Eventually, the individual disappeared. To this day, we believe he was a suicide bomber. We made everyone on the ground aware. Operations had briefly halted, but then started again. Plain and simple, we were ignored. Our expertise was disregarded. No one was held accountable for our safety. <clears throat> About 1730, Staff Sergeant Darren Hoover, friend and mentor. <clears throat> came to get me from the tower to go help find an Afghan interpreter in the crowd. We found the interpreter and his brother born with American passports. They told us, five, told us of five family members still in the canal. I stayed there waiting for the family members standing against a two-foot canal wall. Ten minutes passed. <clears throat> then a flash <clears throat> and a massive wave of pressure. I'm thrown 12 feet onto the ground, but instantly knew what had happened. I opened my eyes to Marines dead or unconscious lying around me. A crowd of hundreds immediately vanished in front of me, and my body was catastrophically wounded with 100 to 150 ball bearings now in it. <clears throat> Almost immediately, we started taking fire from the neighborhood, and I saw how injured I was with my right arm, completely shredded and unusable. I saw my lower abdomen soaked in blood. crawled backwards seven feet, roughly seven feet because I thought I was still in harm's way. My body was overwhelmed from the trauma of the blast. My abdomen had been ripped open. Every inch of my exposed body, except for my face, took ball bearings and shrapnel. <clears throat> I tried to get up but could not. Laying there for a few minutes, I started to lose consciousness. When I heard Chaz, my team leader, screaming my name as he ran to me, his voice... <clears throat> 
His voice calling to me kept me awake. When he got to me, he dragged me to safety and immediately started triaging me, tying tourniquets on my limbs and doing anything he could to stop the bleeding and start plugging wounds with the help of the other Marines. I was awake through most of it, screaming, moaning, and cursing. Please ask, uh, <clears throat> I ask you to please ask me about getting shot at the tower in Abbey Gate and how no one wanted my report post-blast. Even NCIS and the FBI failed to interview me. Ask me to elaborate on my ordeal post-blast and ask me about this one little girl and her family that I reunited. Our military members and veterans deserve our best because that is what we give to America. The withdrawal, <clears throat> the withdrawal was a catastrophe in my opinion, and there was an ex inexcusable lack of accountability and negligence. The 11 Marines, one sailor, <clears throat> and one soldier that were murdered that day have not been answered for. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Sergeant, for that very powerful uh, and uh, courageous testimony. I now recognize Ms. Mackler for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin, um, I just want to say thank you to Sergeant Parkins for everything and what happened to you matters. And I'm grateful for the opportunity here today to hear these stories, um, which were our lives for so long, but that everyone should know about. Um, before I, want, I begin, I also want to express how privileged I feel to be included on this panel today on International Women's Day. I have met and worked alongside incredibly courageous women, Afghan, American, from the world over in the last two years. And today I bring them in this room with me and I hold in my heart the voices and the courage of the girls and women still in Afghanistan who are silenced and living out of you. I'm the direct, executive director of Immigrant ARC, a coalition of legal service providers in New York. I'm also a visiting senior fellow at the Truman Center for National Policy. I've been an immigration attorney and advocate for nearly 20 years, and I'm on the leadership committees of both the Evacuate Our Allies Coalition and the Afghan Evac Coalition. I first became involved in efforts to evacuate our vulnerable Afghan allies in January of 2021, when a small group of us started pushing for special immigrant visa holders and others to be included in the then imminent troop withdrawal. Like countless other civil society leaders, veterans, and everyday Americans, I pivoted on August 15th to help facilitate the non-combatant evacuant operation, or NEO. I am humbled and awed by the actions and sacrifices of my fellow panelists and those they speak for today. At the same time, I know that what happened in August of 2021 was the product of decades long of inaction and systemic failures that we can no longer ignore. To ensure that the actions we heard today were not in vain, we must use this moment to create and implement better solutions. After all, as we've been told, those who ignore history are condemned to repeat it. We saw that in Afghanistan. We tried to learn the lessons from Vietnam and we were ignored and we cannot allow a future generation to go through this as well. So what are those solutions? First and foremost, Congress should pass the Afghan Adjustment Act. Afghans who have all, including m Afghans that we all, including many of those of us here in this hearing today, work to evacuate to safety in the United States are resettled. And though there are challenges, many of them are thriving. This is their home and they deserve to have the peace of mind of knowing that it is their permanent home. The AAA would allow those who are here to obtain permanent legal status. It would strengthen pathways for those that we left behind. And it would bring new options to help those that need, that, that need them the most. Additionally, passing the AAA will, increase in, will ensure increased oversight in the ongoing relocations and resettlement. We also must increase interagency coordination. One of the biggest failures of the US government was the inability to functionally coordinate across agencies ahead of the 2021 withdrawal. Too many agencies, including the Department of Defense, the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security, the National Security Council and others had overlapping jurisdictions and no clear mandate, which allowed for too much passing of the buck. However, the White House refused to create this mechanism of their own accord. Congress should use its Article I authority to mandate a body like that going forward. In the years and months since the evacuation, much of this infrastructure has been created in an ad hoc manner through various departments. Congress must ensure that the executive branch coordinates these independent teams in one unified line of effort. 
we must codify the care team and continue the relocations. One of the most innovative approaches we've seen in the aftermath of the, Afga of the Afghan crisis is the creation of public-private partnerships, in this, case, in this case named the Coordinator to, for Afghan Relocate Efforts, CARE, which is housed in the Department of State, and it helps coordinate ongoing relocations. Congress should work on legislation to codify this effort and systematize government civil society partnerships. I should note the role that Afghan Evac, a coalition of over 200 veteran serving organizations, veteran organizations, I'm sorry, as well as civil society groups have had in um, shaping care. We must improve the SIV system. The improvements to the Special Immigrant Visa Program will not only provide avenues to honor the promise we made to our Afghan allies, but it will also be an important foundation and roadmap for how we support U.S. allies and collaborators in future conflicts. We must authorize enough visas to account for the entire eligible population, provide resources to allow for adjudication of applications within the nine months statutorily required, provide flexible consular processing and invest in diplomatic and logistical capital to solve procedural issues, and require the Department of State to catalog and search U.S. government contracts, such as the DOD did in Project Rabbit, to take the administrative burden off of applicants who are in danger. Finally, we need a permanent, lasting, and functional SIV program. We need resources dedicated to protecting current and future allies. The U.S. government relies heavily on local partners during conflict, but falls short on protecting those collaborators after the military engagement ends. We need Congress to create an Ombudsman for Allies office, a high-ranking U.S. official with the authority and responsibility to serve the interests and protection of wartime allies so that this never happens again. And finally, we need better pathways. We need to modernize and invest resources in the U.S. refugee system, which is administered by the Department of State, and we need to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Every week, me and my colleagues get asked for help on behalf of an Afghan or an Afghan family, and every week my answer is the same. I simply have no options to offer you. If they did not come through the NEO, they have no pathways to come to the United States. Our immigration laws prevented us from being able to meaningfully help tens of thousands of Afghans to help those who are left behind, as well as to prevent the same catastrophe from happening in the future. We must make legal pathways to the United States broader and easier to navigate. Mr. Chairman, you said at the end of your remarks, we need to get them out. We need to get them the hell out. We need immigration pathways to do that. Help us change our immigration laws so that we can get them out. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McElhorn, and I also appreciate your uh, assistance getting so many Afghans out, out of there. And I agree with you, we have to get them the hell out. Um, I now recognize Mr. Lucier for his opening statement. Chairman, Ranking Member Meeks, uh, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to speak on this important topic that is uh, so close to my heart. I'd also like to thank my fellow witnesses here today, uh, veterans, those who were on active duty during those chaotic weeks in August, um, uh, and um, uh, other volunteers and advocates who have been and done so much powerful work uh, in this space. Um, in addition to the witnesses here today, uh, I'd also like to thank um, some organizations that, that I've worked with and had the honor to know uh, who've made an incredible difference these last 17 months. The International Institute of St. Louis, our local resettlement agency, uh, which has welcomed nearly a thousand Afghans into our community in St. Louis who make our community stronger, and they continue to welcome more Afghans and other refugees today. Uh, the Afghan EVAC Coalition, which is comprised of more than 200 organizations, um, both private volunteer efforts like my own um, and larger uh, traditional advocacy organizations who advocate on behalf of uh, immigrants, migrants, and refugees. Um, the Evacuate Our Allies, uh, our sister coalition with Afghan Evac, um, who does incredible work uh, on advocacy um, and uh, teaches us all about uh, complex immigration policy. Um, the entire ecosystem of uh, volunteers from all across the country who may not be affiliated with a group, but who have stepped up uh, during this time of crisis to assist those in need. Um, and my own organization, Team America Relief, uh, which at our height was comprised of more than 220 volunteers assisting more than 70,000 Afghans um, seeking safe passage from that country who currently face um, dire risks and those who've already made their way to the United States uh, who face an uncertain legal future uh, as their status remains um, in a difficult place. My name is Pete Lucier. Uh, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 2008 after graduating from St. Louis University High School. I served for five years as an 0311 infantry rifleman in the United States Marine Corps and deployed to Afghanistan in 2011. Um, 
during that time and that deployment and uh, in my work since, uh, the failures of, of that war, the lack of oversight and unclear mission uh, became more and more clear. Uh, those failures were codified in the, in the fall of Kabul uh, in August of, of 2021. Um, the subject of the hearing today is uh, the weeks leading up to that, those chaotic two weeks in the period after. Um, however, many mistakes were made over the course of the last 22 years that have led us to this moment. And our examination of those mistakes must include an urgent focus on finding solutions to the grave threats that so many Afghans that I work with and so many others work with face today. Um, as we examine those mistakes and look at solutions, uh, if I leave this committee with only one thought, it's this. It's not too late. Um, we're gonna talk a lot today about all of the mistakes that were made leading up to that, but urgent action right now will save so many lives. There's so many people that so many organizations work with today, um, and it's not too late to take swift action to, to assist those. Prior to the fall of Kabul in 2022, uh, civil society engaged with both Congress and the Biden administration uh, to take a look at um, how we could get more of our allies out faster. Unfortunately, that process never materialized, and on August 15th, uh, Kabul fell to the Taliban. My involvement in this uh, movement uh, began around August 15th. Uh, I began some fundraisers uh, for resettlement charities here in the United States, and I hoped that would be the sum total of my involvement. Uh, but shortly after those fundraisers were launched, one of those resettlement agencies reached out to me as a veteran and asked if I could help get just one person through the gates. That started the last 17 months of my work in this space, uh, just trying to assist one person. By the end of those two weeks, uh, the one person on my list had grown to 4,000. And by the end of 2021, uh, Team America had more than 70,000 names in its database that it was seeking to assist. During that period in August, uh, there were specific challenges that groups like mine faced. Coordination with government was difficult during that chaotic time. In addition to that, um, the private groups like my own uh, formed a, a, a chaotic environment. There wasn't clear prioritization um, and inequities in those private evacuations uh, led to inequitable outcomes. Many Afghans remain trapped in third countries uh, as a result of movement across international borders. Um, and we continue to seek to assist those today. After that time, uh, civil society groups continued to engage with uh, both the State Department, the administration, and Congress. Um, we broadened our efforts uh, to continue to assist uh, so many left behind. Um, I apologize. We cannot ignore the roots of this crisis. Systemic issues over multiple administrations from both parties contributed to a major humanitarian need that uh, neither party was willing to address. Um, but this is not the story of a Biden failure or a Trump failure. This is a story of an American failure and the effect it has had and continues to have on Afghans who served alongside myself and so many others. The failures that led to this point are owned and shared by four administrations, by Congress, and by 320 million Americans. This was our war. It's crucial that we learn from these failures to know what actions must now be undertaken. And most importantly, as I said, it's not too late. For years, we have failed our allies, folks who fought and bled along, uh, folks like myself and my brothers and sisters in arms. But even now, swift action will make a dramatic impact in the lives of many. Moreover, such action will be keeping in with the highest ideals that we share as a nation. Thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony today, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Lucer. I, I now recognize Specialist Gunnarsson for his opening statement. Good morning, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, and members of the committee. It is an honor to be here today. Thank you for inviting me to speak and conducting this hearing on the disastrous withdrawal of Afghanistan. I was on the ground in Habib Karzai International Airport, known as HKI, in Kabul, Afghanistan, during August 2021. I want America to know the truth, that Afghanistan withdrawal was an organizational failure at multiple levels. My name is Aiden Gunderson, and my desire to serve came from my mother, a former Army medic. I enlisted in the Army as an airborne combat medic before graduating high school in 2018. Stationed at Fort Bragg with the 82nd Airborne Division, I saw two deployments, one to Camp Taju, Iraq in 2020, and then to Kabul. On August 12th, 4,000 soldiers prepared for a rapid deployment, destination unknown. 48 hours later, on my 21st birthday, 100 soldiers and I boarded a plane with no further confirmation on the mission. During the last days, or during that, during the travel day, I went through many emotions, thinking about every possible scenario that we could face. 
Just before we landed, we learned that the president of Afghanistan fled the country and we would land in Kabul soon. I vividly remember the wheels touching down the night of August 15th and thinking to myself, are we going to land in a firefight? Not a single person on that plane was prepared for Kabul. A sense of dread spread over me and that makes matters worse. The only food and water we had was what we packed in our rucksacks before leaving America. To say all the supplies were scarce is an understatement. After 12 hours on the ground at HKI, we finally had our first mission. On August 16th, we were to told to secure the part of the northern boundary of HKI. In the Army, medic stayed with the company first sergeant. I remember checking, up, checking in on the soldiers in the northern guard towers. Up there, looking over Kabul, I saw large buildings and highways filled with Toyota trucks. These truck beds were loaded with 20 Taliban fighters with AK-47s and RPGs pointed in the air. The entire airport was surrounded. I also remember the chaos of hundreds of Afghans gathering on the runway. The US troops needed support. We found an unmanned fire truck, started it up, and drove off. We came to the middle of the runway where there was a blood, where, there, where blood saturated, dusty clothing and headscarves smoldered on the ground. These, dead, these covered the dead bodies that had fallen from the landing gear of the plane that just took off. At this moment, I truly understand that the Afghans were risking everything, even death, to escape the Taliban. The crowd so grew, grew so unruly and dangerous that the US leadership called Afghan allies to the airport to help us gain control. These Afghan partners did so by brutal means, but these actions saved our lives and allowed the evacuation to start. From August 19th on, I remained near Abbey Gate in a small shack where my company performed security oper operations and I treated injuries. As days passed, we, learned around the, we heard round-the-clock gunshots and screams from Abbey Gate. The gunfire was either Taliban executing someone or a warning shot used for crowd control. It was complete chaos, and to make matters worse, there was no interpreters. On August 22nd, my first sergeant, my commander, and I went to Abbey Gate because of the escalating situation with the crowd. An Afghan man approached us with his wife and young daughter shouting, 82nd, 82nd, 82nd. At first, we avoided him because our mission was security. He begged us to call the number on his phone. We did not understand, but we could see that his eighth-month pregnant wife needed medical attention. The crowd had trampled her, and she needed to get to the hospital. However, we did not know where that was within the airport because no one had given us a map of HKIA. We searched for the Norwegian hospital in an abandoned Ford Ranger, and the family set, seated in the back. While first sergeant drove, the Afghan handed his phone over. Congressman Mike Waltz was on the line. This Afghan man was his interpreter. The congressman thanked us for helping, and soon after, my first sergeant and my commander's phone numbers were spread to the various people back in the United States. This became the digital Dunkirk. Today, I sit beside Lieutenant Colonel, or retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann of Task Force Pineapple, who is one of many that coordinated through my first sergeant and commander nonstop. As text came in, first sergeant was say, come on, doc, we got more people to save. We received a pre-established system. Anyone with a pineapple image on their phone was matched to our phone records, was then matched to our phone records. We searched, we searched the Afghans for explosives and weapons, and then rushed them through the gate. I still carry these horrific scenes of Abbey Gate even the smell. Mothers carrying dead babies, and the Taliban mercilessly beating people and civilians begging for their lives. The, crew, the, the crowd grew more desperate and erratic, and they knew they would be left behind. On August 26th, after 11 days on the ground, I exited my vehicle near the Abbey Gate. I took 10 steps from my vehicle and felt a heavy punch to my chest. I looked up and saw a large plume of smoke and debris shooting into the sky. Immediately, we ran towards the explosion, and the smell of feces and urine that constantly filled the corridors of H. Kaya was replaced with an overwhelming stench of iron. Screams from little children, women, and grown men echoed in the tight corridor. Marines and corpsmen around me fought through tears to provide life-saving aid to our emotionless and severely injured American brothers and sisters. Over the next hour, I tried to save the lives of countless Marines. We all tried our best. It was a nightmare. An injured Marine with blood-soaked pants squeezed my hand as tightly as he could and looked into my eyes, yelling, I don't want to die, as we took the first truck truckload of Marines into the hospital. I reassured him that he would be fine, but as they carried him inside, I did not know if he would survive. I was born one year before 9-11. For 20 years of my life, we were at war, and there I was, watching the enemy take over the country's capital. Departing on August 31st, on one of the last flights out of the country, I was relieved to be headed home. But I wondered how the horror I just witnessed had changed me, how it would change us all. I can assure you that it has. This war is not over for millions of people in Afghanistan and the US. Thoughts of those two weeks have plagued my mind since coming home. I see the faces of all the people we could not save, all those that we left behind. I wonder if our Afghan allies fled to safety or they were killed by the Taliban. Every day I think about my brothers and sisters that died in Afghanistan and the family and friends missing them. Mostly I think about the 13 Marines or the 13 Americans killed at Abbey Gate. Their deaths should not have happened. 
They should be alive today, and I, like many others, should not be forced to be carried this burden for the rest of our lives. Please consider those 13 and me as you conduct this investigation. Please consider the youth of America who continue to serve and never put them in that position again. Please remember our allies left behind to face death because they served alongside us. Thank you for hearing the truth, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gunnarsson. I uh, now recognize the Lieutenant Colonel Mann for his opening statement. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, committee members, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. I'm here to relive August 2021 with all of you, not as a Democrat or as a Republican, but as an American combat veteran that's going to do my best to represent over 800,000 Afghanistan war veterans and their families, but with my own point of view. I'm a Green Beret and a retired Lieutenant Colonel with nearly 23 years in service and three combat tours in Afghanistan. I'd like to start with a question. What does an American promise mean today? There's a promise in the military that is both explicit and implicit. I have your back. We were trained that way. It's, it's in our blood. But in August 2021, the leaders who held us to that standard went silent while our Afghan allies were left behind. The US government may not have had the backs of our Afghan allies, but our veterans did. For as long as we've been a nation, our veterans have been a moral compass for doing the right thing, especially in hard times. As we try to figure out where to go from here, I suspect we're going to need that moral compass more than ever. You won't find many veterans sitting out here today who relish being involved in this Afghan evacuation. We paid our dues, and we tried to move on with our lives. I know jumping back into the quagmire of Afghanistan was certainly not part of my military retirement plan. But like thousands of other veterans across the country watching Kabul collapse on August 15, 2021, I received a phone call from a friend that absolutely crushed me. I'm not afraid to die, he said to me. I just don't want to die alone. Those were the words that dragged me back into the Afghanistan conflict. His name was Sergeant First Class Nezamuddin Nizami, but I just called him Nizam. His father was a Mujahideen fighter who was killed by the Soviets when he was four months old. He had no money, no family, no hope, yet somehow he became an Afghan commando, one of the elite warriors who were trained by U.S. Special Operations to do really 95% of the fighting in the country. Green Berets, including me, who worked with Nizam, we loved him like a brother. He volunteered for every mission, every day. He was family. But despite numerous inquiries to the State Department, Congress, and even Army Special Operations Headquarters about his SIV status, Kabul was falling and no one was coming to help him. This was a guy who was shot through the face protecting U.S. Green Berets from a Taliban ambush. And for me, he was the same guy that even while he was being hunted and texted by the Taliban would call me to ask how my kids were doing. Over the next few weeks, I assembled a small team of volunteers, mostly veterans from across the country that we called Task Force Pineapple to guide Nizam and hundreds more to safety. We didn't have any resources or battlefield access or time, but we had something that a lot of people didn't, relationships and trust. We used cell phones, knowledge of the terrain, and an encrypted chat room to guide at-risk commandos and their families at night navigating through that suffocating crowd through an open sewage canal and then into position to link up with known NATO service members like Aiden who were standing watch near a four-foot hole in the perimeter fence. Pineapple wasn't the only group. There were hundreds of ad hoc volunteer groups doing similar work, many of them sitting out here today. From breakfast tables to basements across the world, Jane, a gold star wife who lost her husband, Chris, in Afghanistan. Will, a double amputee, fighting to save the interpreter who saved his life on the battlefield. And dozens, even hundreds more. We helped hundreds of allies, but thousands were left behind, and at great cost to this vulnerable veteran population who had already given so much. My buddy, Steve, who was racked with post-traumatic stress and a traumatic brain injury from an IED, screamed into his pillow and pounded his bed because his children were in the next room. As his former interpreter was detained at a Taliban checkpoint and was pleading over the phone, Steve, they are beating my wife. My children are watching this for God's sakes. What should I do? Can I fight them? Why is this happening? 
Jay, a former Navy SEAL in Pineapple, received a text on signal from his Afghan partner. My daughter has been trampled, sir. I know we're going to miss our chance to escape, but she's unconscious and barely breathing. It's okay, my friend. Thank you for trying. This whole thing has been a gutting experience. I never imagined I would witness the kind of gross abandonment followed by a career-preserving silence of senior leaders, military, and civilian. As a result of the way that we've left Afghanistan, we're on the front end of a national security crisis as 27 violent extremist groups are now operating on former NATO security bases with Taliban top cover. And I think we're on the front end of a mental health tsunami as 73% of our Afghan war veterans say they feel betrayed by how this war ended. Calls to the VA hotline have spiked 81% in the first year since the Afghan withdrawal, and they keep coming. My friend Brad was found dead a few months ago in a Mississippi hotel room. His wife Dana confirmed to me that the Afghan abandonment reactivated all the demons that he had managed to put behind him from our time in Afghanistan together. And he just couldn't find his way out of the darkness of that moral injury. America is building a nasty reputation for multi-generational systemic abandonment of our allies that we leave as smoldering human wreckage from the mountain yards of Vietnam to the Kurds in Syria. Our veterans know something else that this committee might do well to consider. We might be done with Afghanistan, but it's not done with us. The enemy has a vote. If we don't set politics aside and pursue accountability and lessons learned to address this grievous moral injury, on our military community and right the wrongs that have been inflicted on our most at-risk Afghan allies, this colossal foreign policy failure will follow us home and ultimately draw us right back into the graveyard of empires where it all started. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Mann. And I want to thank you for working with me and my office, my staff, getting people out. Um, and you described uh, the chaos and the moral injury, I think, is, is how you put it. And I think everybody, this whole panel, uh, sustained moral injury. And I think the nation sustained moral injury from what happened. Um, I'd like to recognize other people in the hearing room who also assisted. And uh, they're here to support their friends testifying. I ask unanimous consent to have written statements of the following people who have assisted with the evacuation be entered into the record. Anna Lloyd with Task Force Argo, Ben Owen, President and CEO of Flanders Field, Christopher Purdy with Human Rights First, Catalina Gaspar, COO of No One Left Behind, Mary Beth Long, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Counter Narcoterrorism, Jeff uh, Fanif, Director of Advocacy at No One Left Behind. Thomas Kaza with the 1208 Foundation. Uh, Sergeant Eric uh, Haight, retired. And Lieutenant Colonel Ernest uh, Nispero with ACES and eight. Um, without objection, so ordered. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Uh, it's hard to even know where to start, <clears throat> but. I want to turn to you, Mr. Uh, Sergeant Vargas Andrews. Uh, you described the scene as chaotic, uh, that the State Department was not prepared, that uh, they would completely shut down processing every evening and into the morning, leaving you and your colleagues with a nightmare, you called it. Could you describe that? Yes, I can, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> So for us, obviously, um, guys, ground forces at Abbey Gate were routine. And I'm sure it was like this at other gates as well. But at Abbey, um, you know, helping process between, you know, seven of us and our sniper team, uh, we would go down. And if we weren't on the gun or we weren't catching a few winks, um, we would be down processing nationals and civilians and, uh, you know, talking with everyone down there. And from us, we were passed from our chain of command you know, throughout the evening to, to halt processing Afghans, to stop searching them. Um, they, we, you know, we kind of had to keep, keep control of the crowd that was left over in the evening throughout, I would say, sundown to sun up. Um, 
there was no there was no plan in place throughout the evening, and um, the State Department would not take Afghans that we process or search. So eventually, we just stopped throughout the evening. The um, I'll go back to you. Yeah, and um, I think because you're correct, there was no plan. There was no plan, and then the plan was to leave the Taliban in charge of this evacuation, which led to the chaos and the bloodshed that ensued after that. I want to focus specifically on what you saw <clears throat> on August 26. I know a be on the lookout, an intelligence bulletin went out uh, identifying two individuals as a potential IED threat. That is correct. To the Gate. Yes, we um, routinely we'd send um, two or three guys back uh, to collect intel from from our intel assets um, over in the Joint Joint Operations Command, and that morning around uh, 2 a.m. we were passed that the suicide that a suicide bomber was in the vicinity and in the you know surrounding neighborhoods uh, potentially moving towards the gate. We were told that. He was uh, wearing a brown man dress, a black vest. Um, he would look clean shaven and be younger with an older man um, traveling as his companion. And we saw just that on the 26th, um, you know, around 1230 in the afternoon. And in fact, uh, you said you uh, passed along the communications network that there was a potential threat, an IED attack imminent. And in your words, this was as serious as it gets. That is correct. We, we had eyes on um, these two individuals that fit the exact description that we were given of, uh, from our intel assets. And we had pictures. We had them a clear as day to be able to see through our scope um, with ease of fire on both individuals, as well as through our spotting scope. Um, we have high-powered optics with quality lenses on our cameras to take clear clear-cut pictures of everything that we see, that's our, that is an enormous part of our job. Do you still have those photos? They were taken on an SD card when we turned them over to intelligence. Um, Then you said you requested from your commander, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brad Whitted, to come to the tower to see what you saw. And the psychological operations came to the tower and confirmed that the suspect met the suicide bomber description. Is that Correct. That is correct, yes. So you had them. We did. And then you showed this evidence, and you asked your commander if you could shoot. We did, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> both myself and my team leader asked, asked for engagement authority, and he responded with uh, he did not have that authority. So we asked who did. He told us he did not know and would go find out in that time. Um, in the time of talking with him and keeping eyes on this individual over the course of 30 minutes, uh, the two individuals both disappeared into the crowd of thousands, as shown on um, the slides as I was talking. I mean, I think everyone can understand um, by looking at some of those pictures that I, that I had up there how enormous the crowd was. I mean, it, it was unfathomable. Um, very easy to move through and conceal yourself, and that's what happened. So you asked for engagement permission. And your commanding officer says, I don't know. That is correct. He doesn't know if you have permission to take out the threat. Yes. There are no rules of engagement on the ground. We were told to pass to our command if we saw any um, suspicious activity or hostile intent. And that's exactly what we did. We were not returned with an answer. And then you ask, well, who does, who yes. does know? And he says he doesn't know, but would find out, and he never got an answer to you he never did and the individual disappeared that he did and you believe that that was a suicide bomber we do and then you said we made everyone on the ground aware operations had halted started again plain and simple we were ignored our expertise was disregarded and then lastly no one was accountable for our safety that day that is correct, Chairman. No one was account. No one was held accountable. No one was, and no one is to this day. Did your com- uh, c- uh, battalion commander run that request up the chain of command? He should have. That was his responsibility to. I don't know if he did. Wouldn't I that be the normal that. protocol? That would be the normal protocol, Chairman. But we we don't know. And as a result, 
We have 13 dead servicemen, women. We have 170 Afghans killed and 45, including yourself, sir, injured. That is correct. Because that threat could not be taken out because your commanding officer couldn't give you the order. That is correct. Amazing. I uh, now uh, recognize the ranking member. Again, let me thank each witness for their testimony. Each member for your service to our country, for your being courageous. Uh, I've listened very intently. And in listening, you know, I started thinking about a number of members of the service, many who had served in the military uh, and have had conversation with several Gold Star family members who lost individuals, lost family members in, in Afghanistan. And I began to think then, what is the major, the one real question that I have, and I want to address it, I guess I'll address it to you, Peter, and then to you, Lieutenant Colonel Mann. The one decision that I know that the President of the United States made was to stop the war in Afghanistan, to leave, to exit. So, Mr. Mr. Lucifer, Lucia, the question is, should the president have made the decision to exit the war in Afghanistan, in your opinion? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, ranking member. And Lucifer happens all the time, uh, especially with, uh, yeah, back in the day when we used to get, you know, uh, telemarketers on the, on the landline. Um, so it's a good question. It's a difficult one. It's one that I struggle with. Prior to all this, um, I took actions and um, spoke to some members of Congress here today about how I felt about how the war had been conducted and um, where we ought to go. Should we have stayed in Afghanistan? I, strictly in my personal opinion and experiences, that war was a frustrating one in 2011. Um, Conducting counterinsurgency operations felt um, vague, without uh, direction. Um, so it was difficult. And seeing the violence and the lives lost and the friends I lost uh, during that conflict and then and then after, um, it's tough. Ultimately, you know, that's not my decision to make. Um, I'm not sure that I have a the right answer. Afghanistan was incredibly complex. It's surrounded by regional partners. There's uh, nuclear folks in the region. It's it's hard. Making those decisions is hard, and that's what we ask our elected leaders to do. Um, congressional oversight was lacking for 20 years of war. Uh, you know, budgets were passed year after year um, with little examination of how the war was going. So there was little pressure uh, for the way that we were conducting the war to change. Um, so it's a good question, but ultimately, the work that I do as an advocate um, and with the organizations that I do is focused on helping those left behind. Uh, we can't change that decision, but uh, there's a lot of people on my list who are trying to get here, um, and there's lots of things that we could do to help them that aren't being done. So and I want to get to that because that's we've got to talk about also the things that we can do. But I do want to give Lieutenant Colonel Mann an opportunity because I think that's a fundamental issue. I know, as I said, you know, we lost 2,461 Americans, including the 13 that were killed, all of which, each and every one of them breaks my heart. But I know I had difficulty in talking to some even before the evacuation as to what are we doing there? Um, and ultimately, the president had to make a decision. Either we stay as the prior administrations had to make an, a decision. 
President Trump, President Obama, you know, these other minutes, they had to make a decision. Do we escalate or do we not? And that's something that a commander in chief has to decide. But I guess each of us may have our own personal opinions. What's yours? I appreciate the opportunity to answer that, that question, Ranking Member Meeks. And, and I would just say, like Pete, I, you know, I, it's, it's, I'm not a policy guy. But what I will say is, as, as a career special forces officer who spent a good amount of time in Afghanistan helping to build capacity uh, for the Afghan security forces to be an antibody to violent extremist groups so that we didn't have to do it. That, that, that was, for the special forces, the community, that was something very near and dear to our hearts, especially when what happened on 9-11 pointed so directly to the absence of a ground intelligence capability and a viable partner force. And so we fought and we bled for 20 years to build an Afghan special operations forces capacity. And while I know the, the, the meta-narrative is that the security forces withdrew, didn't fight, the reality is the Afghan special ops did 95% of the fighting and fought to the very end. Most of them ran out of bullets. Many of them were overrun. And so, so my point on that is I believe that that, that could have been a, a responsible antibody to violent extremist groups with a small footprint that do advise and assist. And, and I believe that we could have maintained that. But instead, we allowed the contract air to go away and, and all of the maintenance. They, they were left without any air support, any medevac, and they were not able to do what special operators are great at doing. So I believe that they could have stayed in an advisory capacity. Uh, and now what we're left with is 27 violent extremist groups on the rise unfettered safe haven, and only the national resistance front as the antibody to it and nothing else. I had a follow-up, but I know I'm out of time, so Thank you. I'll yield back. Chair recognizes Mr. <clears throat> Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this extraordinarily important hearing. You know, lessons learned without accountability. Uh, we have to have accountability. This is, I think, perhaps the most important hearing that we have had, uh, and I want to thank you for convening it. Uh, let me just add a couple of questions in uh, very limited time. Uh, Sergeant Vargas Andrews, um, in early September of 2021, a National Security Council spokesperson characterized the Taliban as acting business-like and professional. And in your testimony, obviously, we just heard it. You talked about how countless Afghans were murdered by the Taliban 155 yards in front of our position, day and night, and that the Taliban would routinely murder people under our observation at their checkpoint. We communicated the atrocities to our chain of command and our intel assets, but nothing came of it. Colonel Mann, you pointed out, uh, and again, all of your testimonies are extraordinary and so helpful uh, and heartbreaking, uh, but you pointed out that you know, your buddy Steve, uh, you know, the former, his former interpreter uh, was detained by the Taliban. He was pleading over the phone. They're beating my wife. My children were watching this, for God's sake. Should I fight them? Why is this happening? You talked about it being a gutting experience. Uh, and then you go on to say, I never imagined the kind of gross abandonment followed by career persevering, preserving silence of senior leaders, both military and civ civilian. And coming from you and from all of you, that kind of sentiment today, uh, where are our top leaders? You know, have any of us heard President Biden and Vice President Harris at the State of the Union or at any other venue? talk and convey to those left behind, both the Americans and our allies, you're not forgotten. Uh, and to say, we will not let up uh, in terms of our pursuit. You've had to do it kind of like a private sector initiative at great risk to yourselves, and you might want to speak to those risks. Uh, and, and let me just say also, past is often prologue. Uh, we know that, and I read People's Daily and Global Times uh, every day, and they have one editorial after the other telling the people of Taiwan right now, look at what Biden did in this egregiously flawed exodus uh, to the people of Taiwan. America will not have your back. And, you know, it's important that we always have the back of our friends and allies. These are people who bled with you, lost their lives with you. Uh, so if you could speak to any of those issues, I would appreciate it. But, you know, who's the one person who got held to account? Uh, an officer who went on social media criticizing uh, the exodus. You know, they threw the book at him. Why weren't there more truth tellers in all of this? So if you could, Sergeant. Can you, can you cl clarify what you're asking? Well, I am asking about this lack, you know, the, the two sets of, of information that went out. People telling us that they were professional, uh, that they're acting, you know, with decorum, certainly uh, and businesslike. 
when you are seeing a completely opposite phenomenon right in front of you, people are getting killed uh, at their checkpoints, and you saw it firsthand. What I, what I would say, the only thing uh, professional about the Taliban is them professionally, be, professionally being able to brutalize and torture people. Um, there was no, no sense of civility or being what you would consider a regular human being right. um, in that situation. I mean, they, the Taliban were out there doing what they've done best as long as we've been at war with them, yeah. um, as long as they've been an organization. Um, they're, they're, I mean, they, they continue to brutalize people in front of us because they knew that they could, because we weren't gonna do anything about it, and that's exactly what happened. Congressman, I'll just speak to the, the, the personal and organizational responsibility piece. Um, I was brought up by really outstanding Special Forces NCOs who taught me that one of the most important things that you can ever do as a leader is when you screw up, you take responsibility for it. You take personal, personal accountability, responsibility for your actions, whatever they are. And I think most of the veterans sitting out here today would agree with that, regardless of their politics. And one of the things that that I know I made tons of mistakes in this war um, that I'll have to live with for the rest of my life. Um, there's some folks that are not here because of some of the mistakes I made. And, and, but I, I think where we are now is this moral injury that, that has been in, heaped upon, not just our veterans, but our, our Gold Star family members, our families of the fallen, our military family members that are trying to look around right now and figure out what this was all about. What, what did, did, this, did this sacrifice m matter? And when we have a violation of what we know to be right by those that we trust, it doesn't matter where that comes from. The fact of the matter is the only way to move from moral injury to moral recovery is for leaders to step forward first and foremost and take responsibility for what happened. There's no way that we can ascertain lessons learned or where we go from here if leaders don't responsibly step forward and own it. And I think it's, yes, it starts with the commander in chief, but it needs to go all the way down to our retired admirals and generals and sergeants major, all of them, we're going to have to really lean into this mental health issue um, to address this thing. It's going to take all leaders at all levels to acknowledge that this thing was a serious mistake and it can't ever happen again. I see I'm out of time. Thank you so very much. Chair recognizes Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all of our witnesses. Um, it is sobering and very moving to hear you. And Mr. Vargas, uh, Andrews, your pain and your sacrifice, I want you to know will stay with us for a long time. And I hope will guide us as we make life and death decisions about war and peace. Because human beings are at stake. It isn't just broad, big, huge geopolitical dynamics. It's people like you who have to bear the brunt of the decisions we make, and we need to bear that responsibility. So thank you for having the courage to be here. Thank you for shedding your tears with us, and know that you're making a difference with your testimony here today on all of us. This hearing, and Lieutenant Colonel, I don't know your politics, but I think what you said needs to be taken to heart at several levels, but let me pick the one about the reputation of the United States with respect to being a faithful ally. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's really important. And it goes back to 1975, at least, in the fall of Saigon, which, by the way, was very messy. Not a pretty sight at all. Talk about faithlessness. All kinds of people were left behind in a very ugly and public way. And for years thereafter, it remained chaotic. Boat people coming from Vietnam, primarily, uh, to, to get away from the communist regime. And you're right to point out the question of, will we be faithful to the Kurds? And what is our obligation to those Afghans left behind? I also want to say, I hope this hearing doesn't descend into just a, let's pick on the other party's president because that is a revisionist view of history and serves no purpose and does not bring honor to the table. As you said, Lieutenant Colonel, mistakes were made over a series of administrations. Going back to 
George W. Bush deciding there were weapons of mass destruction and Iraq was a priority and we took our eye off what we were trying to do in Afghanistan. It wasn't President Biden who decided to meet with the Taliban and to exclude the government we were supporting from those negotiations in Doha. It was President Trump. Imagine, imagine what that did to the Afghan morale in the military and their government. To know that the United States, their chief patron and supplier and ally and partner in the field, had decided to only meet with what you've just described as a murderous, torturing, amoral force at best, the Taliban. It wasn't President Biden who set an absolute withdrawal date. It was President Trump. And everything unraveled from that. President Biden inherited that. Yes, what happened in August of 2021 was messy and violent and something to be avoided at all costs if we could. But it didn't happen sui generis in August of 2021. It had a history. There, were, there, there was a context and there were previous decisions made that led to that tragedy. And to try to now make this a partisan advantage cheapens the experience of so many who gave so much, including our Afghan allies. And I hope we keep that in mind, and I hope we can use this hearing to good purpose instead of narrow partisan political purpose, which in my view serves no purpose at all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields uh, back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Chairman Mike McCall and Ranking Member Greg Meeks. And uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the service of each of you and the other veterans who are here today. And I, I agree with President Donald Trump, and that is that the Afghan abandonment was the most colossal military and uh, foreign policy mistake in the history of the United States. Uh, we had 13 uh, of our service members murdered. Uh, we have had an uh, unknown number of our allies and Americans uh, left behind in Afghanistan to uh, the murderous uh, Taliban. Uh, it, it's inexcusable. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit with our troops 10 times uh, in my service, and uh, I saw uh, the great work that you did. First of all, uh, the uh, veterans of Afghanistan, you kept us safe for 20 years uh, after 9-11, and we should have learned uh, from 9-11 uh, that uh, Osama bin Laden operated out of a cave uh, in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we're setting our country up, uh, Colonel, as you identify, uh, with 27 different uh, terrorist groups uh, in a safe haven to attack America again. And the thought that um, we would not have had, uh, as uh, Congressman Smith and I were just talking about, President uh, Trump made it clear that he would maintain Bagram Air Base. Uh, with that in mind, my 10 visits, I first went and uh, there was rubble. Uh, the Soviets had destroyed the country uh, up to the uh, just one lane of traffic. I saw the roads clear. I saw the roads paved. I saw the sidewalks built. It was so inspiring to see young uh, boys going to school in groups with baseball caps, uh, and then to see uh, young girls going to school in white scarves. Uh, we saw a uh, society being developed, and then sadly, um, it was abandoned. It's personal to me, my National Guard unit, the 218th Brigade of uh, the South Carolina Army National Guard, served for a year in Afghanistan uh, with General, uh, the Adjutant General uh, at, at, at Bob Livingston, uh, and it was uh, so uh, inspiring. Uh, our troops were all over the country uh, in small outposts, and uh, they developed a great affection for their Afghan brothers. And then I'm grateful my youngest son, uh, First Lieutenant uh, Hunter Wilson, served for a year uh, in Afghanistan as an engineer. So it's very personal to me, and that's why I just, I just consider it so uh, disgraceful, uh, the betrayal of the people of Afghanistan, the betrayal of the uh, service by NATO allies, by American troops. And on, uh, disgracefully, on August the 26th, uh, the president uh, delivered a, I had a press conference, and I want to quote what he said. The military have all contacted me, usually by letter, 
stating that they subscribe to the mission as designed. End of quote. I, that day, sent a letter to the president asking him for copies of these letters. I know the letters don't exist. I have faith in the American military. And so every two months, I've been asking for the letters. I've never got a response. And it would seem like to me the American media might be interested, too. Uh, where are these letters uh, that uh, designed uh, this disgrace, which has paved the way for world war criminal Putin to uh, threaten and uh, to invade uh, Ukraine, to threaten um, by the Chinese Communist Party, to threaten Taiwan, to provide for the mullahs in Tehran, to plan for the vaporization of the people of Israel and the vaporization of the people of the United States. With that in mind, I'd like to ask a question uh, to uh, Sergeant Vargas Andrews and to Specialist Gunderson. Were the troops given clear and consistent direction as to who should be granted entry into the airport? Can you say that one more time, Congressman, please? Your question. The, the question I have is, were the troops, were you, given uh, clear and consistent direction as to who should be granted uh, entry into the airport, and did the State Department fulfill their responsibility to properly screen and admit uh, Afghan allies? Uh, well, thank you for the question, Congressman. I cannot speak to the State Department and how they did. Um, I know that the Marines down at Abbey Gate and I looked for SIVs and blue passports, but uh, I don't think I was ever given, like, uh, from my leadership, a direct guidance. Like, this is who we were pulling out, and this is who we're not. Well, you did your best, and uh, Sergeant. Myself, um, I know for, for a while at the gate, uh, a lot of guys had no idea what even special immigrant visas even looked like. Um, took people asking, higher-ups asking, because they were, look for this and look for passports. We know what passports look like. The majority of people know what passports look like. But as far as special immigrant visas, it was probably four days in, into the gate before I started seeing them. Again, thank you all. And Mr. Lucier, thank you. I appreciate your family. Best wishes on your continued success. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Keating. I just want to thank all our witnesses and all in, in the audience and anyone that's listening to this for their service. Um, and I want to associate uh, very strongly with your remarks, uh, given experience I've had. Uh, it's not as personal by any means. It's not as uh, powerful by any means. But it's carved in my mind indelibly uh, as a family of, uh, as a Gold Star family in particular. Uh, it was in Helmand Province when, as a congressional, Member, I visited with the troops there and listened to uh, uh, our leaders in terms of strategy. And um, as often as the case with so many of us, we'll say, if there's anything I can ever do for you, uh, I told the Marines that were uh, protecting us, uh, please let me know. And in this one instance, they said, well, sir, th there is, if you would. And so that evening, I went to uh, the marketplace in the village with them. Uh, and we went to meet a, a gentleman, a man that was there. Uh, and uh, I found out that they wanted simply a member of Congress to thank this Afghan civilian because he was risking his life every day, telling them where the IEDs were planted, telling them what the strategies and the movements of the Taliban would be. And I asked him when I met him, I said, why are you risking your life to this extent to do that? And, and behind him, he reached back and pulled forward his eight-year-old boy and he said, <clears throat> I just want him to have the same freedom, education that you have in your country here in Afghanistan. I'll never forget that moment. Uh, and those are the people you've been talking about, people that risk their lives to protect us and, and our soldiers. And we just don't owe these allies. We just don't owe them, I don't think we would be benefited by their citizenship as Americans, with their shared values, with their demonstrated courage, and with their personal commitment to democratic values. They would be outstanding American citizens. And I don't want that point lost either. And I don't want another point lost, particularly with uh, our witnesses here that served us so well. That's not to say thank you for what happened in those final days. Uh, thank you for your bravery. We were briefed uh, on the dangers that would occur 
in our classified briefings. It's the most dangerous part of the war, they said. And you were there. And some of your lives will never be the same, along with many of the colleagues who said, people that uh, are injured physically, people with hidden injuries that will never quite be the same. But you saved, helped save 120,000 people during that very difficult situation. It could have been better, but you did it. And there's 120,000 people just in those 15 days, 76,000 Afghans that were saved. Thank you. Uh, and that shouldn't be lost as we look at everything else and lessons learned. I, I know how difficult it was, not directly as you, but you know our office was 24-7 and uh, I was on the phone. I was actually on the phone uh, with an Afghan family uh, talking to, I'll just call it a U.S. official uh, at the Abbey Gate. And uh, as I was on the phone, explosions went off within uh, their site. Uh, and that's how dangerous this whole situation was. You experienced, and thank you for sharing, so much more. Uh, but that commitment that we have, and I wasn't the only office, there were other offices working, trying to extricate people, bring them here, get them beyond that danger and move them forward. But we worked together in doing that. We, we had direct effect with 62 individuals and uh, my staff was, uh, just didn't sleep. And one of them, by the way, is le left us this week and is gonna go work for CARE. Uh, they were, she was so moved as an Army uh, uh, veteran and person that worked in our office with this, she's now changed her career to help this, and that's important as well. And I hope we don't gather too much in much, but this, I'm running out of time, I'll just say this. Uh, the testimony, and I read every word of it a couple of times, uh, was very moving. Most important words that stuck out to me, uh, beyond just looking at lessons learned or the bipartisan back and forth of whose fault it is, it's 21 years, there's a lot of fault to go around. Uh, but it, it was the words that, that Mr. Lucier said, it's not too late for us to evacuate our remaining Afghan allies and settle them in the United States. It's not too late. So I'll work with all of you, I pledge, uh, not just as a co-sponsor, a proud co-sponsor of the Afghan Adjustment Act, last Congress, and wanting to do that again in this Congress, and continuing to work with groups as we have like Afghan EVAC going forward. The purpose of this hearing, as was your purpose in serving, was to help other people. So let's take this hearing and put aside the who did it. Uh, and for once, in a bipartisan way, let's say, take the words that I just quoted Mr. Lucier of. It's not too late to go forward, and let's do that. And I yield back. Gentleman yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Perry. I thank the chairman. I want to submit the following items for the record. The Senate Committee on Foreign Relations Minority Report titled Locked Up and the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction Report titled Why the Afghan Security Force Collapsed. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the individuals that have spent the time, the energy to come here today. It's important that we hear, that we listen and hear your message and feel your message. It is important that you get to tell your story. But I am frustrated. Today, you should be here telling your story, and there should be some other folks here to hear your story. The Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, where are they? Mr. Chairman, there better be a hearing with the full committee with them here. This is the biggest foreign policy failure since we left Vietnam. Very similar, right? The only difference maybe in some ways is the cost and the fact that a Huey was leaving the, the embassy in, in, in Hanoi, and instead a Chinook was departing with billions of dollars on it and the president of Afghanistan. That was the image that the United States saw. That's the difference of this foreign policy failure. While my friends on the other side of the aisle say, don't ascribe any blame to it, and then go on to ascribe blame to what happened, remind everybody that the president of the United States, the commander in chief, knew this was coming, had six months, over six months to deal with this, and ignored everything 
he was being told, and what's the cost of that? 13 U.S. service members murdered. Our American service members deserve better. Our country deserves better. How many did we leave stranded? The Senate Foreign Affairs Committee report locked up said the State Department continuously misled or outright contradicted themselves. Well, isn't that coincidental? How many times is this government going to lie to us and cost us our lives? The coordinator for Afghanistan relocation effort, Beth Jones, said at times there were a hundred waiting. And then we found out maybe it's thousands. We don't even know how many because they didn't know how many because they were incompetent, they were unprepared. And these folks did the work that our government would not do, forced into a position because of incompetence and lack of preparation and quite honestly, lack of care. Billions of dollars worth of assets left in Afghanistan. We don't know where they were, we don't know where they are, sold to Russia, Ukraine, cartel, Syria. We have no way of knowing because the servers storing the records crashed in March of 2021. How convenient. How convenient. We do know this. We left biometrics behind, facial images, fingerprints, the addresses of the people that helped these people for the Taliban to co go round up and publicly murder, torture, and kill. Unacceptable. Unacceptable betrayal. Unacceptable. Yet we're still not talking to those who are involved. My friends on the other side of the aisle say, well, don't ascribe any blame. We're not trying to ascribe blame. We'd like some accountability for two years. We've been coming to this committee hearing. You could have come. They weren't interested in hearing from you. The only reason you're here now is because we're in charge and the chairman asked you to come. But I encourage the chairman for a full committee hearing with you here to face the people that put you in the position Sir, it's not your battalion commander's fault that he didn't get the rules of engagement to allow you to engage. Somebody above him stopped that person, stopped your commander from, from issuing the order because I guarantee you, commanders in the field want to service the enemy and keep their troops safe. That's what we want to do. We need to know who did it. There needs to be an accountability. And so far, no one's been held accountable except some poor Marine in uniform who said, something has gone terribly wrong here and we need to do something about it. Those folks, the folks at the top, the folks that made the decision to betray you and to betray our allies and betray our country, they need to come before this committee and the American people and explain how this happened and who's going to be held accountable so that it doesn't happen again. We cannot continue to do this. Mr. Chairman, I request a full committee hearing with the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff so we can get to the bottom of this and ascribe accountability. And I yield the balance. That's certainly our game plan. We're uh, starting with the eyewitnesses to the Abbey Gate bombing. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. And the veterans groups who got these people out. We lost a lot of them. But if you all hadn't stepped up to the plate, nobody would have gotten out of there. So, Chair recognizes Mr. Cicilline. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking our witnesses for being here today and obviously recognize the extraordinary service and sacrifices you have all made to our country and to recognize the Gold Star families and other members of the military who have joined us today for um, sharing very powerful testimony. I will say at the outset that um, l let me be very clear that there was never going to be a good time to leave Afghanistan but this forever war needed to come to an end. And amidst the unavoidable turmoil of ending a war that had spanned two decades, the Biden administration carried out an unprecedented evacuation, helping more than 120,000 people evacuate. After two decades of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, today's hearing should be focused on examining the full scope of this conflict, its failures and its successes, including how U.S. foreign policy and strategy led to this moment and now we can continue our efforts to assist and relocate vulnerable Afghans. I fear, however, that today's hearing was not convened in that spirit, but rather as an attempt to distract us from the full picture, and even in some cases to try to score political points, which I believe dishonors the lives lost and the bravery of those who sit before this committee. 
When the Trump administration pressured the Afghan government to free 5,000 Taliban fighters, it affected events on the ground. When the Trump administration direct, negotiated directly with the Taliban, undermining the Afghan government, it affected the events on the ground. And when the Trump administration dismantled our nation's refugee programs, it impacted events on the ground. And so I know a lot of the discussion today is about our obligation to those who assisted us in this war, and I think we all recognize the important responsibilities that we have. But I want to ask very specifically about the conditions that were in place that made that more difficult. And Mr. Lucier and Ms. Meckler, these questions are specifically for you. President Trump uh, instituted a set of immigration policy that really centered on reducing the numbers of non-white refugees and immigrants allowed to come into the United States. He slashed staffing across the interagencies for those dedicated to processing such applications, including the Special Immigrant Visa Program. And he instituted, of course, the infamous Muslim ban. Throughout the administration, the number of Afghan SIVs processed plummeted while applications continue to rise, causing the wait times for SIV applicants to balloon to more than two years by January of 2021. In June of 2021, Secretary Blinken had dedicated an additional 50 personnel to process SIV applications, but by that point, the average wait time was more than 700 days. The backlog at the time the Biden administration took office was more than 17,000 cases. And so my first question is, in your experience, what kind of damage to the immigration system, to the refugee admission process, and to other US institutions was done during this period? And how did it make it more difficult to bring out the very people that we were attempting to bring out? And did you, in light of, of what existed at the time, did you notice any willingness from members of the Trump administration to streamline the process for SIV applicants, refugees, for humanitarian parolees, particularly in the wake of the Trump administration's negotiated withdrawal agreement with the Taliban? Thank you for your question, Congressman. I can take the first uh, stab at answering. I've been an immigration attorney for almost 20 years, and I can assure you that the immigration system has been broken for far longer than that, and that it is systemic failures over administration after administration that has led us to where we are today, and we need to start looking at solutions to all of that, um, not just what one administration did. Um, when the current administration took office, um, resources had been decimated in many areas, including the refugee resettlement area. Um, the SIV process had ground to a halt. Um, backlogs are a, light, a factor of life in all immigration proceedings. Um, we look at the SIV system because it is a clear way of helping some Afghan allies, but there are many who could potentially help through visa, family visa processing, but that also is um, just you know stuck in, in endless and endless backlogs. The refugee resettlement process, like I said, takes years um, and had to rebuild to to get even back to where it was prior um, in, in the early days of this administration. So I think we need to take a much bigger view. The immigration system is not functional. It is not functional and it has not been functional for decades. And we need to take a look at it and we need to figure out how we realign it with our values and how we want to be able to show up and help allies like those in Afghanistan who had absolutely and continue to have no pathways. Even those who made it here are stuck in, in unending asylum backlogs. Um, and so I, you know, there's been a lot of reports put out there. Uh, the International Refugee Assistance Program, IRAP, has really comprehensive re uh, reports on how to fix this IV system for sure. Um, but I think overall, we just need to agree that this system does not allow us to bring people to the United States who we want here. Um, and, and it's a mi much bigger question, I guess. Ge gentlemen's to... time's expired. Uh, okay. Chair recognizes Ms. Wagner. Uh, I thank uh, the chairman, and, and I, I would like to, to um, point out to my good friends and colleagues on the other side of the aisle that the subject of this hearing is the fall of Kabul, examining the administration's emergency evacuation from Afghanistan. It's very specifically that. And I want to thank the chairman for organizing this long overdue hearing to examine the Biden administration's responsibility for the catastrophic fall of Afghanistan. In the 118th Congress, Democrats held a grand total of two hearings on this critical issue. 
leaving the American people, I think, confused and frustrated. I'm hopeful, I'm confident that under Chairman McCall's leadership, we will get to the bottom of this tragic debacle. I want to thank our witnesses for sharing their heart-wrenching experiences with us today. And I want to recognize their courageous service and sacrifice in Afghanistan. I'm deeply grateful, along with my colleagues, all Americans, for your heroism and your testimony. My eldest son, Raymond, an Army Ranger, served as a combat infantry officer in Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom. In fact, he attended the same St. Louis Catholic High School as Mr. Lucier uh, uh, did, uh, graduating just one year apart. I suspect you share the same fundamental motivation, Mr. Lucier, that brought you uh, both, my son and you, to Afghanistan from St. Louis, that Americans, and indeed all men and women, should be free of tyranny and able to live without fear. U.S. service members' achievements in fighting terrorism, protecting human rights, and advancing women's equality should be celebrated as an example of Americans, America's compassionate leadership and dedication to human dignity and to our own safety and security. The Biden administration's dishonorable flight from Afghanistan was a betrayal of our service members and the brave Afghans who lived, worked, and fought alongside them. It made America less safe, and it created a human tragedy of unthinkable proportions. The administration's need to take responsibility for its staggering failures. Secretary Blinken sat in front of this committee one of the just two hearings that we had, while American families mourned 13 sons and daughters tragically killed in the terrorist attack on Kabul airport. Others worried and prayed over the dozens and dozens of injured. The secretary had no answers for us. A St. Louis area family, the Schmitzes, buried their son that week. He was killed at H. Kaya. Abbey Gate at just 20 years old. American soldiers acquitted themselves with incredible valor in an unimaginably dangerous and chaotic and traumatic situation. Sergeant Vargas Andrews, Specialist Gunderson, uh, I want you to know that every member of this committee is honored to be with you today and listen to your story. Thank you. The American people deserve answers to understand why these tragedies unfolded. Service members and their families deserve answers. We have to hold the administration accountable. Lieutenant Colonel Mann, I am so grateful that you shared the story of uh, Hasina Safi, former Minister of Women's Affairs. Today is International Women's Day, and it is heartbreaking beyond words to think of thousands of brave, smart, capable Afghan women and girls barred from their schools and workplaces, confined to their homes, prevented from accessing basic necessities and even life-saving health care. Why did it fall to Task Force Pineapple to extract Minister Safi? Should this, the Department of State have made every diplomatic effort to bring her out of danger? Thank you, Congresswoman. We were very surprised when it, the, the bulk of our focus was on Afghan special operators and <clears throat> when we learned that Minister Safi was on the run, uh, it, it, came as a, it came as a real shock. What I do know is that Ambassador at Large uh, Kelly Curry, who had worked women's global affairs, was, was helping to guide her along with a range of other women leaders. And they had tried time and time again to include reaching directly out to Washington, D.C. I mean, understand that, that Hasina Safi was the Minister of Women's Affairs. She yes. was one of four I know female she... ministers in the entire country and arguably the most wanted and hunted woman in Afghanistan at that time. Her, her ministry actually became the Ministry of Virtue and Vice as the Taliban took over, ironically. And so she was on the run. She, no one from the State Department brought her in and so what she ended up doing was it was coordinated for her to move into what we call the, the, the Pineapple Express which was moving through the open sewage canal with her family and up to a point of recognition where this young man right here and a couple of other paratroopers uh, pulled her inside the wire 
Uh, and one thing I'll just say, I have to throw a shout out to the 82nd Airborne on this one. Um, she had a terrible fear of soldiers from when she was a child as a refugee. Uh, the, the Russian soldiers, the Soviets, had, had really abused her father. So when she learned that it wasn't the sewage canal that terrified her, it was going and having to, to, to be confronted with NATO soldiers. And she was terrified about it. And it was his first sergeant, Jesse Kennedy, who in the middle of the night reached down and grabbed her hand and pulled her out. And he said, my name is Jesse, you're safe now. And, and Hasina says that when she went into that canal, she had five brothers, but when she came out, she had six. And they're still in contact to this day. So I don't know fully why a, a, a sitting minister was not brought in by the State Department, but I do know that um, had it not been for the 82nd Airborne and the people at, right there at that hole in the fence, that she probably wouldn't have made it. I thank you all. My, I appreciate the chair's indulgence. I yield back. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Uh, one of the most difficult things to, for our intel community to do is to apprise will to fight. They can look at uh, the number of weapons and capacity and see who can fight, but the question is who will. And they've gotten it wrong a couple times in just last couple of years. Uh, they analyzed the Afghan army determined that they could fight successfully for at least, say, four months. And then they looked at Ukraine, and they thought the Ukrainian people might cave in in four days. Turned out to be wrong in both cases. That doesn't mean they're not the best in the world. It just means determining the will of a soldier to fight is very difficult. Um, one of the things that strikes me not only about this evacuation but uh, others is American citizens go to a war zone, and they say, I just want to go anywhere I want. My government's supposed to protect me. And uh, there are limits on what the U.S. government can do. So I put forward uh, the SAFE Act, and I'd like to have some more co-sponsors when I do it again this year, to say that if Americans go to a war zone, they would register. They're encouraged to now, but we would require them to register. We saw 15,000 American citizens in 2006 in, in Lebanon uh, with a lack of registration, and that was identified in the uh, GAO report as a significant problem in getting Americans out of Lebanon. Um, we have, we started this evacuation, and obviously we're focusing on Afghans who are our friends and eligible for immigration, but the absolute core of the American, American government's responsibilities to American citizens and green card holders. Um, uh, Mr. Lisser, um, uh, in October 2021, before this committee, the Deputy Secretary of Management uh, and Resources uh, for the State Department uh, said that the withdrawal would have been easier as to U.S. citizens, and that's the focus here, if those citizens had been required to register with the embassy. Uh, you have experience in dealing with the withdrawal of uh, American citizens. Do uh, you agree? Thank you for the question, sir. Uh, yes, this was one of the areas in which um, you know, my organization sought to assist and, and you know, um, make the evacuation go smoother. Um, we had an open intake form through which folks um, could either be referred to us or could self-register. Among those um, were uh, many American citizens, um, at least uh, about 88 uh, during the, uh, the two-week NEO period. Were, uh, if I can interrupt, were there people who hadn't registered two or three months before the withdrawal that then were seeking help uh, and we didn't know where they were, uh, situations where had people registered when they went into the war zone, it would have been more helpful. Yes, sir. That was one of the primary difficulties. That's what make groups like mine uh, necessary is that data submission that you're talking about that could have happened ahead of time. Hope, um, hope, hope to get uh, some uh, more co-sponsors on the SAFE Act. I've got another question for you. Uh, I don't know if it's come up here, but there has been criticism of the Biden administration for the fact that weapons that we provided the Afghan army are we did not recover on our way out. So these weapons were spread out over a very big country, or a fairly large country, Afghanistan. They were, by definition, in the hands of armed men. Um, Mr. Lucer, uh, uh, if we had wanted to go and reclaim these weapons and sent American military all over where those weapons were and demanded their return, um, could we have done that and gotten those weapons back without any American casualties? 
while I'm not a military logistics expert, that certainly would seem just common sense to have been an incredibly difficult task as we attempted to um, you know, uh, retrograde from that country, sir. Yes. Um, the fact is that it's uh, very difficult to leave a hostile uh, a, a, a situation and withdraw and do it in a pristine manner. We saw in Vietnam, and I know Mr. Hong's family saw in Vietnam, how difficult that is, and that was with a South Vietnamese military that was far more uh, impressive than the Afghan military. Um, we have, but just uh, around the world, uh, withdrawals are difficult, they're never pristine, they're never organized, they never go to plan. And finally, of course, the Trump administration uh, did not do any of the interviews to identify the SIVs, did not prepare for this withdrawal. America decided we didn't want a forever war, and uh, there's no pristine way to withdraw. I, I yield back. When he yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't plan on, on responding to the previous round of questions, but I just want to uh, con contrast perhaps what was just said. Uh, President Trump left office uh, in January. Uh, Mr. Uh, Colonel Mann, when, uh, when did you first know there was going to be a hasty withdrawal or withdrawal from, of, of Americans? I started to suspect that things were coming off the rails and that it was going to be a very, very chaotic uh, withdrawal around late April. And, and that was mainly because my friend Nizam was sending play-by-play -play signal texts on the, on the falling of each district. Okay, so uh, areas of, this, uh, of the conflict uh, began to change in, in April. Uh, when were you first notified by the State Department that your services would be needed to help evacuate uh, American citizens? I never received uh, direct notification from the State Department that our that our help would be needed. And to your knowledge, to your knowledge, were uh, uh, either you or uh, our American allies were they aware of anything before basically the. Uh, the embassy evacuated in the night without notice? No, Congressman. August 15th was when everything started for us. Okay. So in the eight months between the departure of President Trump and the hasty withdrawal in the night without telling our, uh, our allies, our NATO allies, there, there, if there was planning, it certainly didn't come to those who then took it on themselves to help get American citizens out, right? I think that's correct, Congressman. Okay, I want to go over some numbers very quickly. Uh, were, uh, to your knowledge, you and, and the other partners that were helping uh, uh, get Americans out, you, you totaled numbers, by names and numbers of people. Uh, was that a handful of people that you, uh, you totaled up uh, were left behind as of August 15th? It was a much larger, I mean, what well, I would think of a handful well, was much it larger. Was 50 or 100? It was in the it was in the hundreds, probably pushing closer to a thousand. Not in pineapple, but in the various groups as so, we talked to each other. Okay, so uh, various groups who reported as you did to the State Department and coordinated with them would give numbers. That number was greater than a hundred or two hundred, greater than three or four hundred, uh, actually greater than five hundred or more by name of American citizens, right? Memory's a little foggy, but I would feel comfortable saying greater than 500. So how is it the State Department and the president's spokesperson were talking about numbers that were always less than, you know, a handful and then later less than 100? Uh, did you give your numbers and did the other organizations give their numbers to the State Department and thus to the administration? I can only speak for, well, I know for Pineapple, we were consistently submitting names and information on American citizens and green card holders that we were helping. Okay, and uh, the only way somebody got out uh, essentially was after the fall was names were given, the State Department then passed that on to the uh, Qatar government, and they allowed them to be manifested onto those planes coming in from Doha Airlines, right? Qatar well, Airways. Well, the first challenge during the, the period of the NEO was to actually get them inside the perimeter. For us, that was an even bigger challenge than getting them on an airplane was getting them inside the wire. Did, uh, did you ever uh, get, or you or your people ever get to uh, the fence with blue passports in hand and be turned away? Yes. So American citizens got to the fence, there's American or NATO person on the other side, 
and they were unable to get through the fence. Why was that? Just to be clear, the, 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 the American citizen that we were helping uh, was told to go to a specific gate by the State Department. When he got to that gate, thinking he was going to load a bus with his family, it was actually a Taliban checkpoint, and they were beaten. And so Taliban turned him away. Correct. They're, they're, yes. Okay. The, uh, one, you know, one of the challenges that I, that I keep asking, and I'm, for any of the one on the panel is, did any of you get or participate in any part of planning of this, what Mr. Sherman called a cha always chaotic withdrawal? Did any of you participate in April in any planning for withdrawal of Americans? Did any of you participate in May? Did any of you participate in June? Just raise your hand if you, part you participated in June in planning for the withdrawal. We didn't participate in the planning, Congressman, but starting in April, we started calling for the inclusion of Afghan allies in the withdrawal of troops. And we had a sustained advocacy strategy that crescendoed over time and culminated on August 15th when we had to pivot to the civilian led evacuation. Right, but uh, I'm talking about the actual plan for the embassy no. personnel to leave, the uh, base to be no. closed. So at, at any time before August 15, did any of you have any contact with American leaders, uh, DOD or state or other agencies that gave you an alert and the ability to, be part, to plan the withdrawal of American citizens? So it's fair to say that the administration's chaotic withdrawal certainly included the fact that they didn't, the, the very people who got Americans out after August 15th, none of you were informed or given any opportunity to prepare prior to August 15th. Is that correct? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I know there's a lot of other things we're going to delve into, but I, I think the one fact that I would hope that we get to from the administration is if they were planning between January when they said that they were given this requirement to get out and August when they left, if they were planning, I would like us to have the record of who they were planning with so we would know why uh, our, our NATO allies were found themselves without transportation in addition to those Americans. With that, I yield back. Yeah, duly noted. Uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member, and thank all of you for being so brave for what you did before and what you're doing today to tell your story. And you deserve uh, our attention, and we want to hear from you. There's been a lot of pontificating up here with no questions, but you are the ones who really can uh, advise us and inform us. I'd like to pick up on the last question about the communication between the administration and any of you all. Communication is a two-way street, and I know you have influence. You were in a previous administration. Mr. Mann, we've heard about all the connections you have. Did any of you, the two of you, I'd ask first, reach out to the administration and express concern that, like the uh, Inspector General's report, that this agreement that we were going to pull out was really abandoning Afghanistan or that the Taliban would take over? You're in the field. Did you express that concern to them as part of the intelligence that they gathered, Mr. Mann? Uh, Congresswoman, I did not explicitly engage the Biden administration or any of the governmental organizations. And the, and the reason, I, if, if I could offer it, was leading up until August 15th, I really didn't intend to get involved with this. Well, how about the Trump administration when the agreement was first made that set all this in motion? What I will say is that I was very vocal publicly about both administrations and how they were handling the withdrawal and that it was going the wrong direction. But that was the extent of my involvement with that. Mr. Hong? Uh, Congresswoman, prior to August 15th, 2021, I had retired to private life and was not involved with policy matters at this level anymore. Okay. And it was only because of the urgent need that myself and many of the volunteers you see seated behind me saw that we jumped back into the fray. All right, well, thank you. Sometimes hindsight's twenty twenty, and if we'd gotten involved earlier, we might not be able to uh, have so much to criticize later. Uh, you know, you talk about abandoning the Afghans. Uh, I don't want to abandon them again. So I'd, I'd like to ask you, every one of you, how you feel about the Afghan special immigrant visas. We heard from Mr. Cicilline how it took longer. There was a backlog. A lot of them had been cut out. We know that members of this committee, including 
16 Republicans voted against speeding up the Afghan special visas. Would that not be helpful now to maybe right some of the wrongs that uh, occurred back August? Just go down the road and tell me if you do support uh, extending those visas. Yes, I think the SIV program is a very important program to help our Afghan allies. Um, I think that there is a tremendous need to enable the executive branch to increase both the throughput and capacity to process those visas and transport the people who have been granted a visa or approval for a visa out of Afghanistan post haste. Okay, I know the immigration problem is bigger than this, but let's focus on this. I mean, we could be talking about temporary protected status or other things, but just this particular program. Do you, do you I, I would agree. That? I would agree with um, extending SIVs continued. Um, as long as individuals are properly vetted and not bringing more threats into America. Okay, so you feel comfortable with those people getting to come and be here and be by our side and a pathway to citizenship or whatever? As long as they're properly vetted, yes. Okay, thank you. I mean, yes, I support expanding the SAV system. It needs to be fixed. There's a lot of different fixes that we can get into in more detail at some other time. Um, I would also say that SAVs are a very small slice of the Afghans who are left behind. Only a very small number of those would qualify for SAV visas as it's currently written. Well, do we need to reform that process and expand that uh, visa so that more people would qualify for it? Reform, expand, expand the, cat expand the definitions of who include, is included in a family member uh, would be a start. And we can do that while still uh, answering the question for a uh, gentleman next to you about keeping people safe and secure. There is no more highly vetted individuals in this country than anybody who goes through our immigration system. The multiple checks at every layer for every kind of immigration status is insane. And what most Americans don't realize, and I, the SIVs are even more doubly vetted because they had to be requalified to work with our military every six months. Exactly, so why would somebody vote against it? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, the SIV program is where I spend the majority of my time, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Very briefly, on your previous question of uh, worrying about the Afghan allies left behind, um, you might not remember this, Congressman Crow, but actually about three years ago, I, I was in your office with Common Defense, and we were um, asking about you know, the End the Forever War campaign. And at the end of that, uh, myself and another veteran spoke to you, and you said um, you were hesitant to sign on to the campaign because from your experience in Iraq, Kurds had been left behind, and you were worried about the exact same thing uh, happening to our Afghan allies. Um, it's a moment that stayed with me powerfully for a, a very long Will time. Will you answer my happened. question? We'll yes, let Mr. Crow come. Yes, yes ma'am. I'm sorry, real quick. So just like um, uh, Camille said, um, every six months they were uh, underwent incredibly vigorous background checks, which included polygraphs and counterintelligence screening. During the security screening process itself, they go through 17 different um, uh, intelligence agencies kind of database checks. Um, it takes four to seven years to get an SIV. To, um, I'm in support of yeah, extending the program, but more so um, this, this backlog issue. There are both administrative and congressional fixes that could make this problem incredibly uh, faster. And also, like she said, um, it also could be expanded or using other pathways to bring other at-risk people who currently are not um, included in the, uh, the statutory requirements who don't meet yeah. SIV, but who are incredibly at risk, who are also equally vetted, um, and who are facing you know, a dire, dire circumstance in Afghanistan right now. So absolutely, ma'am. Perhaps that's where we should direct our energy is improving that system so we don't abandon more people. The gentleman's time's expired. The chairman recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would say part of what, for myself, sharing my own personal story allows me to cope with the loss of friends and things like that each day is being haunted by the questions of what if we took a different road? What if we were a foot to the left, a foot to the right? Constantly thinking about what if we would have done that thing, caring about it. The fact that, that I still care about it and still think about those people that I visit in Arlington, that helps me personally to cope with loss. And to answer Ranking Member Meek's question about should we have withdrawn from Afghanistan or not, whether somebody believes we should or should not have withdrawn, it is evident to everybody that it should not have been done in the manner in which it was done. But this administration is perfectly comfortable not being haunted by the losses that took place. I don't know how they live with that, because I wouldn't be able to. I want to ask 
some questions of you, Sergeant. You essentially lived in a tower with your team, your rifle, your ammo, a camera for 10 days? That is correct. Over those 10 days, those 10 nights, you were in there day and night? Yes, we were. In those 10 days and nights, did you witness the Taliban not letting people through their own checkpoint to get to, to your checkpoint? Multiple times. Did you witness the Taliban beating people? Yes, we did. Did you witness the Taliban executing people? Yes. Was this recorded? It, it, we had footage of it, yes. For those last 10 days, essentially, of the withdrawal, you were, you were literally the front line. You were the front line of the withdrawal. It nearly took your life. So since that day and in the 558 days in a wake-up, since that time, have you ever been interviewed by any part of the United States government about what you witnessed on the front line? Not by a single individual organization. So the Pentagon has never come to you and say, hey, you were in front, you were with your team, you were looking through the scope on your rifle. What did you see from those thousands of individuals out front? Never. The Marine Corps never asked you when you woke up in Walter Reed, hey, Sergeant, can you tell us from your perspective what took place? No, they did not. The State Department, Secretary Blinken, others, they never came to your room in Walter Reed and said, hey, can you tell us what did you see about the, the SIVs or others that were trying to get through to be processed? No, they did not. They never came and asked you, hey, is it true that people in the State Department were essentially knocking off at 6 p.m. or not processing individuals at nighttime when you were still having to sit in a tower at all hours? No, they did not. Battalion commander, company commander, did they ever come and ask you for your story? A company commander in a personal capacity, yes, but not through the chain of command or on behalf of the Marine Corps. CIA, FBI, anybody else, they never came to ask you, hey, can you tell us when you were looking through the scope on your rifle, what made you think that you identified the bomber? No. The intel folks that said, hey, this is what you're looking for on this day, we, we think it might be an individual that appears like this and traveling in this way and, and undertaking these actions, the intel folks didn't come and ask you afterwards, hey, what did you see through your rifle scope? No, they did not. Are you aware that at some point, some folks in the Pentagon made this statement that all the people near the blast were concussed or unreliable? I am aware of that statement, yes. How does that make you feel that you have not been asked as somebody that was on the front line of this that apparently they don't care to hear what you saw and what you witnessed. It makes, it makes me feel like my service is not valued to this country by the government. Thank you, Sarge. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Wild. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me just start by saying, um, Sergeant um, Vargas Andrews, that your service is very much valued um, by many of us in the U.S. government. I just want to be on record as saying that um, Afghanistan has to serve as a lesson about forever wars um, that the U.S. gets involved in. And I say that um, as the daughter of a proud Air Force career officer who served in two wars. Um, and I have a huge respect for the military, having grown up in, in that environment my entire childhood. And um, so, but I do think we also have to be very cautious about forever wars, and we have seen that for sure. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this hearing. In August of 2021, I made it very clear that I did not think this evacuation was executed in a way that reflected the extraordinary sacrifices of our U.S. service members and our Afghan allies. 
Um, as a Democrat, I was critical of the ex um, execution of this withdrawal. Having said that, let me just be perfectly clear that I long ago thought it was time for us to get out of Afghanistan, and I'm not changing that. It's just the manner in which this withdrawal occurred. Um, I continue, though, to have very deep concerns about the number of Afghan allies that were left behind and whose families now face unspeakable dangers from a Taliban reg regime that is once again persecuting women and girls and shows absolutely no respect for human life. But at the same time, here's what I am not willing to do. I'm not willing to ignore the two decades of intelligence failures that led our country to sacrifice the lives of so many of our brave service members um, and to spend hundreds of billions over two decades propping up an Afghan government that was utterly incapable of defending itself. And I'm not willing to ignore the fact that the previous administration did in fact negotiate the underlying agreement for withdrawal with the Taliban. This was not the failure of a single administration. Um, it was the failure of multiple administrations over of both parties over two decades. And unfortunately, our service members who put their lives on the line and those who lost their lives and lost parts of their bodies, um, our Afghan allies and the American people deserve real answers on why we found ourselves in a 20-year war that was impossible to win. And I just want to close with my remarks by saying, uh, I started by saying that this should be a, a lesson in forever wars. Um, I haven't heard it yet today, but I categorically reject any comparison of the Afghanistan war to what's currently going on in Ukraine and the United States support of Ukraine. And I just want to make that perfectly clear. With that, I'd like to move uh, to Mr. Lucier please. Um, sir, your testimony was, was very helpful, especially in terms of understand the SIV process. Um, and in the interest of time, brevity, I'm going to just ask you, you write in your testimony about the impact of the previous administration's travel ban and so-called extreme vetting policy against Muslim-majority countries. Can you help us understand what the impact of those practices was um, on the SIV program? during that time, and what kind of fixes could be made? Absolutely, and thank you, ma'am. Um, so when we look at the, the SIV process, uh, prior to the fall of Kabul, we were looking at you know, an average of four to seven years uh, for, um, from uh, submission of a comm approval application to ins issuance and ultimately travel, usually assisted by uh, IOM, which I, uh, SIVs qualify for. So how do we get to those four to seven years, um, which is much longer than the 700 days earlier quoted, which constitutes the State Department processing time. Um, so during the previous administration, one of the ways in which we saw this number particularly grow, um, you know, comma adjudication and that approval process does take a very long time. Uh, but in the previous administration, what we really saw was a wait for folks who had submitted their DS-260 visa applications uh, and were waiting for interviews or after their interviews, um, uh, a long time waiting for visas. So long, in fact, that uh, SIVs are unique among all IV applicants and that they will wait to do their medical panel screenings until um, they've been notified that they've passed security vetting because medical panels expire after six months. Uh, every other IV applicant is, can regularly be assured that that, that visa will issue after an interview uh, before that six-month expiry. But for SIVs, it could take um, much, much longer. So with extreme vetting, uh, DS-5550s uh, and other additional types of security measures that were put in place, for example, the FBI bulk data collection uh, that looks at social media and things, what we saw was that folks after their interviews um, saw incredibly increased wait times because um, this incredibly already vetted population that already faced very strict scrutiny with regards to security concerns, these extra burdensome, incredibly inadministratively efficient, inefficient processes um, really, really lengthened that time out for, for SIVs after they had already interviewed. So they think that they're almost through the process and then they can wait sometimes years in an administrative processing black hole in a re refused status and in uh, INA 212G refused status for a very, very long time. So that period was um, saw a, a jump in the uh, length of time it took for an SIV to become issued and make their way to the U.S. safely, um, and uh, uh, as well as a, a dramatically reduced number of uh, SIVs actually ultimately end up being issued, uh, both because interviews were sometimes not unable to happen, but even those who uh, were interviewed subjected to these extra requirements uh, could uh, get highlighted in ways that there's lots and lots of stuff, but there's that that 
that extreme vetting and those that extra layer of security vetting that, um, again, this population was already incredibly vetted, uh, really lengthened that time out and prevented many, many more people from coming before. Just to ask Thank you, sir. Me. My time is up, but I appreciate your answer. Thank you so much. Chair recognizes Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate all the witnesses and the incredible sacrifice y'all made. In the first two weeks of the Afghanistan evacuation, staff in my district office were co contacted by nearly 30 Afghan citizens. Of those 30, we were able to get 15 out. A year and a half later, five others are still waiting on special immigration visas in Afghanistan. We don't know what happened to the others. Young lady in my office, uh, Madison Heinshen, uh, worked around the clock on that. I say around the clock. Um, with the State Department checking out at 6 o'clock, um, a lot of the calls were remained unanswered. And on August 26, as you know, a suicide bomber attacked innocent civilians near the Hamid Kar Kar Karzai International Airport in Kabul. 182 people were killed, including 13 U.S. Ser service members. One of those service members was my constituent. Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Kanas, that's his picture right there. I know Ryan's mama and daddy and um, stepmama and his family, and they're just wonderful people. Um, they, we live in the same community there in Knoxville, and they're dear friends of mine. And Staff Sergeant Kanas was transported to hospital where he was pronounced dead. He is listed as the last casualty of war in Afghanistan wow. and was laid to rest in Arlington National Cemetery. I attended that funeral. Uh, Mr. Gunderson, you were you're one of the first individuals on the scene to provide medical assistance. And of course, there's a chance that you did so for Staff Sergeant Kanas. I know I speak for me and the rest of the good folks in East Tennessee and his family, and we thank you for that, brother. Um, Sergeant, it wasn't in my notes, but your testimony was very compelling to me. And um, I'm not sure the, the proper way to do this, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I'd like to make an official inquiry into how his requests were denied from the State Department to the U.S. military, and I'm sure I'm stepping on some toes, which is purely intentional, and I'd like to, maybe we can get to the bottom no, that. will that. be the part of our investigation for sure. I would love that, yeah. and I'd appreciate that. I want to make that in the form of an official inquiry um, due to Mr. Mass um, questioning that brought a lot of things to mind. Um, but let me switch gears again. Colonel Mann, what is at stake for Afghans who worked with the U.S. if they're unable to get out of Afghanistan? Congressman, I wish you had time to ask every one of these people sitting behind me because they're, they're leading groups right now that are still on the phone talking to Afghan commandos, Afghan special forces, Kas Kateha, special mission units. Uh, the National Mine Reduction Group, who went in front of IEDs as we went on missions, these people are being hunted down systematically, methodically by the Taliban. Uh, most of their homes of records have been compromised. Their records have been compromised. They've been ratted out in large degrees. Uh, they can't get a job because if they go and get a job and present any type of credentials, they're, they're immediately identified as a member of the Afghan special operations community. And, and we have seen scores of these individuals who have disappeared, uh, who have been detained, who have been tortured, and who have, have indeed been executed. And, and many times these veterans behind me uh, who have seen a lot of combat and a lot of trauma, they're getting these pictures as they're sitting at the breakfast table with their kids and trying to find some way to help the family out. So I, what I would say is that the, at the Afghan special operations community in particular, and even higher than that, the National Mine Reduction Group, the small group of uh, Afghans who stood between special operators and IEDs, are at extremely high risk right now of being hunted and killed as time goes on. Thank you. Um, Sergeant. Vargas, uh, can you explain to me a little bit about the mental toll that the withdrawals had on our veterans? Yes, I can. Um, <clears throat> as, as another member stated um, earlier, and as um, Lieutenant Colonel stated, the, the moral injury is, uh, moral and mental injury is, is, I mean, it's, I don't think you can quite um, measure that. You can't see those wounds, can you? No, you can't. You know, my father served in the Pacific Second World War, and he got out without a scratch, and he, I think he suffered from what people call survivor's guilt because he was in the worst of it. His colonel was Chesty Puller, as a matter of fact, so you know where he was. I definitely um, <clears throat> thank you for your father's service. Um, I know for myself, um, for guys on my team and friends of mine who are out there uh, serving, it's, it's, I mean, 
throughout any war that you know veterans have been a part of. Um, it's hard enough being a service member in the military, um, whether you go to war or not. Um, that that mental toll is significant, but going overseas, going to war, seeing the things that we have personally, seeing the things that I have, um, you know, everyone handles things differently. And uh, I think the approach on mental health that some of these individuals are trying to take is extremely important. Um, I know for myself, the reason that I am here today and continue to have from the day that I woke up and Walter Reed and have continued to be vocal about the things that my men and women have experienced to serve next to me is because I have the ability to speak about those things that I've experienced, so it's my responsibility, as long as everyone else involved in here in this committee, to continue to advocate and vouch for those individuals involved. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate everybody who served our country. I'm growing up in a family that was very partial to veterans. They were always my heroes, and I got four or five on this committee that are my personal heroes, and I'll add you all to that list. So thank you, brother, for serving our great country. Thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair recognizes Mr. Allred. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your service, uh, for your testimony, both written and verbal. Uh, it's been incredibly moving for all of us, and I think it's important for us to hear that. The bravery and efficiency of our armed forces allowed us to even in the darkest times, rescue 124,000 Afghans and Americans who were saved from a very dark fate under Taliban rule. And we owe y'all an incredible debt of gratitude for your service. Those lives include Mohammed Afsal Afzali and his family, who ultimately settled in my district, and who I had the privilege of meeting and helping them uh, get out Mr. Afzali used a letter that I wrote in support of his application to get out. He was one of those people with identification papers at, at the airport. His kids are the sweetest little kids. And he didn't just rescue his kids. He took out four other kids that belonged to other families that he delivered here to the United States. And your bravery, your professionalism, save those people's lives. They're real people, I know them, and I thank you. It's true that those were dark days, but I also felt that watching our servicemen and women care for babies and families, to me represented the very best of America. The professionalism, the empathy, the humanity that y'all showed I think set an example for the world. It's also true that you should not have been in that position. The fact that American troops found themselves dependent on the Taliban for perimeter security and assistance is, is a disgrace. But we have to come back to the question of how we got to that point. And that answer is not one, honestly, that just begins with the final chaotic days of the withdrawal but dates back to the decision to withdraw under the previous administration, a decision that I questioned when Secretary Pompeo was sitting in your seats in this committee four years ago this month. I asked why we had abandoned previous U.S. policy regarding negotiations directly with the Taliban, undercutting the Afghan government, why we were not insisting that they agree to respect the Afghan constitution, and its provisions protecting women and minorities. And Secretary Pompeo uh, dismissed me on the record in this committee. And it's also true that ending our presence in Afghanistan was and is in our national interest. And we should all note that 2022 was the first year in this century that no American service member lost their lives in Afghanistan. Any fair analysis of the events of this withdrawal have to include all of the context. And not recognizing that reality is disingenuous and taints with partisanship, something that should be bipartisan. Bring American troops home, acknowledging their sacrifices and making sure that we serve our allies. To me, the question now is what do we do with the lessons that were learned and how do we support the 100,000 Afghans like the Afzalis who are here now? 
So Ms. Mackler, I, I want to thank you in your testimony uh, for raising the Afghan Adjustment Act. I agree with you and the sentiments from others on the panel that we should support uh, the Afghan nationals who put themselves in harm's way by supporting our mission and who are here in the United States now. So if you could, in the minute that I have left, uh, discuss why you believe the Afghan Adjustment Act is important and what it would do. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Briefly, when those 75,000 or so Afghans landed on American soil after the NEO, they had no pathways under immigration law to be admitted into the United States, and so they were here on a temporary permission called parole, which will expire for the most part in August of this year. They have no ways of staying here for the future without the Afghan Adjustment Act. They have no way of setting down roots. They have no way of simply having immigration legal status. Um, and on all that that confers of maybe even one day becoming US citizens. And so I think first and foremost to give that permanency and the sense of welcome home that we are hoping to offer these Afghan allies, we have to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act. The Afghan Adjustment Act also includes fixes for um, the SIV system in part. Um, it allows for Afghans um, beyond those who are evacuated in, in that first wave to settle here. Um, and as I've mentioned over and over again in this hearing, we don't have immigration path. We just do not have immigration pathways that are available to Afghans. I get asked every single day for somebody's help for an immigration option, and they do not exist. The Afghan Adjustment Act would at least serve this population to allow them to be here and to live in America safely, freely, um, and and with all that that comes with that. Thank you. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Green. Thank you, Chairman, for your persistent leadership on this issue, and thanks to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, thank you for your service to our country. Rangers lead the way. Night Stalkers don't quit. Many of you may recall from the movie Lone Survivor, the Night Stalker helicopter that crashed attempting to rescue stranded Navy SEALs. All on board perished, including my friend Stephen Reich and another man I know well from the unit, Master Sergeant Trey Ponder. Trey's parents are my constituents, and I often see them at events in the district. Before I begin my comments, I want to say a word to my fellow Afghanistan veterans. Our service and our sacrifices were not in vain. We kept our nation safe from a terrorist attack for 20 years. No one who served and, like myself, lost friends should ever feel it was for nothing. We protected America. You protected America for 20 years. When I signed into the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, one of the first guys to greet me was a guy named Corey. Corey was, was recovering from wounds he had sustained on Roberts Ridge. The Navy SEAL, Neil Roberts, had fallen from one of our aircraft, which was unable to rescue him. Uh, and so we live by the code. Leave no man, leave no woman behind. So two Chinook helicopters were dispatched with a massive quick reaction force. As they landed to attempt, they landed to attempt to rescue Roberts, both were shot down. And 40 or so Rangers, SEALs, and Special Operations aviators were stranded on that hilltop, surrounded by 250 Taliban. The intense battle that lasted almost 24 hours, seven Americans gave their lives because they lived by the oath, leave no man behind. The Ranger Code, which I learned back in the day, has a line or two that, are, that is relevant for today. Every Ranger graduate, every member of the Ranger Regiment knows this creed. Those lines, and I quote, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. Under no circumstance will I ever embarrass my country. Senior general officers at the Pentagon have told me they insisted that the evacuation occur from Bagram Air Base. Those leaders, you know, we can debate about whether or not we should have, could have, would have, whether Biden should have stopped, not withdrawn at all, but they decided to withdraw, and senior general officers told me that the evacuation, told him the evacuation should have occurred from Bagram Air Base. Those leaders told the president, we need 3,500 soldiers to guard the base for the exfil. According to those generals, in a room at the White House, the president himself said, no, go to 600 troops. With 600, you can't hold Bagram, so the decision to exfil from Kabul became necessary. That decision killed 13 American warriors and left hundreds of American citizens behind enemy lines, many of whom fell into the hands of the enemy. And more, that decision made by Joe Biden to leave Americans behind 
was an embarrassment to this nation. And it most certainly crystallized Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. And I'll debate that with anyone who cares to take me on. Now, in the few minutes that I have, uh, Colonel Mann, do you think that the Xville would have been safer from Bagram Air Base had we surrounded that with 3,500 troops? Thank you. I do, Congressman. Thank you. I'm going to ask a sensitive question now. I have an answer that is tragic for myself, but I'm going to ask a question of all of the veterans here. Do you know anyone who soon after this disastrous withdrawal committed suicide because they felt like it was all for nothing? Yes, I see lots of heads nodding. Yes. I do, too. The blood of those men and women's hands are on the president, period. We live by the oath, leave no man behind. It would be great if the commander-in-chief did as well. Now, I want to say very quickly, reiterate what I said at the beginning. Take this to your friends. Take this to our brothers and sisters. It was not in vain. We kept America safe for 20 years. Those sacrifices saved Americans' lives from a terrorist attack back home. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. God bless you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Ms. Jacobs is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I, I want to thank all of our panelists for your service to our country, both uh, when if you served in the military, but also all the work that you did to help get people out of Afghanistan and, and get them to safety. And um, uh, Sergeant Vargas Andrews, I know you deployed from Pendleton. I represent the San Diego area, and I want to say a special thank you to you for your service and your sacrifice. Uh, you, you've made our country very proud. Um, we've talked a lot about the criticisms of how the evacuation happened, and I share many of them. Uh, in fact, I was one of the original members of the Honoring Our Promises working group that uh, my colleague, Mr. Crow, co-led on a bipartisan basis. And my office worked with many of your groups to help get hundreds of Afghans out of Afghanistan, and we're still working to help get folks through the SIV process. But I think a lot of the criticism that we've heard should actually be leveled at at this body, at this committee. Because it's our job to oversee the State Department. And over the years, we've systematically underfunded and underappreciated their work to the point where when we had to do this NEO, the State Department didn't have the capacity it needed to do the mission we were asking of it. And I would welcome working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to figure out how we boost State Department funding and capacity and oversight to make sure that the State Department has the capacity it needs in the future, not only for a scenario like this, but because we know that diplomacy helps prevent and minimize conflict, and we could prevent more situations like this. Now, Specialist Gunderson, you said in your testimony that you were born one year before uh, September 11th. I'm not quite as young as you, but I am the youngest person on this dais, and I was in middle school when September 11th happened. And we've talked a lot about the failure of oversight uh, and the abdication of responsibilities. And I want to talk about the abdication of responsibility of this body. Because Congress did not take a single vote on the war in Afghanistan since you were one years old and I was 11 years old. That's 21 years that Congress allowed this war to continue without ever doing our job in oversight to make sure that what we were doing was actually making sense. And our generation has been told over and over our entire lives that we're making gains, that we just needed a little more time, a little more resources, that we were turning a corner. Now, San Diego is one of the largest military communities in the country, and we are a large Afghan community, refugee community as well. So I take this very personally, because we lost more than 2,300 service members and tens of thousands of Afghans over the 20 years and countless more from the trauma they experienced there. And my colleague, Mr. Green, talked about that so eloquently. Watching our troops leave Afghanistan was a stark reminder of the costs of two decades of war. But it was also a stark reminder of how we got there. Of the many, many years where we had military leaders come in front of us and tell us we just need a little more resources, a little more time, we're turning a corner, where they were telling the public that we were winning when privately our military leaders knew that that was never going to be possible. 
And Mr. Lucier, you wrote about this so poignantly in an op-ed in the Washington Post in December of 2019. And Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter his op-ed into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, and I wanna read a, a few sentences from this. I quote, however, despite knowledge at the top that little progress was being made in Afghanistan, that victory was never likely, and that the entire enterprise seemed to be fatally mismanaged, this isn't the story that the government or the military told the public. And again, instead, time and time again, officials talked about how local forces were getting better, how it was impossible for the Taliban to win this fight, and the infamous soundbite that American forces always seemed to be turning a corner in Afghanistan. And my last quote from this, the inability of top officials to tell the truth made it harder for me to come home from war. Now, Mr. Lucier, following on the ranking member's question, do you think the outcome would have been different if we had stayed two, five, ten more years? And I know we talked about the mental health consequences of this retrograde on service members, and I feel that personally, I do. But can you speak to the mental health implications of fighting an unwinnable war and how you would have felt as a veteran if we kept sending young people to experience those horrif horrifying things while knowing that we couldn't win? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, it's a difficult question. I spoke out in favor of bringing that war to an end because of exactly my experiences. Um, it was difficult to continue to watch the news um, and uh, in a small byline somewhere, because Afghanistan was not, at the time, making a lot of headlines, but um, you would see a KIA notice uh, from somewhere over there, and then texting your friends, oh, oh do we know who it is yet, um, and is it someone I know? It was an odd way to experience uh, the war that I left in, you know, um, of May of 2012, for it to continue to visit uh, my life on the news as I was trying to, to move on and go to school. Um, I don't know what the right answer was to ending that war. What I do know is that that lack of oversight that you cited, that we didn't have public conversations for the last 20 years, um, that congressional hearings on foreign policy writ large, but specifically Afghanistan, uh, have statistically declined, um, and that we didn't have a robust public conversation about the war that I fought and that people were continuing to deploy to for the 10 years after I got home that had already been going on for 10 years, um, meant that we weren't as prepared to have a conversation about withdrawal. Uh, because there wasn't a robust record, because there hadn't been congressional oversight, public discussion. It was a war that at times felt um, forgotten, except for uh, you know folks like myself, uh, Gold Star families, and Afghans who made it here. And it's worth noting how many had had come here and how many are now here. Seventy thousand Afghan troops, uh, military. Uh, time yes, sir. Has expired. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Davidson. I thank the chairman. Um, a very heartfelt thanks for having this hearing. Frankly, it's a shame that we had to wait this far after the events in Afghanistan to have a hearing like this. And uh, while this committee is generally very collaborative and bipartisan, I think the, the delay in it should be noted. And part of the problem has been the lack of accountability for, frankly, senior leaders, whether in uniform or out of uniform. People that were deployed on the ground were held for all kinds of held accountable for all kinds of things, rules of engagement that often were incompatible with the missions that they were assigned to do, a lack of a clear mission. No one ever really defined what victory was for many years on the ground there, yet we kept sending people over. Each commander would define it a little differently. You don't have to have served in uniform to know that it's a bad plan to get the, get the military out first and then try to get the civilians out. Uh, the fact that it turned out the way that it did is probably better than you would think if you took the military out first and then got the civilians out. But I just wonder, um, Mr. Hong, if you could comment about the challenges you faced as, as a member of Congress, as the chairman highlighted in his open remarks, you know, I, I was dealing with, with, um, with people who were sending me copies of American blue passport holding citizens dozens of them in areas of the country, Mazari Sharif, for example, trying to get out, desperately trying to get out, manifests with hundreds of people on planes, working with the State Department, and finally, the people on the ground there would get a, a safe third country that give them clearance to leave. And rather than help, our own State Department 
contacted the safe third country and worked to cancel the clearance so that people stayed on the ground. Now, I still can't figure out a motive for that, but I know that it happened. So I can't imagine the people that were stuck on the ground, the people that risked their own lives to help us accomplish our disjointed mission there over years, and some of whom were lost after they had to disperse and wait and hide and be hunted down because our State Department gave control of our embassy and all of our known allies over to the Taliban, and it basically turned into a hunting list. They hunted them down in their homes, and I, I just can't imagine that, but I know a lot of you had a hand in this, but you know, Mr. Hong, if you could comment on what it was like and the kind of role that you and others played, because frankly, the idea that we needed civilian dollars to come in and do this is mind-blowing. I mean, this is clearly the mission of the United States of America, um, yet we were trying to bridge it from people who felt uh, a bond of loyalty and did. So thank you for doing that, but also just what were you confronting as you were dealing with that? Congressman, thank you. I appreciate the question. Uh, there's been a lot that has happened in the last year and a half that has shaken my faith in our government. Uh, there was a yawning gulf between our obligations to our allies and what our government was able to do in August of 2021. However, thousands of our citizens saw that yawning gulf and jumped in and helped. And they did it from their bedrooms, they emptied out their savings accounts, they took on challenges that they shouldn't have been in a position to have to take on. Uh, so my faith in America and Americans has never been stronger. Um, it was unreal at times to get requests, and I'm not the only person on this panel that has received these requests, from congressional offices, from executive level agencies, um, from high ranking officials asking for help evacuating their allies, me, us, private citizens, receiving requests from our own government to assist what is essentially a governmental function. So it was humbling, it was terrifying, uh, it was uh, at times uh, stupefying. Well, it's well said. Um, and, and, I, and I just got to say, look, we had a conversation here. Uh, Republicans, particularly Republican veterans, came back here to Washington, D.C. to basically plead with the administration to make this an event-based uh, exit, not a time-driven thing, but an event-driven thing. When do we get all of our people out? Well, okay, that's the last day there, and not until then. Instead, the administration stayed on a timeline of 31 August, and inconceivably to me, we had colleagues who wanted to deny that the missions that you guys were part of in the private sector, trying to save people in other parts of the country, were even happening. And but for the records that we preserved and were on State Department computers, I truly believe they would have continued to try to deny and lie and say that they weren't even there. Thankfully, we had the evidence, we had the proof, and your statement we still have faith in the American people is well-founded. And may God bless this country, the people who are still trapped in Afghanistan, and may we finally do the right thing. I yield. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Manning. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank each and every one of the witnesses for joining us today. I want to express my deep gratitude to those of you who served for your selfless service to our country, and to all of you for helping Americans and vulnerable Afghans to get to safety. As we all know, the war in Afghanistan lasted for over 20 years, over four administrations and over 10 Congresses. And the American people fought and paid for this war in so many ways. They deserve a full accounting as many mistakes were made along the way by many, many decision makers over many years. So I'd like to start with the February 2020 Trump-Doha agreement. Mr. Lucier, when I, when I read that agreement, I was shocked by how few conditions there were in that agreement. There were no protections for the women and girls in Afghanistan, for the Afghan people who had helped us uh, and worked side by side with our forces Frankly, there were hardly any requirements for the Taliban to meet. So in retrospect, what should have been done differently in negotiating or reaching that agreement? 
Uh, thank you for the question. Like, like you pointed out too, um, I think uh, you know robust safeguards and um, for uh, you know vulnerable populations um, would have been helpful and prevented some of the situations that we see today. But again, just to pivot back, that um, you know I think some of my feelings about the war, how it was conducted, and how it ended are, are reflected in that op-ed and something that I've spoken about. Um, but I just uh, want to pivot back again to the, the Team America has these 70,000 folks who are here and uh, you know, these questions about how the war should have ended, there, there are lots of interesting and difficult questions that we can all grapple with and that may, perhaps we should have grappled with at the time. But um, you know, I'm really focused on, there's a lot of folks who are relying on me, my team, and other folks um, here at this witness stand who, um, you know, those are, those are important conversations that we can have, but um, these folks who are, you know, facing life and death in dire circumstances are really relying on us to take actions moving forward. And so that's where I'm spending the majority of my, of my time and effort and research. And what I'm much more familiar with is how to get more SIVs here, how to protect um, maybe the, you know, women and girls who weren't protected by that 2020 agreement. But um, that's what I'm focused on in the stories that I hope to tell here today. Thank you for that. And, and I have to agree that one of the most wrenching tragedies of the Taliban's takeover has been the devastating impact on the women and girls of Afghanistan, women who, who had high-ranking positions, who had good productive jobs, who are no longer able to work, girls who were attending school, who loved learning, who were preparing for the future, who are no longer able to get any education. And several years ago, uh, before the withdrawal, we had a Zoom meeting with a group of these women, and we asked them if they were trying to get out. And surprisingly, they said no, that they wanted to stay and fight for the soul of their country. So, um, Ms. Mackler, I want to ask you, what, what is being done to help women and girls in Afghanistan, and what more can be done? I don't know. Um, I'm an immigration lawyer. As I said, they have no options. I think there's only pressure that can be put on the Taliban to uphold international standards of human rights and to treat them in a certain way. Just today, um, the New York Times had an article on how these women and girls are suffering even more right now under the cruel winter that Afghanistan is going through. Um, I think we have to continue to shine a light on, um, on, on, their, on the conditions that they are under and continue to exert pressure. I will say I have met some truly extraordinary women. I was very privileged in the early days of the evacuation to help one young woman um, barely 23 years old, um, who escaped hours before the fall of Kabul and had been running a nonprofit in Afghanistan to educate women, and she continues to do that from the United States. And she is not the only one who I know has come here and continues these efforts um, within other networks of women to continue the work that was happening, even if it's less visible now by, ne by necessity. Um, I also Many of them, um, including one of my own colleagues who was um, the commander of a female tactical platoon who worked with our cultural sensitivity teams um, in the US military and who works with me now working on Afghans who've been resettled in upstate New York. She and others like her have continued to tell me that their biggest wish, their biggest desire is to return, to be able to find a way one day to return so that they can keep fighting that fight. I wanna thank all of you for all the work you're doing. I wish we could hear more. My time has expired and I yield back. The gentlelady yields. The chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I too want to thank everyone for joining us today. I know this is painful and it's deeply personal. It's deeply personal to many of us. I have here pictures of one of my interpreters, uh, Spartacus, who was beheaded by the Taliban, a young man of 19 years old who only wished to one day come to America as he was literally saving my life. I have here a picture of Rahim, who we did manage to get out on the SIV program. I'm standing next to him building a well for his village, but you know what? What did the Taliban do when we successfully, since this was such an outstanding success, get these people out? They're hunting down his family. They've captured his cousin, tied him up behind a Taliban truck, drug him through the village, and killed him to say, don't you dare ever work for America or work with America or work with the West again. And they've also beaten his brothers nearly to death. So even when we're successful, they start ta uh, targeting and going after 
the families. Uh, Mr. Hong, Mr. Mann, you had to basically become your own State Department. You had to charter international flights. You had to arrange country clearances. You had to deal with international borders because the State Department failed. Is that an accurate statement? Do you disagree with that statement? I don't disagree with that, Congressman. Congressman, the State Department found itself in a very difficult situation with very little guidance, as far as we can tell, no advance planning for this exact scenario and unclear lines of authority. And so while many individuals at the State Department tried their best to help us, they found themselves hamstrung by the bureaucracy. No, thank you for that clarification, because this was a failure at leadership at the most senior levels of the State Department uh, and the White House. Mr. Mann, do you have members of Task Force Pineapple veterans who have exhausted their personal savings uh, trying to help these Afghans? I do. There's um, a friend of mine, Duke, who's in the Moral Compass Federation with us, says that um, so many of our veterans have uh, basically taken on an Uncle sam size problem with their pension funds. I'm do you know, I do, do you know members that have exhausted their children's 529 plans? Some of them are in this room right now. Do you know members that survived multiple deployments, their marriages, but now they're heading to, to divorce? Yes. Do you know members that uh, are thinking of or have committed suicide? You mentioned Brad. He was my friend, too. He was my operations officer. He's now dead because of this moral injury. How many, well, I don't even know if you can quantify it, but you mentioned an 81 percent increase. There's been a 40 percent increase uh, just in the last anniversary in text to the suicide hotline. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, is it fair to say these veterans feel betrayed by their own government? I do. Do you think that added to their moral injury to see the president of the United States calling this an outstanding success, I quote, I believe even more uh, hurtful is the non-mentioning of it in two State of the Union addresses. Thank you, because that's what I was about to ask you. Do you think the fact that he didn't even say the word Afghanistan hurt them even more? Didn't even say the word. I do. <sighs> Mr. Hong, actually, for, for everybody on the panel, is this war over? Does anybody think this war is over? Because we've had members of this committee, the Foreign Relations, the House Foreign Relations Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee, the United States government, United States House of Representatives, and the President of the United States, and the Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of State, celebrate the fact that the war is over. Did the Taliban, Al Qaeda, ISIS get the memo that we decided that the President decided the war was over? Is this war over? Do we still have people trapped behind enemy lines, over 80,000? I know the answer is yet and yes. In fact, today, this morning at 9:23 a.m., I received a desperate email from one of my interpreters who was formerly a school teacher, but decided to work for a better future for women and children in Afghanistan. He's now being hunted. He's been in hiding for two years. 9:23 a.m. this morning. Do you think he thinks this war is over? Is the, are the Taliban systematically hunting these people down? Anybody disagree with that, that this is top-down, top-driven? I'll just, I'll just end with this. Uh, Mr. Mann, you're absolutely right. What happens in Afghanistan does not and will not stay in Afghanistan. Members of this committee celebrated when, we, when President Obama pulled us out of Iraq in 2011 with no follow-on plan. ISIS caliphate comes roaring in three years later and we now have more members there, more military members back dealing with that than when uh, we left in 2011. They were wrong then, and they're wrong now. And Mr. Chairman, I'll just close with saying I have never been more proud of my fellow Americans and veterans as I am with this group, but I've also never been more disgusted with my own government. Uh, this was a callous, cold-hearted, incompetent episode on the part of the, this administration, and it is not worthy of the men and women that we all carry on these bracelets and their sacrifice. I yield. Mr. Waltz yields back. The chair now recognizes Ms. Sherfulis McCormick. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to first start off by saying thank you so much for your courage, your testimony, and your service. More importantly, our focus is to get this right. We are dedicated to ensuring that you're supported and the next time around that we hear your testimony, that we can actually move forward. And with that being said, I have a question for Mr. Lucia. Tell us about your experience helping American citizens to, evacu to evacuate. In particular, what were the challenges and what work worked well? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, yeah, happy to talk about that. So uh, at Team America, as I said earlier, um, you know, uh, either friends and family of American citizens who are in Afghanistan uh, or those who are there themselves uh, identified themselves to us. Um, and then our goal was to, you know, do kind of a pre-verification on that data, make sure that they actually were blue passport holders um, in whatever ways we could, and then uh, coordinate with uh, government entities on the ground at the time in order to try and arrange for their safe passage uh, to the airport and then offer some guidance and, and the best intelligence and information available at the time to help them make that trip safely from their homes and apartments in Kabul uh, to the gates um, and have that coordinated ahead of time so that they could swiftly move through. It was a difficult process when you have folks self-identifying because of the lack of identification ahead of time, where they're not required to register with the STEP program. Um, lots of information was coming in very quickly. That was one of the challenges. Uh, many folks self-identified as American citizens who weren't in fact not because they thought it would get them through the gates faster. So having to kind of adjudicate that for 220 volunteers who had no experience adjudicating uh, immigration paperwork was, was difficult and required um, a lot of oversight cooperation. Um, we had a, a relatively good amount of success and felt uh, pretty, it wasn't perfect, but uh, for the situation that was there, getting American citizens through the gate, my experience was that typically, um, if we found the right person uh, and were able to identify somebody and were able to kind of prove out that blue passport holder, um, usually heaven and earth would, would move. I think, like I said, we had 88 American citizens who identified who we were able to verify. At the end of the NEO process, only four were remaining, and all four had uh, self-selected to remain. They had been offered uh, multiple uh, times that you know U.S. Special Forces and other types of operators would go out into the city um, to get them. But because they had extended family members who they could not bring with them, we call it um, a refusal to separate from those extended family members, um, they chose to remain in Afghanistan. That was my experience, and that's uh, what occurred with Team America. I know that there are other stories, but that was mine. And really quickly, I'd like to talk about the story of, of one of those folks um, at Team America. We have people assigned case numbers, but we called her Afghan Betty White. She was a grandmother, um, and she was with her grandchildren and um, other folks and nieces. And one attempt was made, I believe, to actually get to her, and then two more times she was offered that assistance. But she chose to remain. Uh, the Taliban knocked at her door. Uh, she yelled back at them. Um, but Afghan Betty White also uh, had diabetes and she was unable to access um, her medication uh, while she was there. We knew that, we urged her to leave, but she did not um, want to leave her family. But the opportunity was available, but she, she chose to stay and it was a courageous act. Um, unfortunately, in December of, of 2021, uh, because she did not have that access, uh, um, she passed away. It was a tough moment and a tough day for Team America. We had all um, talked to her and so it was hard for us for somebody that we knew who was eligible to leave, um, but who chose not to and who made that courageous choice and ultimately in a way kind of gave her life for her family. Um, so the process with American citizens was incredibly difficult. Um, it was hard. Uh, we had to learn a little bit of on, on the fly, but generally the cooperation with uh, government on American citizens and with ACS, American Citizen Services at State, uh, for us at least, uh, maybe we were just lucky, was, was very good. Ms. Meckler, Beyond an immigration pathway into the United States, what do you see as other necessary lines of efforts in terms of diplomat diplomatic engagement, humanitarian or economic assistance, multilateral work with partner countries or areas to ensure we, ha we are helping vulnerable Afghanistans and defending the U.S. interests and values in respect to Afghanistan? I think the answer when we talk about immigration is always going to be that we should allow people who want to come to come and people who want to stay home to stay home. Um, I know that our Afghan partners have spoken a lot about not supporting sanctions or other ways that reduce the Afghan economy because they are really suffering right now um, economically. And so continuing to support them, continuing to fight, especially for women and girls, but for all Afghans, continuing to allow them to live um, with dignity and you know, without the starvation or the poverty or the disease that we're seeing right now are all 
um, efforts that we should be looking into and then supporting our allies. I mean, not everyone wants to live in the United States either um, and allowing them the choice of migration and not, the f not having it be by force. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentlelady yields. The chair now recognizes Mr. Keene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I would like to thank our witnesses for their service to our country and to actions during um, the withdrawal in August of 2021. Like so many of you, I cannot forget the images on TV showing Afghan civilians crowding around the gates of Hkaya in the aftermath of the Abbey Gate bombing, which claimed the lives of 13 American service members and 169 Afghan civilians. Despite the valiant efforts of our service members during the withdrawal and the two decades of American dedication and sacrifice in Afghanistan, the American people witnessed a terrible conclusion to this nation's longest war. Um, Mr. Uh, Gunderson, uh, I want to thank you for, for being here today. And um, during your testimony, you indicated that not a single person on your flight to Afghanistan was given the appropriate preparation for what would they would encounter in Kabul. Could you speak to uh, what were some of the impacts of this lack of preparation, what could have been done differently, and how did, the, did this compare to other deployments? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. I think the lack of preparation came from the fact of lack of not knowing what the ground situation was going to be. I know for myself, the entire you know twenty hour flight over to the you know other side of the world was long, and I thought nonstop about what we might see, and I never predicted what was going to be on the ground. Um, I think we were we didn't know what was going to be on the ground, and we just hoped for the best. Like luckily, there were you know, things of water and things of food that we were able to find. But if that those, without those things, like we asked every day, like what what are we going to do when we run out of water? We didn't <laughs> we didn't know there was no plan. Thankfully, we didn't run out of food or water. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send it back to you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Sergeant uh, Vargas Andrews, um, you described the scenes and sounds of the Taliban uh, shooting and brutalizing uh, Afghanis outside the, the wire of Ejkaya. How did you and the other uh, service members feel being put in a position of having to stand by and watch while the Taliban engaged in these acts? Um, <clears throat> myself and my, my team in the tower um, felt pretty useless, um, especially we, uh, the, the Army or some, someone uh, moved shipping containers about 150, 130 yards in between us and the Taliban and their checkpoint. So <clears throat> guys on the ground not, didn't always see what was going on, but um, I mean, we, it, we, we were just helpless. We felt helpless. You know, we, we passed over to Intel. We let, let people know what was going on. Um, <clears throat> but unable to do anything. Um, we've discussed, thank you. Uh, we've discussed today at length much of what went wrong during the withdrawal, and we've heard the witnesses share their stories about those chaotic and frightening days. Um, my question to, to, to the entire panel is, what are some of the biggest questions concerning the withdrawal that have yet to be answered and what do you think from your experience that we as lawmakers here in Congress need to be asking and who should be held accountable? If you start, you, sir. Uh, the biggest questions for me remaining from the withdrawal are what are gonna happen to the, I believe the number about of the folks who made their way to America, 72,000 of them are on parole. Uh, what's gonna happen to them? Um, right, like that question, uh, remains unanswered. And the second one is the care team that we've talked so much about that does so well, uh, their funding isn't secured right now. So the next administration could uh, could move away from that and we would lose all of the lessons learned and the robust public-private partnership that has developed. So um, those two questions remain very large over this community. And um, un until they're answered, our work will remain largely in this um, kind of nebulous, difficult period where we don't have certainty, whether it's for the Afghans for how they'll continue to live in America or you know what's gonna happen to this partnership. Okay, Carl. Congressman, when, I would just say one of the big questions on my mind is how do we help all of these veterans and other volunteer groups hang up the phone? They've been on the world's longest 911 call since this happened, 
and they, as we've talked about, they've, they've cashed in their pension funds and, and retirement accounts, and it is taking a massive toll, not just on their, on their fiscal capability, but on their mental health, and they're not going to quit. They are never going to quit doing this until we figure out how to responsibly relieve them of what they are doing to provide this humanitarian support, and we've got to figure it out. Okay. Thank you. Right. Gentleman Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you to each of our panelists for your bravery and dedication, service to our country, and in evacuating American citizens and our Afghan allies in incredibly dangerous circumstances. Your work and the work of thousands of combat veterans saved many, many lives, and this body owes you a huge debt of gratitude. But for tens of thousands of our Afghan allies who we brought to the United States, their arrival was also the start of a new, nearly two-year-long bureaucratic purgatory, one that has left them without permanent legal status. I want to draw this committee's attention to one particular vulnerable group. In the weeks before Kabul fell, my team and I helped to evacuate women who served in the Afghan National Army's female tactical platoon. These FTPs, as they're called, were combat soldiers who were recruited, rigorously vetted, and trained by elite U.S. strike forces. These courageous, amazing women risked their lives by going where male soldiers couldn't in a majority Muslim country, searching and questioning women and children in pursuit of Taliban targets. The platoon conducted 2,000 missions, including high-risk and highly classified missions alongside Green Berets, Navy SEALs, and Army Rangers. Their work to support the American mission and their gender makes them and their families a top target for the Taliban. Yet the women from this unit who are now here in the United States, only one has been granted asylum. They have been kept in legal limbo for well past the allotted 180-day deadline, some for nearly a year. These women have done their part, submitted their applications, gone through interviews. Now they are just waiting, waiting without information that they are owed. I am deeply frustrated by how uncertain their futures still are. They served side by side with our soldiers. These women put their lives and their family lives on the line to assist the United States. Is this how we repay our allies? In August, tens of thousands of evacuees, including FTPs, will have been here for nearly two years and will lose their parole status. It is a moral failing that despite broad and bipartisan support, Congress cannot come together to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act to fix this and give these FTPs and thousands of others certainty and stability. Ms. Mackler, in your testimony, you touched upon the importance of passing the Afghan Adjustment Act. You also mentioned the work your colleagues are doing with FTPs here in the United States. If Congress does not pass the Afghan Adjustment Act and does not provide legal residence pathways to FTPs and other evacuees, what could happen to your clients and evacuees like them? Thank you for the question, Congressman. One of the FTP commanders uh, works with me at IARC working on helping Afghans resettle in New York State um, and, and is one of the ones who is still in legal limbo. So first of all, just to be clear, the, the AAA, the Afghan Adjustment Act, would actually extend the SIV protections to FTPs. Um, so that's number one. If they don't, same for them as for any other Afghans who are here currently on parole status. If there is no extension of that parole and no other solutions come up, then they will be subject to deportation proceedings. Um, they will be here without status, meaning that they will be um, at risk of immigration enforcement. Um, many of them have applied for asylum. Not, I, I can't say for certainty if all of them have, but many of them have um, because of the vetting requirements. Um, many asylum applications are being held up long past the 180 days, we're seeing a lot of Afghans being interviewed. Not very many are actually getting adjudications of their asylum claims. So simply put, they'll be at risk of deportation. Deportation to where is a question. Um, but nonetheless, um, their lives here are not able to begin until yeah, this. That's an unacceptable 
answer, uh, solution uh, or situation for any of us. With that, I'll yield the remainder of my time to our leader on the Afghan Adjustment Act in our caucus, uh, Representative Crow. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Stanton. Uh, in, in a little bit of time that I have, I'll have some time to address uh, other issues here momentarily, but I just want to send a, a message to my fellow veterans uh, and to those who might be listening. Never confuse your individual service with policy decisions that are made in Washington, D.C. Uh, each of you stood up, you raised your right hand, you did your job, and it was right it was honorable. It remains right and honorable. Uh, and this country owes you a great debt of gratitude for that service. And you should be proud because I am proud of you. And so many people are proud of you. Policy decisions will be made here. Mistakes will happen. We will debate that. We will have those discussions. But do not confuse those with that right and honorable service that all of our fellow veterans share. Thank you, I yield back. Well stated, I yield back. Gentleman yields, uh, chair recognizes Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to all of you that are here today. Uh, I am devastated by the testimony and the stories that we're hearing. And I'll just tell you, from my perspective, the foreign policy, the national defense policy, and the homeland security policy of the U.S. must clearly be strong steady and strategic. Our policies and practices must adhere to these principles. Otherwise, our allies will not trust us, our foes will not fear us, and neither will respect us. Without such policies and practices and without the resulting trust and respect that comes with them, our country's practical ability to lead in this world collapses alongside its broken principles. America will no longer be able to claim the moral high ground and foreign allies will no longer be able to trust that we will stand with them in those critical times. Additionally, I'm convinced that it will incentivize our foes to become more aggressive and it will disincentivize anyone from partnering with us. Both are devastating to this nation and heightens the chance for additional military conflict and additional loss of both military and civilian life. Now, I want to turn to uh, Sergeant Vargas Andrews, and, and in your testimony, I want to give you an opportunity to address some of those things, because you ask us to give you the opportunity to elaborate on your ordeal post-blast. If you haven't had sufficient opportunity today to do that, I want to give you some more opportunity to elaborate on what you've been through since then. I appreciate that, Congressman. <clears throat> um, for myself, um, at this time, or at the time uh, leading up to the blast, uh, I was on behind behind our gun in the tower. Um, we had had another individual, um, Sergeant Andrew Valencia, observing as well. We were continuing to scan the crowd for any threats. And uh, about 17:30, Staff Sergeant Darren Hoover came and retrieved me from the tower to go uh, gather an interpreter and his family member from the canal. Um, the other half of our team was back staging gear um, in case we had to pull out um, quickly. And I walked out there to the canal with uh, Staff Sergeant Hoover and talking about the situation. Um, he was a combat uh, veteran and uh, prior to that and, you know, had explained how that was unlike anything that he had ever experienced in his time in Afghanistan uh, prior. We walked out to that canal and... Um, Pulled out an interpreter. He had a sign uh, with what we had suggested putting on it uh, to identify him. Um, pulled out his brother and uh, did, a, did a search on them for weapons um, and any threat. Moved to take them to the main search area uh, for processing. And, um, you know, he stated that he had family still in the canal. Um, he had a wife and four kids back there. And so we stayed down in the canal that day. Um, I told him, I assured him that, you know, I would, he had proper documentation, I had passports for them, and I assured him that we would pull out, do everything we could to pull out his family, the remainder of them, and so that I would stay down there for, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, um, and then ensure another individual was helping him while we waited for his family to appear. I stayed down in that canal, um, facing a, the far side of the canal against the canal wall, and uh, with Staff Sergeant Hoover, you know, within four or five feet of me, um, 
about 10 minutes went by and that's when uh, the suicide bomber detonated. Um, post that, um, <clears throat> I opened my eyes. Uh, finally, I knew right away what had happened and um, started crawling uh, due to the sound of gunfire uh, from the neighborhood and um, started crawling backwards. And you know, over the course of a few minutes, um, could not, um, <clears throat> I was overwhelmed by my injuries, and uh, but I was awake and aware. And our the other half of our team had just come back. Charles Schilling and the rest of the guys had gone up to the tower to to um, convene and make sure everyone was okay. He asked for bolt cutters that I had carried on my pack. Ran out there, um, you know, disregarded his own life, got to me, and him screaming my name and getting to me and throwing tourniquets on me as well as triaging me along with other Marines saved my life. Um, he cut open a hole in the fence um, at the base of that tower and cut down the casualty carrying distance um, probably by, you know, 120 yards at least. And to this day, has not been recognized for that. So I wanted to publicly recognize him for that. Um, <clears throat> him and the actions of my friends that day saved my life. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Back to you. I, I certainly appreciate that testimony. I know it's difficult for you. Mr. Hong, you were talking earlier about I think you used the phrase, thank you for hope when hope becomes forlorn. As I recall, that comes from that speech, duty, honor, country. And I want to ask you, uh, when you think of those three hallowed words, duty, honor, country, uh, do you think that our withdrawal in Afghanistan met with those principles in that moment? As I said earlier, I think that there's a lot that has happened that's shaken my faith in government. And uh, there's a lot to be desired about the way our government executed that withdrawal. However, as I stated earlier, the way our Americans, my fellow Americans, stepped in and did what needed to be done when they fall, saw our government falling short will forever inspire me. Thank you for that. And I'll just add, I think duty is what we do. Honor is how we do it, and country is why we do it. And in this instance, I do not believe we did our duty with the honor that you deserve, that the American people deserve, and the people of Afghanistan deserved. Thank you guys today. Gentleman Neal's back. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Meeks. Thank you to all of our witnesses today. It feels very inadequate to say, but thank you for your service to our country. And that includes so many in our audience, I know, and I don't know. This is painful, powerful testimony that is important for us to hear. So I'm glad you're here. I thank you for being willing to go through this uh, repeated pain. We owe a tr tremendous debt to all of you. We owe a tremendous debt to the more than 800,000 servicemen and women who served our country over the course of 20 years. More than 2,400 lost their lives, more than 20,000 wounded, and I'm not even beginning to touch those who will never be the same in, in spirit and, and following post-traumatic stress. We've lost so many, as you've cited, uh, to death by suicide. I come to this hearing awash with awe in all of you, sadness with the reality of this war and other wars, of course. But I also come to it with great humility, knowing that I can't get near what you do, what you've done, what you've sacrificed. I can't get near it. But I do think this is important to bring out the facts, the truth of the end of this war. As, you, as some have cited, it is not over. So I'll start with Sergeant Vargas Andrews. Thank you for your service, your sacrifice. I'm, it's inadequate to say I'm sorry. But man, oh man, we are proud of you. I wanted to follow up on two of the questions you wrote in your testimony that I had read and then you also mentioned it again. You said, ask me about one little girl that I reunited with her family. Would you tell us that story? I would, thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Um, you know, I think, I think what I can say is for a lot of, a lot of people out there, uh, the actions that they had specifically at Abbey Gate and around the airport, um, 
there were a lot of moments to them that were worth the mental strain um, to, the, to the service members. For myself, that first day at Abbey Gate, after we were working to push back the crowds, um, I was on the ground, and a little girl had squeezed her way through the crowd of about seven or eight years old, holding a four-month-old, I would estimate a four- or five-month-old baby in her arms and holding the hand of who I assumed to be her little brother, who was about four or five years old. And they were all dirty and bruised, I mean, tear-streaked faces. And uh, kind of in this, in this chaos, it was just like I had tunnel vision and saw her, and I was like, I need to help them. It was just a very odd sight to see. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I picked up the baby and the little boy, and she followed me, like motioned for her to follow me. Um, and to get, to get to a safe area away from the crowd, I noticed that the baby's face was blue and purple. And so I went to the nearest um, person that resembled a medic um, and asked, started asking if they had um, a small small breathing bag, a BVM, to uh, to conduct CPR because I, um, you know, I didn't know if the baby had already passed, but assumed it wasn't breathing, um, and uh, didn't want to, you know, injure the baby by trying to perform CPR on it myself. And the individual, um, I don't know who it was. Uh, you know, I sat there and watched them resuscitate, help resuscitate this baby, and face flushed pink, started crying, and then the little girl started asking for her dad, just crying and tugging on my uniform. Um, I took her back to the gate and could tell that she was asking for her father and uh, climbed up on the SUVs overlooking the razor wire and held her up and was just trying to ask her, you know, do you see your dad, like Abba, like trying to, you know, um, make her understand what I was saying, and she, she understood, and uh, we sat up there for a minute or two, and in this crowd of hundreds of people below us, um, she just pointed in the direction, um, you know, maybe 30, 40 people back, and there, there's this, all these hundreds of people holding up papers, documents, whatnot, and there's this one individual just holding a bunch of family's luggage with his hands on his head, um, just crying and looking at her, and I was like, that, that is her dad, and uh, I let the troops down right there at the opening of the gate, know to help get this guy through, pulled him through. And uh, the little girl hopped off the SUV and ran to him um, and hugged him and he hugged her, both cried, took them over, took and reunited them with um, the other two children. And he had paperwork for all of those families um, showing their pictures and whatnot. And so for me, that was a moment that my, my personal injury um, was worth it. And, uh, you know, I know those three little kids will have a life um, of freedom and opportunity now because of that. Thank you. You know, there's a, an expression in the Jewish tradition that I always lean on, even though I'm a person of Catholic faith, and it is to have saved a single life is to have saved the whole universe. Right. So many of you have done that. You're in the process of it. Help us make sure we live up to our obligation to the rain, remaining people whom we must save, rescue, get on with their lives, as we also try to help the women and girls. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I thank you. General I yields, uh, we have votes on the House floor right now, so the committee will stand in recess until 2.20 for votes. Uh, and um, I know it's been a long hearing, but if you could stay, uh, we'd greatly appreciate that. I think there's still eight more members uh, that have questions. So we stand in recess until 2.20.
The committee will come to order. Mr. James, if you're ready, I recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies, gentlemen, um, first, as a, as a brother in arms, I want to thank you for your service. I graduated from West Point in 2004. I became a Ranger qualified Apache pilot and flew 750 hours combat in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, we fought in different wars, um, but we, uh, we both, we all stood up for this nation. Uh, our service continues today. You answered the call initially because of something deep down in your soul that, that taught you, that told you that you had an obligation, not an option, to continue your service and give back, even to the point where you felt called, uh, putting yourself in grave danger um, to, uh, to answer those uh, in, in the world who also share what we believe all men created equal, all men and women uh, allowed to breathe free, and protecting American ideals are things that you did uh, putting your lives on the line to protect those. I want to personally thank you for your service. Um, you've said many times that there is a, a feeling that's palpable amongst the American people that we have betrayed our allies and we have betrayed um, those who stood up with us during our time of need and we abandoned them in theirs. We also got uh, some feedback on addressing the 72,000 who are already over here in uh, a probationary um, uh, status and also care teams not being funded. My first question is in the, the little recess that we've had, it's been a long day, I, I grant you that, uh, and I appreciate it, but are there any other things that we can do right now, uh, any gaps that we can address uh, in Congress um, to make sure that uh, if uh, that we can make amends for uh, for this for this retreat in some small way, uh, Congressman, I'd like to answer. There's been mentioned before of the Afghan Adjustment Act. Um, I am personally in favor of passing that act. I believe it's a, a bipartisan negotiated framework. Uh, it provides the adjustment of the status that the Afghans that are here that don't have currently a pathway to citizenship. It enlarges SIV eligibility and it reinserts Congress's prerogative in this area. And so uh, I think a number of folks that are sitting behind me also support it and we've advocated for that in the past. If I could just offer one thing, Congressman, on top of that, I believe <clears throat> I had spoken earlier about the NMRG, the National Mine Reduction Group. This group of individuals was actually not part of the Afghan Special Operations community, but were rather specially trained by Afghan SOF for force protection and mine clearing. Therefore, they're eligible right now for SIV. They're extremely organized, very coherent, and there are groups right now uh, that are in this room that are that are actively guiding them, and and I believe could be the, one of the first, you know, big wins in how we get the most at-risk Afghans, again, over here post-blast. And I think looking at, at the NMRG as a as a as our first um, look for s severely at-risk groups to get over here because they're already SIV eligible. If we could lean in with the private groups that are working that right now, I think we could see an immediate success. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the question, Congressman. That's really, uh, you know, I think the, the most important thing we can do is really focus on what we can do now. Um, there are so many things, uh, the things that fall within Congress's purview, just to kind of go down some of the things within the Afghan Adjustment Act, right? 72,000 people, many of whom are applying for asylum right now who, like that is not a system that's designed to handle it and it's already incredibly backlogged. Um, so by creating a separate pathway, um, it will f uh, allow all of those 72,000 to go through an additional vetting process, but also provide for their you know, continued employment status, all of the things that come with immigration status and prevent them from falling into, right? Um, not just being out of status and subject to deportation hearing, but uh, employment authorizations and all these other things. So just to double down on how important that is. Some of the other provisions that were within that um, act that failed to pass uh, in December and then March last year include uh, 
you know, expanding the SIV program for folks like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mann is talking about, both the, uh, the NMRG group, uh, the FTPs, um, certain Afghan special forces groups. So, like, we needed the Afghan Adjustment Act yesterday. We really needed it last year because we are coming up on this parole deadline for so many people. Um, and it's going to affect, like, in St. Louis, our local communities, employers who took, you know, um, a lot of responsibility on giving these people jobs. If those folks fall out of employment authorization status, um, that affects them and their ability to make a living. But also, you know, it's going to make it difficult for small businesses in the future to be able to, you know, hire refugees and people who make our communities better. Um, more oversight on the State Department on the SIV program. We need better numbers and data um, for in order to know where we need to make those changes. Um, software updates, just more funding for that program particularly, and more oversight. So when those fixes don't happen, um, Congress can call them to account. Like we really need like a strong congressional oversight presence on, on these programs in addition to, you know, keeping them funded and viable. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your service. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. James. Mr. James yields back. Mr. Moskowitz, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, let me just say thank you all for your service. Uh, as a representative of the American government, I think Democrats and Republicans who made these decisions together owe you not just a debt of gratitude, but an apology. You don't just deserve our thanks, but you deserve someone to look you in the eye and say that they're sorry for the decisions that they made. You deserve accountability. This was a clear American failure. It wasn't a partisan failure. And it's funny, I didn't hear one of the witnesses assign any political blame. Because we all know that the venom of politics are not going to get you the answers that you need. It's not going to get you the accountability that you need, and it's not going to prevent this from happening to young servicemen and women again. Mr. Huang, you said that we should rise above political differences. I'm afraid we may not be capable of doing that any longer. I hope as we investigate this issue further, I hope, Mr. Chairman, that we are able to do that. You are all heroes, and there are heroes on this committee. There are heroes who have seen the horrific images that you have seen, the sights, the smells, and have lost limbs. I've never seen that on the battlefield. But I did see it in my own neighborhood and in my own high school in Parkland, when a gunman walked into my high school and killed 17 people, including 14 kids. I was at the school within hours. I saw the images, the parents, the screaming, the funerals, the memorials. I can't imagine the mental health impact of what you all dealt with, the invisible scars that you have to experience. I want to thank you for coming and sharing your stories and experiences with us. One of the lesser known stories about the tragedy that happened in my hometown and at my high school is that the federal government had been given information before the shooting of who the shooter was and that the shooting was imminent. And the federal government did nothing with that information. They failed to act. And so I know firsthand about what it's like when lives are on the line and government fails. When they make mistakes, it can have catastrophic consequences. And so what I want to focus on is I want to focus on accountability for the gaps. And I want to focus on how do we solve these problems so that they don't happen again. And so what I want to do is I want to hear from you, Sergeant Vargas Andrews, because I found your testimony to be compelling and honest. You don't need to hear from me. I want to hear from you. I think the American people deserve to hear from you. So I'm going to yield you the balance of my time so that you can talk about whatever else you want to talk about that you think we should know and how we could prevent something like this from happening again. Thank you very much, Congressman. <clears throat> Um, what I'll start with is that um, another member of the committee um, made the comment that there should be more oversight on the State Department, um, ensuring that they're prepared, <clears throat> and in the future that uh, they are that those actions by the State Department, those in charge of them, are more proactive than reactive. Um, 
obviously changes now will be due to situations like this that have occurred. Um, but a lack of preparedness at a lot of levels of leadership um, are the fault or are the reason why you know August 26, 2021 happened the way it did, and that those two weeks happened the way that they did, <clears throat> as well as um, on the military side of things, ensuring that rules of engagement in such a um, high tension environment. Um, you know, it's not like we were getting sent on patrols to to go into villages and things like that. We were Marines, infantrymen, forced to do a humanitarian aid mission gone wrong. And, uh, you know, I, I won't say wrong. Um, a lot of lives are saved, but in a lot of ways, there are many issues that arose with it. And any way that any way that you, the committee can help help to um, enforce that between the State Department and the military. Back to you. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Self is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, Colonel Mann, uh, I'm retired uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel uh, and a Green Beret, the second after my colleague, Mr. Waltz. Um, I was in Bagram early in the war, though, in 2002, and I was also down in Kabul. And as early as it was, before the big buildup, it was obvious to me that uh, Bagram was defensible, uh, Kabul was not. Um, by the way, I asked a friend of mine, Big John, I'll not use his last name, I asked Big John if he had any uh, hints for me for this hearing. <clears throat> And he said, no, Scotty Mann will present my position adequately. So I appreciate you doing that because I think you spoke for uh, Big John, who was, for everyone else, uh, Big John was in a different task force, uh, not Task Force Pineapple. From what I've heard today, and, I, <clears throat> and I'm glad, frankly, that I had a chance to step out <clears throat> because it was, I think I was hearing echoes of the past from a another Democrat from 2012 era where we lost four soldiers, four service members, in a place called Benghazi, <coughs> excuse me, and the saying at that time was, what difference does it make? It makes a difference. It makes a difference that this committee is going to hold someone accountable, and I intend to join my colleague, uh, Mr. Waltz, and my colleague, Mr. Perry, in demanding that this, uh, that this committee hold someone accountable for this. I also want to comment on one, um, and before I do that, I want to say thanks for everybody coming. None of us want to relive our experiences in the Middle East, and I, I regret that you have had to do that in this public of a forum. Uh, I try not to do this with my wounded warrior friends, um, and I thank you for doing it. Um, we continue to pay a price around the world. We're focused on this uh, two-week period probably in Afghanistan, but we continue to pay the price around the world uh, with the perceived weakness of America. And notice I didn't say the weakness of America because I echo the comments of one of the, one of the panel members that uh, the American people are still strong, we just have weak leaders. We continue to pay the price around the world, specifically in Ukraine, because immediately after this debacle, Putin started moving forces and equipment uh, into place to invade Ukraine. Um, I've also heard comparisons to Vietnam. These two do not compare. I personally know General Kerry and Tony Wood, who were responsible for planning and executing uh, the last evacuation of Saigon, and they had to do it surreptitiously because of State Department and senior military uh, reticence to even let them plan the operation. Uh, so history does repeat itself, and if we want to make sure that the future is not like the past, then we will get to the bottom of this. Uh, I don't have any questions. I know where you've been. I've been there. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. 
Gentleman yields back. Mr. Jackson, you're recognized for five minutes. I'd first like to give a um, very special heartfelt uh, thank you to each of you for coming and like to also apologize in advance for the pain that you endure, that you suffer, and that we ask you to recount over and over again for the wounds that have not healed it, for the friends and family that have been also casualties from your pain and sacrifices. I would like to ask you, Mr. Hong, if you could please weigh in on what's working or what needs to be uh, further fixed in the Afghan Act. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, so the Afghan Adjustment Act, like I mentioned, uh, is I think one of three things that Congress should look at uh, going forward. Um, passing that act, as my fellow panelists, uh, Mr. Lucier mentioned, um, adjust the status of various Afghans, enlarges that status, and also reinserts Congress's appropriate role uh, in oversight. Uh, second, as I mentioned earlier, um, and Congress should strongly look at any way to enable the executive branch to increase the capacity and throughput of both processing SIVs, P1s, P2s, and then relocating those individuals once they qualify for uh, immigration status. Uh, and third, um, I echo the comments made by um, various members that we need to conduct thoughtful, non-political accountability with the goal of preventing what happened in August 2021 from ever happening again. Thank you. Ms. Mackler, would you like to add anything to that, please, on the Afghan Adjustment Act, on what's working at the State Department or what should be improved? Um, there's various questions there. On the Afghan Adjustment Act, I think it's a thoughtful piece of legislation that's been worked on by both sides um, and probably represents the best that we can um, do right now for Afghans who are here and for allowing for continued relocations. Um, I think it is urgent that it pass. We need to give the, the Afghans who are here need the confidence um, to, to know that they, that they have um, pathways and that their, their future is not uncertain past August. On the State Department, um, I think there were many decision failures and, and systemic failures along the way, and I've sort of spoken about that today. I will say that since August 15th, 2021, um, we have seen innovation and we have seen them step up, um, probably not enough. Um, and chronically these agencies are under-resourced and underfunded. We need the SIV system. For, we need to clear the backlogs to start with. And so we need resources in these agencies to adjudicate these applications, to clear backlogs, not just the SIV backlogs, which are phenomenal, but also, for example, family petitions. Many Afghans who are here, um, I was just working with uh, a young man, an SIV recipient, uh, because he was an interpreter in Afghanistan who is now a US citizen who has no way of bringing his parents because of the, um, uh, sorry, his, some of his family members uh, because, of, because of the backlogs that continue, his siblings and such. So even in the family-based immigration system, for example, we need to be resourcing these various areas so that they can function better. Um, I think at the State Department, the care team has shown us what public-private partnership can look like and how effective it can be, and so we need to resource that. We should create the Ombudsman um, for Allies office, probably within the Department of State, to make sure that these issues no longer happen. Uh, I think these are all starts. These are all in my written testimony, if you need more details. Thank you very much. And um, if you will, if I can call you Colonel Mann, uh, promotion. Um, <laughs> For the soldiers that are home, and I know it doesn't necessarily fall within our jurisdiction, but what can we do for the soldiers? It pains me, it, it's agonizing. I was once a professor, and to see so many young soldiers, I felt your pain. Um, I can't imagine what you've gone through at your age to deal with friends and comrades that have died, and to feel abandoned once you've come home, and to feel as if you've abandoned a mission. Again, you did not abandon your mission. It was wrong on this side, you were right. I congratulate you, applaud you, appreciate you. But Colonel Mann, what can we do for our soldiers, veterans, so they can feel the love and support and respect they deserve? Thank you for that, Congressman. I would just say one of the big things I think we need to do is we need to explore and get deeper on what moral injury is. Right now, it's really, uh, it, <clears throat> it's something that people are talking a lot about. But I think there needs to be a lot more work on what it really is and, and getting it integrated into the mental health 
uh, system so that we understand it and that we recognize it as a very, very serious thing. Again, there's a recent study by a group called More in Common that says 67% of Afghan war veterans feel betrayed. That is the devil's cocktail if we don't get in front of that. So I think exploring that, and then again, I think our senior leaders at every level on both sides of the political aisle and both retired and active military leaders need to dive into this moral injury issue with some level of acknowledgement that it has happened, and then we have to work together to put measures in place that will assure those folks that have been affected by this that it won't happen again. Because otherwise, most of the folks affected by this, they're not, they're not going to come along because they're just going to wait for it to happen again. Except this time, it's going to be their kids. And I think that's why we're seeing issues with recruiting, retention, public trust in the military has dropped, what, 11 points since the collapse. So I think the, the leadership involvement on this and really getting honest and talking about it, both in the active duty community, reserve community, and in the retired officer and, and senior enlisted community, that's what it's going to take to move from, from injury to recovery. Gentleman yields back. Ms. Kim is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I want to thank the committee chair and the ranking members uh, for convening this um, hearing so we can hear directly from you who have served and experienced uh, during the Afghan withdrawal. And so I want to thank you for being here and enduring these long hours, telling your stories. And this is the beginning of hopefully uh, not only do we do the accountability of what actually happened, but how can we prevent going forward, but at the same time bring some, um, you know, the amplify the stories of what happened so we don't repeat the same mistakes. Um, you guys really stepped up when the administration let so many down, and along the way you saved so many lives. Um, so I want to let you know that your service will never be forgotten, and we will not let your stories go untoward, which is why we're ha having this hearing. So I want to thank you. Um, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan was very difficult for veterans who served to watch. In fact, according to the uh, Department of uh, Veterans Affairs, the, the calls that were made to the veterans hotline really increased about 98%, almost 100%, between August uh, 14 and August 29. So you can see this was very, very difficult time for the veterans. Um, so we owe it to you the veterans who served in Afghanistan to get answers to what went wrong during that withdrawal. And I see this hearing as a venue, an avenue to those conversations that we're starting. Uh, during that process, we saw Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore uh, sending personnel to assist with the evacuation. So did Japan and South Korea sending a few aircraft to also assist in that evacuation process. And my office worked very closely with the uh, Canadian government uh, when we couldn't get answers from our government. So I want to uh, know what your coordination was like, if any, with other countries, a serviceman and woman on the ground. And let me ask specifically Mr. Hong and Mr. Mann, um, was our State Department helpful in coordinating that, and was it uh, mostly coordinated through other foreign ministries or amongst personnel on the ground? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, for our September 17th flight, in order for it to take off, we needed four different authorizations. We needed uh, permission from the Taliban to depart Afghanistan. We needed permission to fly into Qatari airspace. We needed uh, permission to land at Al-Udid and prioritization to be, you know, put our personnel there. Uh, we had to negotiate all those things uh, without a diplomatic relationship with the new government of Afghanistan and in a situation that was very, very dynamic. Uh, prior to the uh, departure of the United States from Afghanistan on August 30th, 
there was a task force in place at the State Department to coordinate all those things, and there was a very clear process. Um, I distinctly remember uh, on the day that we announced that our, uh, our country's diplomatic and military presence had ended in Afghanistan, that task force ended operations, and we were specifically told that at this point uh, the evacuation was over, uh, that you know, private citizens needed to figure out their own solution, uh, and uh, I was at a loss, as were my co-organizers. Um, luckily, um, while the official State Department task force had ended, um, there were individuals in the State Department who still cared, who stepped up, who tried to figure out solutions for, for us and other uh, private volunteer groups, despite the lack of clear authorities and clear policies on this. Um, they are also uh, unsung heroes in this, and they were working inside the bureaucracy. But uh, yes, it was very difficult, uh, Congresswoman, to, to figure out how to get a plane off the ground in a country where we no longer had a presence. That's really speaking volume that members of Congress and our veterans and the evacuation uh, support system, they had to rely on other nations to help our citizens um, and allies in a time of need. If you can add to that, please. I'll just build on that. I think that there were outstanding individuals that went above and beyond the call uh, within the State Department to help us get folks in. But what I will say is that overall, it was very, very difficult to coordinate with the State Department during the evacuation. I think we got better. And I think the, the private public partnership that was displayed by these volunteer groups with the government and the State Department is probably precedent setting. And I don't think it's going away. Future crises like this, we're gonna continue to see it. So we need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing that I would just say is that I think that the, the, the private groups came up with a lot of solutions, proposed solutions that were very viable with potential third countries and places to go, lily pads. And it seemed to me that they were dismissed out of hand uh, as, as these weren't viable groups or viable organizations, but yet they were the very people that were turned to whenever someone needed to get out in, in dire straits. And so I think listening to these private groups more and, and putting their solutions into play, because they, they have a lot of really good ideas uh, on third countries and other options, and, and, and I think the State Department listening to them more and opening the aperture more for that dialogue is critical. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlewoman yields back. Mr. Crow is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to all of you. I want to reiterate what I said a, a little while ago about um, your heartfelt testimony, which I have found to be compelling uh, with all of you, uh, candid, uh, honest, uh, and incredibly insightful. And I appreciate uh, your service then and now going forward so we can have this discussion. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about this being America's longest war. Uh, this is not just an August of 2021 issue, although th it is absolutely worth diving deep into August of 2021. Uh, but over 2,400 Americans gave their lives during this war. Countless Afghans gave their lives. Two decades, four administrations, 10 Congresses. A lot of talk about a moral, moral, moral failure, and there have been several moral failures that have occurred. One of them has happened within the United States Congress because it is the U.S. Congress that has the authority and the obligation to decide matters of war and peace and to force conversations, tough conversations, about these issues, about SIV programs, about refugee programs, about authorizations for use of military force. And we have abdicated time and time and time again to this day. We have abdicated that authority, and it's time to take it back to force that conversation because we owe it to you and we owe it to all of our veterans to do so. A couple of facts remain, though. Number one, there was no status quo. This notion that there was a status quo in August of 2021 that could have continued is not true. President Biden inherited a deal that was signed by President Trump, and at the end of that deal, when, when it came time for our troops to leave, the Taliban were going to launch a massive all-out assault on U.S. forces. We had 2,000 troops in country at that time, and they couldn't have defended themselves, and they couldn't have defended the Afghans. So we would have had to have plussed up to 15,000, 20,000, 25,000, pick a number, it would have been a massive surge, and we'd be fighting and dying to this day. And I don't believe that we should have done that. The last is uh, the evacuation. The problems, the challenges, the missteps with the evacuation uh, have been well documented. You have helped illustrate those further. I agree with you. Uh, we have to be honest about that. 
Uh, my, my criticisms of the administration have been well documented, uh, and we have to be honest about that, that challenge so we make sure it never happens again. I want to make sure, though, when we're having that discussion, that we are clear on the civil servants, those in the State Department, those in the Defense Department, that poured their hearts and souls also into this to protect the people that they fought with and served with. I have had countless conversations where those civil servants, those men and women, have broken down into tears because they, too, lost friends and left friends behind. And I think we have to acknowledge that a lot of people within this administration and going forward have done that work. So with that in mind, uh, Ms. Mackler, I'd like to uh, turn to you. We've talked a lot about the SIV program. I've done a lot of work on that program, as, as have many of you. But I want to talk a little bit more in the time that we have left on the non-SIV elements that we have to address. All of those civil society leaders, judges, girls, women, uh, journalists, others who are fighting to get out, who can't do so under the SIV program. Uh, but we need to expand the P1, P2, other programs. What do we need to do? And how do we get those folks prioritized? Thank you, Congressman. That is such a great question. The P1, P2 programs are refugee resettlement programs. Uh, they require an individual to have worked for a U.S. Um, military contractor, NGO, or a media organization, and to be referred into that program by those individuals. So we've been getting a lot of questions recently about that, about you know the new sponsor circles and, and, and refugee sponsor circles that were recently announced by the Department of State. None of that will help, um, really, quite frankly. And the individuals that you're talking about, the civil servants, the lawyers, the judges, the the everybody else in civil society who built up Afghanistan, you know, modeled on the promise that we made them of the Afghanistan, that we promised them, they have, quite frankly, no options. And sometimes we've been able to, for those who have, um, who, who have education, we've been able to get, you know, um, fellowships, um, using visas for internships, all very temporary solutions, um, all very, te um, visas for performers, visas for scientists, things like that. But the options are just, frankly, very, 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 very limited. Do we need a new category of visa to address these, these folks? We need a new category of visas to have our immigration policies and laws reflect the labor needs that this country has right now and the economic needs that this has right now. I mean, this goes to the agricultural sector, the, industri the industrial sector, as much as the, you know, the, the more highly educated sectors and fields. I mean, right now you can come and study in our universities and then not stay because there are no visa options for you even though you've been educated here. Um, and so across the board, we need, we need more pathways, more generous pathways. Um, and then in, in addition to that, we need to clear the backlogs. There are a lot of folks who would be able to bring family members, who would be able to bring others, who are choosing not to come because they would have to leave family behind. Um, and a lot of that is just sort of caught up in the backlog. So I would start there. And I would also just say, I know we're out of time, but I would also say you know, things that don't require legislative fixes, but just put in more resources into these agencies that are chronically underfunded so that we can get through the applications. Right now, it takes a year to get a work permit. Gentleman yields back. I ask unanimous consent the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn, be allowed to sit on the dais and participate in today's hearing without objective so ordered. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. First, uh, let me join with my colleagues today. It's been a long day and thank each of you for your testimony before the, uh, the committee in a forthright way. It's all appreciated and you can tell that on both sides of the aisle how meaningful your uh, personal testimonies about the tragedies in August of 21 were. Uh, and uh, to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who are making sure that this is a bipartisan catastrophe, I believe that there have been, been mistakes made for 22 years uh, in a variety of ways as it relates to in any war we fight, particularly the war uh, fought in Afghanistan. Uh, but let's be clear, if we knew we were leaving, at the beginning of the Biden administration, based on the Trump administration, then where was the plan? Where was the plan to properly evacuate? And as my friend Mr. Crow knows, we had two briefings, uh, one in April of 21 and one in July of 21 or June of 21, uh, in the House of Representatives, classified briefings, uh, bipartisan. And the veterans who fought in Afghanistan were the most skeptical of what we were listening to in the spring of 21 and early summer of 21, briefed by uh, the IC, the intelligence community, and, and the military about 
the plan because there was no evidence of a plan. So we may well not have had a choice but to leave, but how you leave is a choice. And it could have been done, in my view, in an extraordinarily more effective manner. And it was a failure, not of intelligence, but of, of uh, political and, uh, and leadership failure, in my view. And I agree with uh, the witness that have suggested that, uh, that this led and, and uh, contributed to uh, Putin's uh, calculus about what would come next. Since it is International Women's Day, uh, let me start with uh, my trip to Kabul in 2015 when I witnessed firsthand Afghanistan's steps in a positive way then uh, for social progress with the help of the United States and without the brutal control of the Taliban. On that trip, I met a young woman, Naid Azhar, who was from Jalalabad, and uh, I took tea with her that afternoon, and she was a Fulbright scholar at the University of Arkansas, earning a master's degree in anthropology, and she wanted to be home in Afghanistan with her career as an independent researcher and writer. And uh, before what happened in 21, that just reminded me of what a future of a free Afghanistan might have looked like. And we abandoned our allies and our innocent civilians like Naid to the Taliban. Uh, Colonel Mann, thanks for your testimony, and especially your focus on Afghan women. And I've seen firsthand that positive force that they were playing in Afghan civil society before our withdrawal. Um, how much process on the status of women has been undone under the Taliban regime? Thank you, Congressman. I, I feel pretty underqualified to address this in the sense that I believe, hopefully, where, where this will go. I mean, I'm going to try to address it, but I think in the future, hopefully, we'll have uh, a range of women leaders on, on, the, on the panels as well addressing this, hopefully, from Afghanistan as well, because I think there is so much that we need to dig into on this. Um, what I can tell you is what I'm hearing from leaders of the group sitting behind me right now that are very engaged uh, with at-risk Afghans in country and, of course, people that we've worked with in Task Force Pineapple. And what we have done is, is to literally wind the clock back to a pre-9-11 draconian civil society in Afghanistan where, where women and girls are, are relegated to not much more than property, if that. And, and the, the atrocities that are occurring at a humanitarian level right now against women and girls are um, unconscionable. And I can tell you in interviewing uh, Minister Hasina Safi, the, the Minister of Women's Affairs, when, um, when we were talking about that day when everything fell apart, you know, I'll paraphrase what she said was, you know, Everyone in the West for years has talked about advancing women's rights in the world and advancing women's rights in Afghanistan, but on the day we needed it most, it was nowhere to be found. Thank you, and I agree completely, and I hope we do have a panel as we explore uh, the wrongs of this evacuation process, uh, uh, women. Uh, I appreciate your testimony. I'm proud to be with you. I wanna thank all the groups that worked doing the job that the State Department should have done. We still have cases in my office unresolved. And when I visited uh, Quantico to meet SIVs, 6,000 people at Quantico, there were less than 100 that were SIVs. And we did not take care of the SIVs in this process. And I yield back. Now recognize uh, my friend, Mr. Barrett, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I first off want to recognize um, Sergeant Vargas Andrews, you know, you're from Folsom, California. I had the privilege of uh, representing Folsom in, in a prior Congress. Um, I also want to recognize all the veterans here, but their family members and, and everyone who's, who's served over the years for, for your service. And when I meet a veteran, I don't know if they're a Democrat or a Republican, and when they serve, they're just meeting the task that's in front of them, the mission that, that they've been given. So thank you and be proud of that. I'm glad that um, my colleague, Representative Green, talked about that. You should be proud of your service. We're proud of your service. So for all the veterans, the, the men and women that served in their families, thank you for that, and we're proud of you. Um, but Lieutenant Colonel Mann, you did talk about the healing process and what we need to do in the pain, and, and we certainly saw it with Vietnam veterans who returned and suffered in silence for years. 
let's learn from that. Let's try to start the healing process. And you know, we've touched on a, a, a couple things that we could actually do. We can't rewrite the past, but we can, you know, by understanding the past, understanding mistakes, learning from those mistakes, we should do that oversight. And I think you know, we, we all agree upon that. We should not abandon the um, Afghans that, that helped us, that supported us, their family members. You know, I'm proud to represent Sacramento County, which I think is the largest, um, ha has the largest population of Afghan refugees. I know um, my staff in those days in August um, and September, you know, submitted over 10,000 names for humanitarian parole. The calls that they were getting, you know, um, were heartbreaking. And I'm, I know all of our staffs were going through a lot of those calls along with you know, many of the veterans. We should honor that. We've touched on the Afghan Adjustment Act. Ms. Mackler, let me ask you a question. If we don't pass that act by August, what's gonna happen? Tens of thousands of Afghans who are evacuated will remain in limbo at risk of deportation, unable to begin their lives, unable to move past this moment and keep going towards safety and protection. So to my Republican colleagues, to my Democratic colleagues, that is a tangible thing that we can do. We can pass the Afghan Adjustment Act. We can you know, certainly protect the folks that are here. State Department was overwhelmed. I'm glad that you know, some on the panel have talked about the individual members who stepped up and you know, um, went beyond their call of duty. Let's fix this problem. Let's continue to, to you know, get folks out of Afghanistan, family members, women, and others that are at risk to the best of, of our ability. We can do that. Lieutenant Colonel, you touched on um, the moral injury. And you know, we certainly have to think about what that looks like, understand it, and then think about what we need to do to heal that moral injury. Do you have some thoughts on how we should approach that? The one thing that, that I, I haven't covered yet is um, we did a, one of the guys in Pineapple did an interview with a gentleman named George who lives in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. And George has been very, very active as, he's, as a green, former Green Beret in evacuating uh, partners on to, on, into North Carolina and settling onto farmland that, that he's helped them acquire. The interesting thing about George as a Green Beret is the indigenous partners that he's evacuating are Montagnards. He's a Vietnam era Green Beret who has been evacuating Montagnards for decades. And his nonprofit has been doing this very, very successfully. And when asked, George, how long are you going to do this? And he said, until I'm dead. And, and I think the, the point that this goes back to one of the comments that was made earlier, I believe it was by uh, Congresswoman uh, Titus, about why weren't we, you know, talking to the Trump administration and previous administrations about what was going on. The reality is we were living our lives. We were running our businesses. We were running our nonprofits. We were raising our kids. We, were, we had run the miles as veterans and, and had completed our, our times of service. And we were drawn back into this, not of our own volition, but, but by a set of circumstances that we could not stand for, that we couldn't. You know, people ask me why I got involved with this. I said, because my three boys are watching me right now. And, you know, so, so my point is uh, this is going to continue to go. Uh, and, and what we've got to do is to find a way to responsibly relieve the veterans of this burden or the moral injury recovery is going to be very difficult. Well, and that's something that we have in our power that we should do and undertake as bipartisan members of Congress to think about how we can work with the State Department administration to uh, address that and relieve you of some of that burden, but to get the mission done as you did. Thank you. And I'll yield back. I now recognize Mr. Mills for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thanks for everyone who's here on this panel. Like many of you on this panel, I too served. And I'm proud to say that I was an Army combat veteran who had served and had spent time not just in Iraq, but also time in Afghanistan. But I'm also one that will actually call things the way they are. We've allowed our operations to continue to be drug out, modified, changed with no clear military objectives. And the minute that we thought that we were nation builders, we had already lost our way. That is not the intent of the United States Armed Forces. You want counterterrorism, you want counterinsurgency strategies, we'll be the ones to go to. You want policing and nation building, that's not our role. So it was a failed strategy from the beginning whenever we actually got into that. You want to deal with FID strategies? I know that Lieutenant Colonel Mann knows all about being able to train asymmetrics 
and to be able to understand foreign internal defense. And all of you know what it is like to sacrifice. And that means a lot to me. You know, the same people who will come in this room, my colleagues on the left, and say, we should not politicize this, and yet politicize it. These are the same individuals that what they're really trying to say, and I'll go ahead and translate, is that we don't really want to uncover and actually have accountability for who is responsible and claims to be the commander in chief. That's what this is about. We left Americans behind. We left our Afghan allies behind to die. And we have to accept that. Like many of you, I couldn't sit there with my hands tied. Because we all have to, when we die, answer for our talents and say, we had a capacity, a capability, a skill set that we could utilize. So my team actually had gotten put together after Congressman Ronnie Jackson had called me and told me about this woman, Miriam, and her three children who were born and raised Amarillo, Texas natives, who were being left behind by the Biden administration. He called the DOD for help. They told him they were in the midst of withdrawal. He called the State Department. They told him they had text to find out where she was. Go to this gate. You can get in. Just wave your blue passport. There's an agreement with the Taliban. And we all know that was false. So instead of worrying about my political run in my candidacy, we put a team together of former squadron members, and we flew over there and actually attempted to rescue 28 AMSITs and our G650, who with approved PPRs, our plane actually being modified with the carriage of a humanitarian aircraft. And as we're 2,000 off the feet on final approach, we were denied entry, which resulted in multiple different changes in our platform, but ultimately, we wouldn't be deterred, and we did conduct the very first successful overland rescue, making sure that mother, her 15-year-old son, her 11-year-old daughter, her two-year-old daughter, were allowed to come back to the country that they're a part of. You guys know something about that. And we will get answers, there will be accountability. And I'll have resignations or impeachments one way or another. Now, speaking on that, Sarn, do you feel that if you would have been enabled to have actually have gone with the green light to take out what you had identified as a bolo, that that would have prevented the incident that occurred on August 26 and preserved the 13 U.S. service members' lives? Thank you, Congressman. Um, <clears throat> what I can say is that a worst case scenario of the individual that we fired upon who we suspected to be the bomber not being the bomber, someone in the crowd who is the bomber is going to think twice when they see someone else's face get caved in or their chest get caved in and killed. They're going to understand that America is paying attention, that we're going to take action for the things that, they're, that are occurring and the threats that, are, that were prevalent during that time there. I completely agree. And we know the psychological impact on the battlefield that a sniper can actually produce. That's Lieutenant cool. Colonel Mann, do you believe that if we would have maintained our presence in Bagram Air Base with the force protection capabilities, but also the ability to have those buildings to do proper vetting so we didn't put over 70% of people unvetted onto this successful Operation Airlift, and I will use the actual rabbit ears, that we could have run two simultaneous runways, not just on H. Kaya, but Bagram, and actually have led to a more successful and safer mission on the evacuation? I do, Congressman. And I believe we could have also leveraged the power of the, of the groups, of the volunteer groups, to assist in that as well in a more uh, orderly and organized fashion. You know, I'll tell you something. I'm sure that others in this room has actually incurred it as well. You know, after we had actually attempted to do multiple rescues of Americans and was thwarted by the Biden administration on multiple occasions, when we did finally get a successful evacuation, do you know what the CNN first headline was? State Department saves four Americans. And it wasn't until I went on to Hannity and I went on to McCallum and I started blasting the fact that this was untrue with photos, just like the one I had behind me, did they actually retract their statements. Guess what? America is not defined by the United States government. America is defined by the American citizens who are not willing to sit back and do nothing. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Comliger Dev. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> I want to thank all of you all for um, spending today with us. I know it's been long. I especially want to thank our service members for your heroism and your sacrifice. It takes courage to serve our country, and it also takes courage to share your stories and your pain. Um, as your testimonies highlight, 
which I read before coming here. When it comes to the withdrawal from Afghanistan, it is imperative that this committee conduct robust oversight and engage in a full interrogation of all the facts in order to uncover lessons we desperately need to learn about the failure of our involvement in Afghanistan. You all have made powerful points about the obligation that we have as a country to help those who suffer from persecution and tyranny. What started in August 2021 is far from finished, and the test of our commitment to our Afghan partners is not about what happened just over those two weeks, but the way we continue to support them in the months and years ahead. So Ms. Mackler, you pointed out that the administrative burden of putting together an application is on the applicant at risk, even for information the United States government already has access to. I know that Project Rabbit is a new uh, effort by DOD to verify the employment of SIV applicants who worked with DOD contractors. From your perspective, has this mechanism improved processing times and are there any successes that we can implement in other parts of the application process? Yes, absolutely. From everything I understand, the DOD's Project Rabbit really did help move applications um, through. One of the peculiarities of the SIV program is that you require chief of mission um, confirmation that you, that the serve you know of the serve of the time in service and that it meets all of the requirements and that it was satisfactorily done, and that means that an applicant often at risk or in danger. Um, you know, where they are, has to gather the paperwork that proves their employment, that proves their service, um, to reach out to chief of mission, to the chief of their mission who may no longer be, or, you know, um, available, and to get them to, to issue the letters that they need. And so putting that burden back on the U.S. government, which in theory should have all of that paperwork far more easily accessible, um, instead of putting it on the applicant who is often scrambling, often has no longer the connections or the ability to contact, especially when military personnel get deployed from one place to another or go up in rank, um, things like that. I mean, I was one time asked if I had a connection to General Petraeus because that was who was needed to give the chief of mission approval. Um, and I don't have him on my speed dial. So um, these, these things that are, but that create very real obstacles. Um, and the chief of mission approval is, has been a bit of a drawing line in the sand. Um, without it, folks not only cannot continue with their SIV application, they aren't able to qualify for the relocation flights. When the administration did at um, in, in end of July and August start moving um, SIV applicants into the United States, it had to be past that, that stage. And so um, expanding projects like um, Project Rabbit, it, from all accounts would help speed that up. And in general, putting that burden back on the US government to find within their files information they should already have would certainly ease the burden on the applicant. Thank you for that. Um, you also mentioned in your testimony uh, disparate capabilities in the US government's Uniting for Ukraine program in contrast to the challenges of the Afghan system, especially when it comes to managing out of country processing. So can you provide some more detail as to what the differences are and what improvements are needed to ensure our treatment of Afghan refugees matches our treatment of Ukrainian refugees? Sure, I mean, to put it simply, um, after the fall of Kabul, many Afghans who didn't qualify for any immigration options started applying for what's called humanitarian parole. Um, I think at last count, over 70,000 applications were still pending, and the U.S. government told us that they had no ability to adjudicate them. Um, each application costs $575 per person. I mean, if you have a six-month-old baby, you're paying $575 for you and $575 for your six-month-old baby. Um, these applications just kind of piled up, and they had no. They said they had no ability to adjudicate them. They had no ability to create a categorical program by which people could just apply um, based on under uh, you know an Afghan related category when Ukraine um, when the Ukraine invasion happened and the US government looked at how to help Ukrainian um, Ukrainians who also needed protection they created a categorical program to help people apply for parole and come to the United States and I think that there are a lot of differences um, both in terms of the experience the resources the personnel the leadership that these departments had but it is clear that the government could do it because they did it for Ukraine so they should do it for Afghans as well Thank you, and with that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. General Lee yields back. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Who else? Uh, 
Charles. What a great uh, honor it is for me to be in your presence. I, I appreciate you uh, serving your country. I appreciate you coming and being here with us today. Semper Fidelis. Um, part of the withdrawal, I, I noticed that when I was there in 2016, we, we lost an American serviceman or another person died while we were there. Uh, but over the course of that last 10 years we were in Afghanistan, we didn't lose too many people, if I remember correctly. Uh, would, would you all agree? Um, for those of you who are historians of the Afghan war in the last 10 years, we lost probably fewer than we lost that last day we withdrew. So I would make the case that with fewer people than we have stationed in Spain, a country we've never fought in, we stabilized an entire country in a very strategically important area, where now we have half the population in abject slavery because of their gender, where you now have a harboring nation of many bad guys who want to do bad things to good people. Uh, so I would make the case that maybe we shouldn't have withdrawn. We don't, it doesn't matter. I don't care who president is. I'm not going to make this political. And I find it ironic that some of the Democrat colleagues that I have here today say we shouldn't make this political, and then immediately the next sentence out of their mouth is it's Trump's fault. I don't really care. But I don't think we can start the healing process until we do have accountability, and I don't feel like we have that. And you talked about healing, Lieutenant Colonel. I, I want to I talk to you uh, as a the senior ranking guy on the, on the panel, at least for right now. Um, for those members who haven't been to uh, command and staff or war college, uh, just some basic questions here. Um, let's see. Can a military le leader uh, move a date for any withdrawal? Anytime they please, if they're the top guy or gal. Like a, a withdrawal of forces? No. So they can't, they can't decide what date they want to move out on? I mean, I they, mean if, it's his, if, it's, if it's his operation. Yeah. yeah. So, so, for example, if you're the commander in chief, you can decide what date you sure. want to leave, right? Absolutely. Are you married to any date that some prior commander who no longer is in charge, uh, are, you pri are you obligated to the date that they set previously? It's typically event driven. Yeah, so you can decide, if you're the commander-in-chief, what date you want to withdraw and how you want to do it, correct? I mean, that's basic uh, command leadership. You can decide, if you're in charge, you get to call the shots. Uh, I I'm drawing this because I think if we want to blame somebody else for your leadership mistakes at that time, I think that's a false narrative, and I think that's been done several times during this argument of accountability. And, and I want to ask each one of you, because this is the important part, we're here to talk about one specific day and one specific withdrawal and one specific location. Do you think there was accountability for those people who made egregious mistakes? And I think we can all say somebody made egregious mistakes that day. Do you think those people were held accountable? Does anybody, does anybody think that there was accountability and of who, who was held accountable? So I'm assuming nobody here thinks that anybody's held accountable. So my question is, if we're going to have an entire hearing, we're going to have all these fine people who have sacrificed their lives, if we talk about traumatic brain injuries, limbs lost, family members lost, friends lost, time spent away from family, years away from our family, and then we look down the line and we say, not one person was held accountable that made these decisions, then how can we learn and how can we heal? And that's my question to you. How are we? I, I, I'm getting emotional right now because this stuff matters. If we don't have accountability for the people who made those decisions, how can you, how can we heal as people and as a nation? And it's my humble opinion that we haven't had one ounce of accountability unless you can tell me where you've seen it. And if you can't, it's got to hurt you. And there was stone cold silence when I asked you if anybody's held accountable. That's how I feel too. And that's why we have suicide problems, in my opinion. As an ER doc who gets to witness people come into the ER with, with horrible PTSD and depression and suicidality because of this war. Do you guys have any other idea how we can heal without accountability? So have we done our job? to hold those people who made the decisions, who were responsible for those decisions on that day, in that theater, have we held them accountable? And you're allowed to have an opinion. Matter of fact, there's nobody more qualified to have an opinion than you. Have we held anybody accountable? 
Not yet, Chairman. Thank you. And that with, with that, I yield. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Lawler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for hosting this hearing. Uh, very straightforward hearing. During and after the fall of Kabul, examining the administration's emergency evacuation from Afghanistan. This is not a hearing about rehashing 20 plus years worth of policy. This is not a hearing about looking back as to why we went to Afghanistan in the first place. This is not a hearing uh, about decisions made uh, during the war. This is a hearing about the withdrawal and the epic failure of the administration with respect to that withdrawal. Let me say to each and every one of you, on behalf of the American people, I'm sorry. None of you should have been put in that situation. That is a failure of leadership. It is a failure of government. And it is a failure of our military leadership, not you. This should not have happened. For my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, who have spent the entirety of this hearing trying to figure out a way to not deal with the consequences of these decisions, but to somehow look and try to point fingers at prior administrations. <clears throat> the President of the United States is the Commander in Chief. The buck stops with him. He had a responsibility. If he disagreed with the prior administration's handling, if he disagreed with the prior administration's plan, fix it. To set a date certain and then move that date up. I was a member of the New York State Legislature. I wasn't in Congress. I watched in horror as planes were taking off and you had people running down the tarmac trying to get on that plane so they could save their lives, the lives of their children, the lives of our service personnel, the lives of people in Afghanistan who worked closely with our men and women in uniform. It is shameful what happened. And as a citizen, not as someone who has served, not as somebody who was on the ground there, as a citizen, it was horrifying to watch. 13 service members dead, their families gutted, all of you heartbroken, dealing with the after effects of that. I know as a, a state representative dealing with our local veterans organizations, the increase in the number of people, veterans who were dealing with PTSD as a result of that, suicide, absolutely shameful. So this is about accountability, this is about transparency, and this is about ensuring this never, ever happens again. There's not one American who should ever be left on the ground in a war zone. And the people who sacrificed so much in Afghanistan to help us, to leave them there in absolute disgrace, I note, Lieutenant Colonel, in your addendum on uh, women and children, today is International Women's Day. To allow what has transpired since, shameful. All of you 
are owed a debt of gratitude from your government, from your country, and you are owed more than anything the truth. And that, hopefully, in part, is what we were able to accomplish with this hearing today. So I thank you for your time and your testimony. God bless you all, and thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The uh, chair recognizes Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your, your vigilance in pursuing the truth in this committee. And thank you to our witnesses. <clears throat> thank you for being here today. Thank you for your service to our country. Uh, and thank you uh, for doing what many in our government did not do, which is to work to help those who helped the United States in our fight against radical Islamic terrorism when we were there in Afghanistan. And some call this a chaotic withdrawal. Others call it an unconditional retreat. Whatever, however you want to characterize it, it was a disgraceful episode and a failure of leadership to, to see 13 U.S. service members needlessly killed at H. Kaya because we didn't choose to use Bagram as a better alternative for extraction. Uh, and put our young men and women, uh, many Marines, in a terrible situation, and our Afghan allies in a terrible situation, leading to not only leaving behind $7 billion worth of U.S. equipment in the hands of the Taliban, but leaving behind more than 800 American citizens and tens of thousands of our Afghan allies remaining there in jeopardy at the, at the hands of bloodthirsty Taliban enemy after the last U.S. military aircraft departed August 31, 2021. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mann, this has been asked and probably answered in this uh, lengthy hearing already, but based on your experience in the country, do you think it would have been a more effective plan to execute a withdrawal out of Bagram as opposed to, to H. Kaya? Congressman, I do think it would have been more effective and more tenable to utilize Bagram as a platform for NIA. Mr. Hong, in your testimony, you discussed your efforts to get both Americans and Afghan allies on planes out of Mazar al-Sharif and the fact that it took three weeks before they were able to depart. Can you please let this committee know what led to that three-week delay? Was the Taliban the biggest hurdle? Was the State Department helpful or hurtful? And how were you able to overcome those hurdles? Uh, all those things were hurdles, uh, Congressman. We did not have a... Uh, adequately sourced plan. As far as we could tell, we were operating in conditions that uh, the State Department, frankly, was unsure, individuals in the State Department unsure of their authorities and their resources. Uh, we had to figure out ways to negotiate with the new Taliban government for departure. Uh, we managed to overcome those things using, frankly, financial resources, number one. Uh, number two, operational experience of the volunteers gained from hard-earned time on the ground in Afghanistan and then three, um, relationships. Well, I just can't thank you enough for doing, uh, again, what the State Department was not able to do or, or should have been doing. And finally, I want to read into the record a letter I received from a constituent Marine who served at H. Kaya August 17 to August 31, 2021, and who, because of his experience, ended uh, his active service uh, uh, prematurely. Uh, he says, I was an infantry machine gun squad leader, 1st uh, Battalion, 8th Marines, Bravo Company. Our company was running security operations in North Gate, H. Kaya. Within my first two hours at the gate, I saw Afghan soldiers shooting civilians as a warning for the other civilians to stop trying to overrun our position. Main orders were to keep Afghan civilians under control because the threat of suicide bomber was high. We would have to fight with men, women, and children with non-lethal weapons, firing warnings, shots from our weapons, hand-to-hand -hand combat fighting all day. I watched men step on and kill children to get entry to the airport. I watched women throw their dead children into a sewage canal where we would also take dead civilians who had died due to injuries sustained by the Taliban. Our chain of, uh, a woman handed me her dead infant and asked me to help, but I couldn't. Our chain of command directed us to throw flashbang grenades at civilians to calm them down, and none of us had ever used flashbangs uh, bangs before. My fellow Marines and I were in charge of kicking out, turning away desperate civilians who didn't have proper paperwork. Men, women, and even children would beg my fellow Marines and me to kill them. I had to inform Afghan man with his wife, baby, and multiple children he had to leave. He grabbed my rifle and begged me to kill him and his family because his entire 
entire family would be raped and burned alive by the Taliban, and I threw them out. I did everything I could to get them through, but my command told me to kick them out. I hit an older man in the head with a, a, a baton on accident, and I saw his head dent and his eyes roll back. I saw a woman get shot in the chest about 10 yards away. I had to fight through the crowd to defend her while our Navy corpsman gave her medical aid. Her crying children were on top of her. I was, uh, I was helping uh, beat people back to make space. A man ran up to me saying it was his sister, and I was so angry I threw the man and jumped on talk, top of him. I was about to hurt him until someone stopped me. Civilians like this man would try to pretend they were family of someone injured, and they were so desperate for understandable reasons. Uh, I remember one lady in particular had two young daughters dropping to her knees crying and asking us to kill her kids before the Taliban could get to them. Based on procedures put in place by the command, I still had to kick them out. I remember her telling me when her daughters are raped repeatedly, it would be my fault. For this administration, for this White House, for this State Department to put our Marines, like this young constituent of mine, in that position, to put our allies our Afghan allies in this position, to put our U.S. service members who were killed at H. Kaya in this position is a disgrace. It is a disgrace. And there needs to be accountability for my Marine constituent, who is no longer a Marine. Disgraceful. Thank you all for telling the truth, because the truth that is coming out today because of your testimony, the truth that comes out from my constituent, a brave Marine put in that position, that tells the story of a failure of leadership. I yield back. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back. Um, last but not least, Mr. Nunn's recognized. Mr. Chair, thank you very much and to the Foreign Affairs Committee for having us here today. Um, I want to first off thank the Gold Star families who joined us. I want to thank the veterans who stood up both in Afghanistan and beyond to help save lives. To the civilians, to the volunteers, to our allies across the board, many of us served in Afghanistan and many more have served on signal, in chat rooms, and at the wee hours of the morning while doing our main job to help save Americans, our allies, and the future of this country. Specifically, I want to thank Sergeant Vargas. You are a reflection of so many young men and women who went to serve our country in the best way possible. While you manned the post as a sniper, you provided countless hours of overwatch, protecting so many on the ground, including a young man from my district, a Marine, Specialist Deacon Page, who died at Abbey Gate. You knew the right thing to do. Leadership did not empower you to be able to save lives, and that is not on you. Thank you for your service. Beginning on the 26th of August, so many of you in this room, who I see both as friends, as allies, as a band of brothers and sisters who stood up Thank you. When H. Kaya fell, hundreds of Americans were left outside the wire. Thousands of our friends and allies who had stood with us for decades, putting their life ahead of ours, jeopardizing what their children and their future looked like to make sure we were able to get on those aircraft and fly out. I'm honored to be able to, just this week, honor Major Lunning, who was the last medical nurse to fly out with a group of Americans and Afghans on the C-17 that saved their lives as they traveled to Germany. Unfortunately, hundreds more had to be left behind. I want to tell briefly the story of uh, the Syed family who was at the bombing at Abbey Gate. We first came into contact with them. I've done three combat tours flying recon operations over, and our interpreter who did nine combat tours with us was saved and is now a US citizen in my community back home. But contacting us, they identified that this engineer, a grandfather, who had worked with the US Embassy, who was promised evacuation, who went to Abigate, was hit in the explosion. Despite the fact that he was mangled, the Taliban approached him. They said, what did you do for the Americans? Why are you leaving our country? He said, I'm an engineer. I help build waterways. What is an engineer? I build a future for our country, for our children. They immediately shot him in the leg and left him for dead in the middle of the street in front of his children. Despite this, Mr. Syed walked across an open battlefield to save his two young children and his wife and asked for evacuation. We were working an operation at Maza Sharif at the time, working with Cam Airways. T members who had never met each other, Americans and folks around the world, formed a group called Task Force Argo. And together we were able to get five flights out of Maza Sharif in the north and save 3,000 Afghan allies and 40 Americans 
on that first flight of 380. But that is only part of the story. The true heroism exists in the faces of each of you in this room, who despite the fact that you reached out for help from our federal government, you got no answer. Now, Mr. Syed was able to not only navigate a caravan of 40 vehicles north over an eight-hour journey, we asked him, would you please pick up two young women whose husband has gone missing? They were students, and on Monday, they were going to university. By the middle of the week, they were beaten in the street because they did not have a head covering. Their future was one of rape and forced marriage. But for Mr. Syed, he put them in the back of his Toyota Corolla with his small children, and together, they made this journey north. They were stopped multiple times throughout the night by the Taliban, and they were asked time and time again, who are these women? And he would say, I am their grandfather. We are going to a wedding. But this cover story was not developed out of thin air. It was the work of volunteers who helped at every checkpoint report back on what was going on, who helped provide a clean pathway and made sure that there was a safe harbor when they arrived in Maza Sharif. And over the course of the next weeks that turned into months, Flight after flight save these individuals. There are many of you who are on this panel today, and I cannot thank you enough. This digital Dunkirk, this rescue from Afghanistan, is a direct reflection of what you did to save these lives, the lives of people who had spent decades saving ours. So with that, France, I want to first of all commend you and everything that you did to help evacuate with your team and the hundreds of volunteers behind the scenes, not just here but around the world, who did that. I want to speak specifically to the issue of flying folks out of Maza Sharif. Was the U.S. State Department or the Taliban the harder force in being able to get those aircraft off the ground and save those lives? Uh, they were equally hard, Congressman. I mean, in both cases, both were operating from a place of confusion, of lack of information, and lack of authority. Literally, both, both sides of the government corn. Adrian, I'd like to speak to you on what the U.S. government's was there ever a single point of contact within State Department that you could reach out to, that you had the ability to, Colonel, to actually have a conversation to seek evacuation? There was not, Congressman, really, that we ever found. What we found that worked very well was Aiden's unit, in particular, was very responsive and looking to do more, and they had uh, what seemed to be a very good working relationship with State Department at Apron 8 for out-processing. So we really relied on them to do that. We, we could never figure out how to do that direct engagement. And, France, you talk about a moral obligation that we have. Is there also a national security implication for what is, has occurred? Congressman, when we left Afghanistan, we not only left behind, behind allies, we left behind our honor we left behind our credibility. Um, if we want allies to fight alongside us in the future, we need to be credible when we tell them that we're going to stand by them. Uh, we need the strategic option of working by, with, and through allies in the future. And without the credibility that comes from standing by the allies in Afghanistan, we're not going to get that cooperation in future fights. And then we're going to have to either choose as a nation to be less effective on the global stage or choose to spend more of America's blood and treasure to achieve the same outcomes. Friends, thank you. Mr. Chair, my appreciation, because what was our darkest hour in Afghanistan is made better by the actions that each of you took to be able to save lives and chart a better course for our country. We on this panel owe it to you to be able to get answers and truth so this never happens again. With that, Mr. Chair, thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Uh, before I close, I'd like to recognize the ranking member for any comments uh, he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first thank all of our esteemed witnesses uh, for appearing before our committee today. And I said it once and I say it again. Let me really thank you also for saving and evacuating over 120,000 people in 17 days under the most difficult conditions imaginable in a complex and dangerous environment thousands of miles away. I want to thank you. There were successes 
in this evacuation, and there were mistakes. We need to acknowledge both. I want to particularly thank and also commend all of you who work to help not only our Afghan allies and partners, but also for being advocates for the rights and pathways of refugees and immigrants more broadly. Ms. Mackler, your work in particular, including for coordinating legal services for those impacted by the Muslim ban in my own district at JFK Airport, lays bare how much more work we need to do in Congress to fix our broken immigration center, uh, system. And as I said in my opening remarks, again, extricating ourselves from two decades of a quad mile in Afghanistan was always going to be a difficult task. And I believe that we are deluding ourselves if we believe that this could have been as an easy operation given the deteriorating security situation and rapidly changing events on the ground that no one could have predicted. This undertaking further, was further complicated by sets of policies, and these are just facts, policy decisions made by the previous administration that altered the balance of power in Afghanistan and hindered our ability to honor our commitment to thousands of brave Afghans who stood side by side with us over the course of the past two decades. And yes, I must say that I am deeply concerned by some of my colleagues who paint the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan with such broad strokes as to divorce the emergency evacuation from those choices and the full context that led up to the events in August 2021. They don't stand, that doesn't happen, in a vacuum and by itself. I believe we must commit ourselves to responsible, bipartisan oversight, and we must ensure that we are taking a sober look at how we reached this outcome in Afghanistan after 20 years of war. But we also must look at how we can prevent the same mistakes from going and being made again going forward. And yet, under the most challenging circumstances, you, along with our diplomats and intelligence professionals, mobilized this whole of government effort to evacuate American citizens. There are important lessons to be learned from mistakes that were made, yet the impossible has also happened. Due to your tireless work, <coughs> the State Department and other U.S. government personnel lives were saved. And I couldn't help but feel, as I said in the beginning, when I think of all, and I think it's, we need to recognize and honor all 2,461 <coughs> members of the United States military that lost their lives during this 20 years of war. And as I close and yield back, I just want to, because I just was reflecting, ask unanimous consent, being a member from New York, I just wanted to put in the record the names of the 112 members of the United States military that lost their lives in this war that came from my state of New York. I, to the Gold Star families here, and to those that may be listening, to those that I have met and talked in regards, talked to in regards to the 20 years, including the evacuation, my heart, my prayers, my soul reaches out to you, and those of us that sits in the United States Congress, we also take the responsibility that we have to pass the legislation that we need to do 
to make sure that this does not happen again. With that, now I ask for the reason. And without objection, so ordered. Um, and let me just say, I've, it's my 10th uh, term in Congress, and I, I don't think I've had a more powerful um, experience with a hearing. Um, all of you stood up in a time when our government did not and let down people that were left behind to, from American citizens to Afghan uh, partners who are still there, to all the women. And my heart really goes out to them on International Women's Day as they now live under the Taliban and Sharia law that never probably have experienced it. Many have not. Um, and it's, it's been a dark chapter, but it, as the ranking member said, what you did is a bright light in terms of saving so many countless lives. And we got the briefings here in Washington, but you just gave us all a front row seat to what really happened that day. And it was incredibly powerful, the testimony from all of you. Um, what are we leaving behind? We know China's there. The DNI testified in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee today on the global terrorism threat in Afghanistan. She says Al Qaeda viewed the Taliban seizure of power as a victory for the global jihad, and Al Qaeda remains committed to attacking U.S. interests. And on ISIS, Corazon almost certainly retains the intent to conduct operations in the West and will continue efforts to attack outside of Afghanistan. I, I pray the threat goes away, but I'm not as naive to think it, it will. I was a counterterrorism federal prosecutor. I was chairman of the Homeland Security Committee when we stopped so many of these threats to conduct external operations in the United States of America. So for the veteran out there listening, was it worth it? Yes, it was worth it. You protected America. And some gave their lives to protect America and what it stands for. And we do have to learn from the mistakes of the past and we'll continue to do that. But I, I just wanna uh, thank you for what you've done for the veteran, you know, whether it's saving lives, whether it's the PTSD, whether it's a suicide rates, which we know are going up after what happened. And we also know that this has had a projection of weakness that has invited aggression and war from Putin and Ukraine to Chairman Xi's threatening the Pacific. There is a cause and effect. And we know that after August, when Afghanistan fell, the Russian Federation, we saw it, the surveillance videos, the, the satellite imagery of the Russian Federation moving to Ukraine. And that is the axiom of history, that peace through strength, weakness invites aggression. Uh, I hope we can project strength and stop war like this one. And I just want to say to anyone listening to this, I know it's being carried live on uh, C-SPAN and a lot of other outlets. If you have any information about the withdrawal in Afghanistan, please don't hesitate to contact our House Foreign Affairs website at foreignaffairs.house.gov. Uh, we simply want to get the truth out. And as I said in my opening statement, the, our veterans deserve it and our gold star mothers and families deserve the truth, and people do need to be held accountable. Uh, nothing demonstrates that more, sir, than your powerful testimony about having the suicide bomber in your grasp, and he got away, and what we could have stopped, um, but for some decision made above you not to respond to that threat. That's probably one of the saddest things out of this hearing, and uh, we pray for you and all the veterans out there. 
we want to say thank you on behalf of the United States Congress, both Republican and Democrat. So with that, um, we're going to close the hearing. Uh, thank the witnesses. Uh, members may have additional questions, and you may submit those uh, in writing pursuant to committee rules. All members may have five days to submit statements, questions, extraneous materials for the record. And without objection, the committee stands adjourned.